Okay, good morning. Uh, and welcome to, to, uh, to, to the City Council's 11th day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. We have been joined by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Karen Koslowitz, and others I'm sure will be joining us shortly. Today we will hear from the libraries, the Department of Cultural Affairs, the Sanitation Department, and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director Latanya McKinney, Committee Councils Rebecca Chasen and Noah Brick, Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads Krillian Francisco and Chima Obacheri, Finance Analysts Alia Ali, John Seltzer and John Basile, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Samurais, who pull everything together. I'd also like to thank Robin Force from my office, who has been with me on all of these hearings. Thank you for all of your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the three library systems. In the preliminary budget response, the council urged the administration to add $27 million for the libraries in fiscal 20 so that they can continue to maintain, grow, and offer the programs and services they have been providing. Additionally, the council asked the administration to baseline the $8 million one-time funding that the council had allocated to the systems in fiscal 2019 adopted budget. However, not only did the administration not add to the library's budget as requested, they actually decreased the library's funding through an imposition of the PEG, which caused the systems to cut back on DVDs and other supplies and materials. On the capital side, the executive 10-year strategy reflects $778.3 million for the library systems. However, the $778.3 million is existing capital funding already earmarked for other projects from previous years and does not represent the accurate assessment of the need the strategy is supposed to contain. According to the libraries, over the next 10 years, the systems have identified an additional $963 million in capital needs that OMB chose not to include in the 10-year strategy. This is a prime example of what, the, of what the Council has been criticizing the administration about throughout this entire budget cycle. The 10-year strategy is a planning document. It is intended to capture the anticipated capital need over the next 10 years. However, OMB is wrongly treating it as a funding document, thereby depriving the Council and the public of the true picture of future capital needs. Libraries have an essential presence in every neighborhood in New York, providing indispensable services in a safe and reliable space to youth, seniors, immigrants, and incarcerated individuals, among others. Early literacy, English for speakers of other languages, and video visitation for incarcerated individuals are just some of the numerous agency partnerships and countless department collaborations the systems do each year. So I look forward to hearing your testimony today and working with you until budget adoption to ensure you have the funding you require to continue the good work you are doing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Van Bremer, for his statement, and then we'll hear from the President of the New York Public Library, Tony Marks, the President of the Queens Public Library, Dennis Walcott, and the President of the Brooklyn Public Library, Linda Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for your very supportive comments on libraries uh, and this budget. I also want to thank Speaker Johnson for coming to our rally earlier, which was amazing. If you agree with what we're saying, you can do the happy hands. 
um, and uh, my colleagues uh, who joined us as well. It was a spirited rally. Uh, let me be clear, when it comes to libraries, this proposed budget is a disgrace. Uh, we should not be in a position where libraries are down uh, and begging for what they need simply to serve the neediest New Yorkers. And uh, I want to thank everyone who's here who works for libraries, uh, who cares about libraries, who advocates for libraries. Um, we are in a position where we need the $8 million that the council put in baselined and restored. We need the peg to go away. We shouldn't be in a position where we're asking libraries to cut by millions of dollars how many books and DVDs you buy so that people in the city of New York can actually have the information they need to live the lives that they want to lead. Uh, and libraries uh, aren't uh, looking for anything extra uh, when it comes to the full 35 million. This is what is basically needed to operate, to serve people uh, in the city of New York. Uh, look, I said it outside, our mayor is running for president, and I certainly don't begrudge his ambition. But I will say this, there is nothing more democratic than a public library. There is nothing more progressive than supporting public libraries and the people who need public libraries. And I believe people love libraries everywhere in this country. Every state uh, uh, is going to have lots of people who love libraries. And uh, uh, if we want to be the fairest big city in this country, if we want to be the most progressive city in this country, we have got to get to a place where we are never cutting funding for public libraries. That should be where we are as a city and as a country. Uh, and uh, I certainly am looking for that commitment from our presidential candidates. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here. Thank you to uh, our, our co-chair. Um, I'm anxious to hear your testimony. And I know the council, uh, the speaker said it outside, and our finance chair just said it. We are very, very united in our support for libraries and our belief in public libraries. Uh, and we have a month to get it done. So let's get to work and make sure the public libraries have what they need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Van Bremer. I'm going to ask Council to swear in the panel. Oh, we don't, no. do we swear in this panel? No, okay, we don't do that. All right, um, somebody would like to start, Mr. Marks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, members. Um, it has been and continues to be an honor to serve and to serve with you. You've done amazing work for the libraries in the past, but as everyone has said, it's crunch time. I think we all recognize that. So we're here this morning to talk about very real, serious challenges to the city's public libraries. As much as we appreciate the record of investment on branch and capital um, from the city council and from the mayor, um, we now are in a position where we may not be able to maintain the work that we do to better the lives of New Yorkers. That's why, as you've heard, we need a $35 million in additional expense funding just to cover what the city has asked us to increase our efforts to do. And we, I'm not, not even going to talk about a cut. Um, and Linda will be focusing on our capital funding needs. Without that additional funding, and certainly if we received up to $11 million in expense cuts, which are currently on the table, days of service, hours, collections and programs will be impacted. A recent poll by Change Research showed that 95% of New Yorkers say a loss of library service would impact their communities, particularly children, seniors, immigrants, and low-income families. Let's just think about that for a second. We're talking about cuts, an attack, on the, civil, the civic institution that almost everyone in New York agrees is essential for meeting the needs of those who most need that help. But despite what New Yorkers need and want, we may be in a position of having and only being able to provide less service. The budget dance to reduce cuts, which is what we've been asked in effect to argue, 
when in fact we need more, shifts the grounds to a very unhelpful place and is not a happy dance for New Yorkers. With the city's support, four years ago, we, ate, we, we came back to instituting citywide six-day service and Sunday services. Um, but if things don't change, we may be forced to eliminate hours and even days. We saw the mayor recently on Inside City Hall, and we understand that this is a tough budget year. Um, but what he has offered for libraries in his executive budget is simply not going to work. We can still help the highest need New Yorkers. We have to be able to do that. New Yorkers rely on us more than ever, in large part because we've been asked by the mayor and the city council to do more, and we have been responsive and have, across the five boroughs, huge reach. Our, in the New York Public Library, our English language classes have increased 500% since 2012, and we've added citizenship classes. 118,000 people attended tech training last year. Almost 3 million computer sessions, 3.3 million wireless sessions in a city in which 2 to 3 million New Yorkers don't have broadband at home, so we lend thousands of people broadband at home. Early literacy, New York Public Library, we're up to almost 800,000 attendees a year. I bet between the three systems, we're well over 2 million. That's a 154% increase over just two years before. My Libraries NYC is providing over a third of public schools in New York with the library books that otherwise they would not be able to make available to their students. You asked us to do more, and we're delighted to do more in terms of correctional services. We created our first physical branches at Rikers and Manhattan Detention Center. You asked us to do video visitations, and we are doing that. We are offering over 6,000 programs to the homeless. We were the largest source place in which the city citizens could come and get IDNYC, again, at the request of the mayor and the city council. But we simply cannot sustain this extension of our work without sufficient funding. The needs are only growing. They are not shrinking. And neither is our footprint, by the way. In the next year, we'll add, just in our system, almost 40,000 square feet. Bigger branches in Roosevelt Island, Van Cortlandt, Washington Heights, East Harlem, McCombs is going to be five times the size that it was for decades. And of course, we will be opening our great central branch circulating library, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library. Construction will soon begin in Charleston, South Staten Island, um, opening in uh, FY21, the Charleston Staten Island Library, we'll need to hire 12 full-time staff and build a collection. And that's just one example. More space means more collections, expert staff, program needed, security and maintenance. We need the spending budget, the expense budget, but we also need the capital budget, and it is essential. I just want to reiterate what you're going to hear that we have ex expanded amounts deposited into the 10-year capital plan. It's very simple. Without that, we cannot plan. We cannot be efficient. We will lose the momentum that we're currently on of fixing up all of New York's branches, especially in the poorest neighborhoods. And the citizens of New York will get half as much, taking twice as long to get the renovations needed. We can't go back to that world. We also know that we have a new challenge coming up in terms of the 2020 census with billions of federal dollars and accurate representation at stake. Um, so we want to do more of that, and we are doing more of that. We saw a 30 percent increase in library card signups this year. More hours, more seats, more branches, more space, more programs, all cannot be lost. We know that you and the mayor have seen our value. Let me be very clear. We are doing so much more. This is not your grandmother's library anymore. We are everywhere, and everyone is coming to us. 
for the full array of needs. The city has asked us to do more, and I think we have proven, perhaps surprisingly, that we can be your best instrument. Because we can innovate, because we are trusted, and because we work at scale in every neighborhood. And because, like you, and like the mayor, we believe in equity and opportunity, not just in abstraction, not just in rhetoric, but on the ground where the people are and where they must not find doors shut on their libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs Drum and Van Bramer, for the opportunity to testify on the Mayor's Executive Budget. <coughs> we are grateful to you and your committees, to Speaker Johnson and Majority Leader Cumbo, to our Brooklyn delegation and the entire City Council for your outspoken support of New York City's libraries. I believe everyone who works in libraries believe, everybody who go comes to libraries believe, and thank goodness all of you believe that every great city deserves great libraries. Your investment over the last few years has enabled us to provide reliable core library services a minimum of six days a week, create new programming tailored to our com communities, and to upgrade our spaces to better serve the public. But our progress is being jeopardized by cuts proposed in the mayor's executive budget. Today, we implore you to reverse those cuts, increase library operating funds, and include $150 million in new capital, which is $50 million for each library system. It's baffling that our public libraries are facing millions of dollars in potential cuts instead of the increased funding we need to keep up with soaring demand and increased costs. The city co consistently turns to us as partners on priority initiatives for IDNYC, enrollment in our branches, for hosting early voting and prospective candidate training, for providing free legal resources to immigrants, and next year to ensure that every resident is counted in the 2020 census. We are proud to play this role, and our presence in virtually every community makes us uniquely suited to carry out the city's civic initiatives. Time and again, we have been there to bring them to life. We need the city to be there for us by making our budget whole and addressing the capital crisis plaguing our three systems. Even if the mayor's cuts are restored without additional operating dollars this year, our collections, staffing, and hour of service will suffer. Brooklyn Public Library's portion of the operating budget request, 9.7 million, is needed to support increased collections, programming, and staff, as well as physical improvements in our branches that are not capitally eligible. When I last testified, I detailed our innovative new programs describe the needs of our aging collection and our growing footprint, including opening Brooklyn's first new library in 36 years. Thanks to the city's investments in our three library systems, we are adding seven new branches and 11 expanded branches. 133,000 additional square feet in total. It, is, it was money well spent we will be bringing libraries to communities that either didn't have that either didn't have them before or were previously underserved we urged you to help us see that investment through the public is counting on us to open well staffed branches program rich and filled with materials our patrons need and deserve likewise the public is counting on us to open branches that are functional branches that are cool in the summer and warm in the winter, with roofs that don't leak and elevators that work. Our patrons deserve much more. Our aim is to, is to design welcoming and inspiring spaces able to support the countless ways people are using their libraries today. 
We truly appreciate the Council's advocacy to include libraries in the City's 10-year capital plan. However, the outcome was disappointing for all of us. While we received welcome one-time capital, in Brooklyn Public Library's case, $25 million for central library renovations, the plan did not include recurring funding for libraries to manage physical plants over the next 10 years. This is extremely short-sighted. Brooklyn Public Library alone is the steward of over 1 million square feet of city-owned property. Denying libraries the long-term funding necessary to maintain and improve our facilities is frankly reckless. The Council has the opportunity to make this right by pushing for a $150 million allocation in this year's budget. Each of our three systems needs $50 million to compensate for the lack of adequate funding in the 10-year plan. Libraries should not have to limp from year to year, only addressing emergencies. With your support this year, we can maintain building renovations already in progress, replace failing infrastructure, and keep our current projects moving forward as planned for the coming year. In every borough, value, valuable library projects are stalled because the city hasn't included capital dollars in future years. You know these stories all too well because, you, because we rely on your help in your districts to keep the projects afloat. Last year, for example, we initiated a project at the 111-year-old Leonard Library, one of the original Carnegie branches in Brooklyn. Armed with $33.3 million, I'm sorry, armed with $3.3 million, we sought to improve accessibility throughout the branch. DDC's front end planning unit immediately identified a deficit of $2.1 million, halting the project before we got started. Because libraries lack discretionary capital dollars in future years, we are tethered to a vicious cycle of awaiting each year's budget outcome in order to advance critical projects. And the strategic benefit of DDC's early planning unit is diminished. New capital funding this year will allow us to restart the DDC-managed projects that have ground to a halt as Brooklyn Public Library faces $22 million in shortfalls. Other project budgets balloon during design. Consider Borough Park Library, which began as an HVAC upgrade and roof replacement. Investigative probing early in the design process revealed that the exterior walls were deteriorating and lift, and lift left untreated, water damage would threaten the building's structural integrity. Given the entire building would be renovated, the scope was further expanded to include accessibility upgrades, a bathroom renovation, a new elevator, and modest interior and exterior renovations. Years later, we are still in the design phase for a much needed branch overhaul, and we are short $5.2 million on a $21 million project. As the Borough Park example illustrates, upgrading our buildings piecemeal, system by system, increases costs, elongates timelines, and disrupts communities. It makes much more sense to approach our buildings holistically from the outset. Of course, that won't always be possible, and in light of the lack of funding in the 10-year plan, a strong allocation this year will allow us to be the best stewards of the city's funds and to continue with our planned renovations. Last year, Brooklyn Public Library spent 500,000 of our precious operating dollars maintaining old equipment, replacing dilapidated furniture, and funding temporary heating and cooling fixes. In total, 629 hours of public service were lost to unplanned closures in this fiscal year with disruption at 35 of our 59 branches. Just last month, Kings Bay Library closed unexpectedly for emergency ceiling work, along with Flatlands and New Lots libraries for urgent building maintenance. These short-term fixes drain our already overstretched expense dollars, shortchanging collections, and other library operations. The $50 million persistent 
per, per system, system we are requesting will address a myriad of immediate capital needs in the coming year. Brooklyn Public Library has $230 million in deferred maintenance. New funding this year will allow us to launch several infrastructure projects, including new roofs and HVAC systems. Additionally, we need capital funding to replace the computers, the computers, servers, and networking equipment throughout the system that are at the end of their useful life. Maintaining the old equipment is a drain on our resources and leaves our patrons and staff with inadequate technology. You have been our greatest champions. You understand the impact that libraries have on our communities. And over the last few years, your support has allowed us to grow to meet their needs. New Yorkers agree it has been a wise investment. A recent poll found that 93% of New Yorkers believe that libraries are a cornerstone of all New York City communities. We depend on your leadership. Make this budget a reflection of our city's priorities. New Yorkers deserve excellent public libraries. They are worthy of programs that lift them up and collections that inspire, spaces that are welcoming, and buildings that are safe. We implore you to stay the course so we can keep our doors open wide for all New Yorkers and continue to strengthen the fabric of our city. Good morning. I'm Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library. It is a pleasure to be here today, and thank you Chairs Drum and Van Bramer and Speaker Johnson and the members of this distinguished joint committee for the opportunity to testify today. So I'm going to warn you beforehand, I'm not going to read from my script. I'm going to go totally off script because you've heard it and heard it and heard it, and you've heard it outside, inside, but more importantly, you believe it. You are the advocates on behalf of the library, and we say thank you for that. Uh, you heard Tony talk about the programmatic side. You heard Linda talk about the capital side. You know the issues because a number of you are from the great borough of Queens, and we have worked closely together in addressing the number of libraries in your particular district. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about this job itself because I've been very lucky in life, and I've had public service jobs just about my entire adult life. And this job to me represents one of the greatest jobs I've ever had, uh, in that we get the opportunity to serve our public, our customers, on an everyday basis. Plain and simple. We see them stream through our doors, we see them stream through the doors of our branches, and we're proud of what we're doing there. We're proud of our great staff who are there, but more importantly, we are there for children, for adults, for seniors. Just last week at Kew Gardens Hills in Queens, we had our older adult day, and I guess I qualified for that as well. <laughs> And the number of people who poured into Kew Gardens Hills to receive uh, the programmatic services and to really be a part of that was just tremendous. Uh, and we've done that throughout our library system with a variety of programs. All of that is threatened. All of that is threatened if we are not able to not just maintain services, but to get more money for the basic core services that we provide. And to blend the Linda and Tony testimony together, it's not about the expense side solely. It's not about the capital side solely. It's about a combination of both because we take great pride in having the great titles of president and CEOs of our respective systems. But more importantly, we take great pride in our libraries that are part of our system. And we want to see those libraries thrive and grow and flourish for the public at large. I don't know about my colleagues, but I know when I go to other cities, I make it a habit of going and visiting other libraries, just to get a feel of what's going on, to get the flavor of the programs that they have, the atmosphere they have, their infrastructure that they have. And when I come back, we always talk about what we can do to do better. But at the same time, people, I think, at times take us for granted. They think we're always going to be there just growing and responding to the needs of the city. And that's not possible. In addition to being great advocates and great CEOs, the thing that we pride ourselves on is also making sure we watch your investment. Not just your investment, 
but the public's investment to our libraries. And to do that requires us to sometimes make very difficult choices as far as that investment is concerned. And if we don't make those choices, then that investment will go up in flames. And what we're saying to you is continue your advocacy, continue your support, continue your funding, but more importantly, to make sure that we work collaboratively with the executive side to get what we need. Because without that, then we're gonna have to make difficult choices. Plain and simple. We're just gonna have to make very difficult choices as far as the futures of our systems. And I, as a competitor in life, serving the public, making sure we're providing the best services possible, do not want to be put in that position. And I know my colleagues definitely don't want to be put in that position. You guys are fantastic. I can check off every Queen's delegation member and all the outstanding work that you've done. We're about to open up a brand new library at the end of summer, and summer being September 21st, Councilman Van Bramer. So remember that summer is not the beginning of July, it's the end of <laughs> September, close to it. And we're gonna be very proud of that. I was out there yesterday at our soon-to-be Hunters Point Library, and it's gonna be a magnificent structure. It's gonna be a structure the day we open it that's gonna be overwhelmed with the public. And you know that and I know that, both for the people who live there as well as the people who want to see it, and especially in that area of town. And with all the plans that we have for all of your respective libraries, whether it's Rigo Park, whether it's Jackson Heights, whether it's Baisley Park, whether it's Queens Village, you name it, we have great plans for the future. But at the same time, those plans are threatened. They're threatened on the capital side, and they're threatened on the expense side. And our goal is to make sure that we are not overwhelmed, but that they're there to provide the core important services necessary for the public. In closing, I want to do two things. One is just one read one part of the testimony, and that talks about in fiscal year 2015, here at Queens Public Library, we had 943,000 customers who attended our programs. In fiscal year 2016, we had 1.1 million customers that attended our programs. In fiscal year 2017, that number rose to 1.4 million people. And this past fiscal year, that number went up even higher to 1.54 million customers that solely attended programs not who came through our doors, but came through our doors specifically for programs. As you can see, we are collectively responding to the public, and we need the continuing support and an increased support of your finances to make sure we continue to do that job. But don't take it just from me, don't take it just from Tony, don't take it just from Linda, but listen directly to your constituents as they share how libraries have transformed their lives and know that there are a thousand more stories similar to theirs out there and thank you for your leadership. And now, our video. New York City's libraries are an essential provider of free books information, and ideas for people of all backgrounds and ages. Together, New York City's libraries offer 217 neighborhood branches across the city. It's five boroughs. <laughs> New York City's libraries are an essential provider of. Oh, not happening. Yeah. He's the one who introduced it. <laughs> You're the one who introduced it. I did. <laughs> and I'm the one who sabotaged it. I know. I always point. See, Linda should have been leading us. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I just note that, you know, amongst the budget items are, you know, our tech and digital uh, efforts. <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> you really don't want to cut those more. You really don't.
Mr. Chairman, you, if you want to proceed. Yeah, let's go. Let, let's get started with some of the questions, and then this way, when they're ready, um, we can stop and see the video. Uh, first of all, thank you for the amazing testimony that all of you gave. Uh, and as you know, uh, and as you mentioned in your testimony, the council is solidly behind the work that you do. Um, we have been joined by council members Rosenthal and Cumbo. And let me start off by asking a few questions in terms of our budget response. In our budget response, the council called for an additional $27 million in expense funding. The baselining of $8 million of expense funding included in the 2019 adopted budget and an additional capital funding recommended by the council. The administration chose to include none of this in the executive budget. How did each library system use the $8 million that the council added at the adoption of last year's fiscal 2019 budget? I'll start. We used $1 million in Queens for staffing, $800,000 for programming, and $450,000 for non-capital non maintenance and repairs. Um, and with the staffing, we filled 15 union positions uh, that were vacancies at the library. So your funding for us was a lifeline for uh, continued services and programs, as well as dealing with uh, the non-capital uh, maintenance and repairs that we had to now do. In Brooklyn, we spent $750,000 on staffing. Um, we filled 10 positions. We spent a million dollars uh, on collections and uh, programming, and we spent 500000 on maintenance and repairs. At the New York Public Library, we spent $1.7 million uh, to fund wage increases uh, associated with the uh, important minimum wage increases, as well as collecting bargaining salary increases for our non-city funded union employees, including retroactive payments. 300000 is being used for overtime expenses in the branch libraries, a million dollars for building repairs, maintenance and equipment, and half a million dollars for books, supplies, and program-related expenses. What additional services would the branches be able to provide uh, if um you had an additional $27 million increase in um, expense funding. Mr. Chairman, the, um, what's happening in these three systems is, again, because of the investment that you and the mayor have made is we're increasing the number of libraries, in some instances significantly. The Mid-Manhattan is going to be, in, in the New York Public, as the biggest example of that, the biggest facilities project we've ever done. We've added hours, we've added days. You asked us to add programs, which we're happy to add because the citizens of New York apparently want those programs since they're coming to us by millions. All of that cannot be sustained if we don't have sufficient funding, and we simply don't at this point. It's that we've taken on more and you wanted us to, and we're delighted to, but we need to have the funding to pay for it. And in addition to everything Tony outlined, um, in this next fiscal year in particular, we know that we are going to be inundated with people who are coming to the library to get help filling out the census forms. They should be coming to their library. We have many, many, over 25 percent of the households in New York City without Internet access at home, and a census form, which is largely this time going to be an online submission. So it's a natural that the libraries be there, but we need to train staff to help patrons with that work. We need more computers so that um, when staff, when patrons come in to fill out the form, there's a place for them to work. And without additional funding, we'll still handle all the people that come to us, but we will not do it adequately, and it will not go the way the city would want it to go. Very good points. Yep. Um, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes uh, reductions in spending by each system to meet the PEG target set by the Office of Man Management and Budget, or OMB. How did each system achieve their target, and how will the PEG you choose affect the services you're able to provide? So we've challenged ourselves to take a look internally and try not to impact staff too much. But what we've already done is that we've taken a look at OTPS, and our OTPS line, other than personnel services, is cut to basically the minimum of non-existent. Non uh, in addition to that, I have slowed hiring down uh, tremendously. 
And uh, so we've had a slowdown in hiring. We do not necessarily have a hiring freeze, but of also being very forward thinking as far as anticipating potential cuts and what it means and with the peg itself. And so we've addressed it through the slowdown of hiring. So we've attempted to do that in a variety of ways, but at the same time, as Linda and Tony have indicated, uh, the system is growing. And so once we open up Hunter's Point, then I'm going to have a loss of staff in some of the existing branches going to Hunter's Point for the uh, responsibilities there. Then I'm going to have to do some of the filling of those lines at the other libraries. And so it's a very difficult budget dance that we're going through right now addressing the peg itself. Mr. Chairman, we, um, of the $3.3 million, we use close to a million of dollars of that, uh, very sadly, unfortunately, to reduce uh, some of what we could offer the public, in particular DVDs, which circulation has gone down, but people still rely upon us um, for that, and, and it helps introduce them to reading often as well. Uh, the rest of the $3.3 million, we were credited for the uh, energy savings that we provided to the city through the amazing lead uh, work at uh, the new Nearcos Library. But I want to reiterate uh, Dennis's point. As you've asked us to do more, and as we want to do more, funding hasn't increased. Now it's threatening also to be decreased. And what we end up doing for a while is robbing Peter to pay Paul. So we spend the money to fix up the Woodstock branch, and then we don't have enough funding to fully staff it, right? We spend the money to create a great new Nearcos library in Midtown, right, which will be our most visited branch, I'm sure. Um, and then we're going to have to steal staff and program from elsewhere in the system. That's crazy. That's just crazy. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, of course, Brooklyn is in a similar situation where we're looking at ways to reduce our budget other than reducing hours, which means other than reducing staff. Um, so the collections is always the first um, the first area to be hit, um, but also we are taking a hard look at every open uh, position and making sure that we are only hiring those um, that are absolutely essential at this moment. So how did you uh, work, if at all, with OMB to determine a peg target in the first place? <laughs> it, it, it was imposed, imposed on, on yeah. us. It, you were we, told. We, got a no, we got a letter. You were told. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I want to pick up on that in that we have had a very constructive back and forth with OMB. I mean, and so I know normally one does not hear from public testimony uh, talking about OMB in a very constructive way, but I think for us, we've had a very constructive engagement with OMB in the back and forth. We don't necessarily agree around different things, but at the same time, we said, okay, we have to absorb it, then what's the least painful way to absorb the peg. And so my CFO, my COO, and I, to some extent, have been in ongoing conversations with them to minimize any type of pain because, correctly so, they don't necessarily want us to impact the hours and the days of week of service, and we don't want to do that, obviously. And so how do we work collaboratively to address that since this is being imposed on us as far as peg targets are concerned? Is the video ready? You want to do the video now? New York City's okay. libraries are an essential provider of free books, information, and ideas for people of all backgrounds and ages. Together, New York City's libraries offer 217 neighborhood branches across the city's five boroughs. These branches are the backbone of New York's neighborhoods. I feel right now, I feel like a family in my library. It's the best thing that the city has because what a resource does the city have that's most important of anything that they have it's their people it starts with our youngest visitors where story times and other literacy programs help children discover the joy of reading and plant the seed of a life of learning they communicate wonderfully with the children they know them by name and I think that's mind-boggling because a lot of people come here my husband is pretty severely dyslexic so there's you know, a pretty good chance that Charlie will be as well. And I think it's so important to have a, a love of reading because if he is going to end up struggling with it, at least there'll be this foundation of understanding um, you know, that there is something pleasurable there and that it's worth the struggle. <laughs> After school, our libraries become vibrant centers for teens to study, get homework help, and access technology and support services they may not have at home, all in a safe, supportive space. Before I was um, 
in high school taking um, practicing for the SHSAT, which uh, I'm in a specialized high school right now, so I'm sure having access to those books in the library was one of the reasons that I was able to um, get in. Right now, my dad is working. He can't take care of me. He lasted two weeks without working. We were with hunger. So it's a, it's a kind of like hard life. My teachers like starting giving me homework. I didn't do it. Then, then my grade, but then my grades started going red. So since I got help from the from the library, which I think the teachers are like earning more trust on me. Yeah, the library like helps me and then keeps me on going. They like give me like the power to keep on going with my life. And then so far. I've seen a change in my grades thanks to them. New York City has always been a city of immigrants. We take pride in offering more English classes than ever before to people who may have no other option for building this essential skill. Learning in English in the library, is, it helps me a lot. It, it's helped me everywhere, through my family, at the job. Yeah, it, it, it feels me better and proud. I go to work and uh, I think now I speak very nice. But if it's not, it's not free and this library don't, if I don't get this library, I don't want to do. It's very hard for me. Libraries are a trusted place for immigrant communities. And they play a critical role on the journey to citizenship and encouraging civic participation and involvement in our democracy. Through the library, I was able to know more about American culture, American traditions, American background and history, government, in addition of the concepts of freedom, democracy, liberty, rights, all this stuff. It was beautiful. We're working to empower New Yorkers to sharpen their skills and build a stronger workforce, from computer classes to resume help and more. The skills offered throughout our programs also help older adults stay informed, active, and connected to their communities. So I was speaking to a friend and they suggested that I come here for career counseling. I found a job through the library. Right now it's crucial that people continue to have these resources because it's becoming harder and harder, especially for people that are 40 and up, to stay in the workforce. So the library's offering this resource is so valuable. Libraries open doors to opportunity especially for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. From support services for homeless patrons to books, education programs, and video visitation for incarcerated people, libraries help all New Yorkers make the city the best it can be. I got a sentence for eight months to be at uh, Rikers Island. I found this, um, the ESL program. That's how I got into the uh, connection with the library, and they helped me. You know, it, the ESL program helped me so much. I got a scholarship uh, to go to Manhattan College, which I'm going right now. I uh, had no time to think about anything else, but like, I want to go to school. I want to take the best of this uh, bad experience and, and make it happen. Ooh, if the library closed. I, I mean, my first ever books has been around in this library. It's a shame to cut the funding. I mean. I guess there's other things we can cut. <laughs> this, this is such a valuable thing. In I think the city should not be cutting in funds to life. They should add to the library. You'd be surprised how many people are there on a Sunday. It's jam-packed. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> I would just stand right out the, the library door, and I, will, and, I will, and I will put like a little, like a little tent there until they open with, with some books to read if I get bored. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. That was really informative and um, wonderful to watch. Uh, let me just, I'm going to just ask some questions about the capital strategy, and then I think I'm going to turn it over to Chair Van Bramer, and we have some uh, council member questions as well. So at the preliminary budget hearing, the libraries testified that they had is, have that they have assessed an additional $963 million need over 10 years above the need that was identified in the 10-year capital strategy. 
As you know, the council has been critical of the administration's presentation of the strategy because it is unrealistic, particularly in the final five years of the plan with respect to anticipated capital needs. Can you describe for the committee what the process of working with OMB to develop the 10-year strategy looked like, and did OMB give consideration to your needs assessment? <laughs> I, I think the um, I think the answer, Mr. Chairman, is in the result, which is um, you know we, the we got into the 10-year capital plan was it uh, four years ago for the first time in a century, and we saw a night and day difference. We suddenly could increase your investment and have significant more return. So we are all together probably, we are, are, have or are now working probably in roughly half of our square footage, which given four million square feet is unprecedented. The branches in, in many of the poorest neighborhoods hadn't really been touched in ages. That's a scandal in my opinion. We now have a very, we, we're still in the 10-year capital plan, so thank God for that, just, but with almost no funding in it. Um, and that means going forward, we can do less with the city's resources. If we can't plan, we can't be efficient. We end up using expense dollars. We end up doing Band-Aids. Only if we can plan can we get it done and we still have a couple million square feet to go between the three of us. Back to you. I think that um, one critical point, and there are many, but being included in the 10-year plan allows us to use the expense budget for the very purposes it was designed. And having to reach into the expense budget year after year so that we can keep the building safe and, and not even making them inspiring, but just keep them tight protected from rain, cool, warm, as appropriate. It's, it's not a good use of our money, and it's a bad way to plan for the future. So we've done an amazing job um, for the first time in our history of committing the money that's been allocated, of working library by library to do important and significant upgrades, in some cases complete rebuilds. Um, but all of that is in jeopardy because we don't see how we're going to do, continue this work in the future. So what we have here in Queens is a very detailed list of all of our capital projects proposed moving forward and basically what's built into the 10-year plan. But the reality is there are a number of shortfalls that go along with that as well. So we've done our internal analysis, we've planned it out, just like my fellow colleagues who also have done their own respective planning as well. And as a result of that, though, even though we were included in the 10-year capital plan, it doesn't address the amount of money that's required to do this. So in addition to what Linda talked about as far as uh, the capital emergencies that we have in the capital programs that don't qualify for capital dollars and then using expense dollars for that, uh, what has happened is that money gets pushed to the back end. And as a result of the money getting pushed to the back end, then a number of the necessary projects are not done at the front end. And as you all know, we work collaboratively with DDC in identifying what those needs are. And OMB helped deal with some of those shortfalls, but still there are a significant number of shortfalls that we have that will not be addressed until additional money is provided in the Kenya capital plan itself. Uh, was any additional funding added to, uh, for the libraries in the executive 10-year strategy since the preliminary um, strategy? Yes. Uh, in Brooklyn, um, we received yeah. $25 million for the central library renovation. So I don't remember the exact amount, and I'll look to our folks for the exact amount, but yes, we have received additional money since prelim uh, to address some of the shortfalls, one being uh, in Jackson Heights. And so that has been addressed, and there are several others uh, that have been addressed as well. Uh, so yes, we did get additional money to uh, take care of some of those shortfalls. And some of them are fully funded, so we didn't have to worry about shortfalls at all. Um, we. Um Excuse me, we, uh, for the $18.7 million in the 10 year capital plan, uh, 6.7 went to fund shortfalls. But let me just be clear about what that means. It means we are working with the DDC, our, our partners there, 
and we are finding projects that are going massively over budget mm -hmm. and taking way over time. Grand Concourse, 95% over budget. Bloomingdale, 90% over budget. And the other big ticket that we're grateful to have in the 10-year capital plan is $12 million for Westchester Square, an important project that has been way too long delayed. And because of its delay and because of, you know, how this process has worked with DDC and the city, it's massively over budget, significantly more than what we got in the 10-year capital plan. So we haven't gotten anything. We've just gotten some help to sort of make up for the problems that have been sort of imposed upon us up to now. So let me, I have it right in front of me and I didn't look down. So with the DDC shortfall so far, uh, seven million was identified, one for Glendale, Steinway, Rochdale Village, uh, and one of the, probably the most complex projects we have coming up is the Flushing Elevator and also Hollis renovation. So some of the money was added and then we have additional shortfalls and I've had painful conversations with a number of you and those who are not in the room around some of the shortfalls that exist in your respective projects as well. And so with the inclusion of the additional money, then that will address those types of shortfalls as we move forward with projects. Part of the reason that we're asking for 150 million across the three systems uh, in this particular uh, fiscal year is to make up for the fact that we haven't been included in the 10-year plan and we really do not want to see these capital projects that are underway come to a halt because of either escalating budgets or um, unanticipated emergencies. Okay, how do the, uh, the systems assess capital needs and how do you prioritize funding to meet the needs? Do you um, factor in community input and um, into the decision-making process? Sorry, absolutely, we, um, we don't do any projects uh, anymore without having uh, public meetings in the community and trying to work through those issues. Uh, for instance, uh, in our project in Inwood where we're building 174 fully affordable housing units above what will be a brand new library in the neighborhood I grew up in, um, bigger, beautiful, for free for the, for, the, for the taxpayers because of Robin Hood and a donor um, working with the city. Um, those are all projects, you know, that we, uh, we want to see more of. Um, but again, we need the capital funding um, to be able to plan to do that and to find those deals. So to answer your question, yes, we do. We can always do a better job. We meet with the local community boards. We meet with the various stakeholders. Obviously, we meet with you and then people who represent you as well. And so we're always out in the community. I think where the better job needed to be done and we're putting that process in place is how we <clears throat> drive the construction of new projects and what it means and having that input there as well. Uh, we have some complex projects in Queens that are coming up and we wanna make sure that the stakeholders have input into that process, whether it was in Far Rockaway and having input there as we move to do something in Corona with our Corona Library, uh, you name it, we have Rico Park coming up. So having that back and forth dialogue as far as those projects are concerned uh, for those that were already planned uh, as well as those that are being planned for the future. Okay, thank you. I uh, just want to say we've been joined by Council Members Moyer and Cornegy, and I'm going to turn it over to Chair Van Bramer. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum. So I want to start off by saying I am angry that we are in this position, listening to your testimony, hearing, Dennis, you talk about slowing down hiring, to hear Tony and Linda talking about the fact that we are buying fewer books and DVDs and providing fewer services to some of the New Yorkers who need those most as New Yorkers in this incredibly rich city, we should all be angry that we are in this place and in this moment talking about reducing services and programs to the New Yorkers who desperately need those services. Let me say something that I actually agree with the mayor on. In his introduction to his presidential announcement, that video, the first thing that he says is that there's plenty of money in this country, it's just in the wrong hands. I agree with that 1,000%. And what I get from that is that we should be putting more money and more resources into places like public libraries, into the hands of library workers 
who are going to make sure that some of the people in our city who have the least are getting more from our city and its libraries. It is absolutely outrageous that we're here listening to that young man in the video. And first of all, I don't know how you do it. There must be a casting call. You get the most adorable children every year in that video. And I don't know if we, he pronounces his name, uh, Brian or Brian, but to hear him talk about the fact that if the library doors are closed, he's gonna camp out in front of the building because that's how badly he knows he needs the library. Right? That's the difference that the library made in his life as his family was struggling. How, in this, one of the richest cities in the world, are we talking about cutting funding to families like his? How are we talking about reducing programs and services to immigrants, documented and undocumented, because our public libraries have always served everyone regardless of their status? No questions asked. That's why the libraries are the best and most democratic institution that we have in this city and in this country, if you're thinking about running for president of it. It is so important that we speak truth here Right, the mayor of the city of New York in this administration is proposing to cut your budgets substantially. That is wrong. It is morally wrong. It is indefensible. Knowing how wealthy this country is, knowing how wealthy this city is, what we need to do if we're serious about that and we want to be the fairest big city in the country and the most progressive city in the country is to fully fund public libraries. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be doing. So I am angry that we're in this place and that we have a 10-year capital plan. We fought so hard to get you guys in the capital, the 10-year capital plan four years ago. And it's good that you're back in the capital plan. But if there's no money in the 10-year capital plan for you, then what's the point? This city shortchanging libraries is shortchanging its people. That's what we're looking at here. And the council is always the beacon of hope for public libraries. It always has been. But, and I know you can't always say it quite the way I'm saying it now, but we need the mayor and this administration to meet us and to do the right thing to fully fund libraries, to baseline libraries, and to say once and for all that we're never going to cut libraries. Never going to cut libraries again in this city because it's wrong. Even in the Great Depression, we had libraries open seven days a week. Why in the hell are we here in the richest city in the country talking about making a young man think that he's going to have to uh, a camp outside of his library? That's wrong. It's morally wrong. It's indefensible. It's disgraceful. So we've heard it all before. Um, but I want to know from all of you, because I know that you talk to the administration as you have to and as you should, but what are you hearing from the mayor's side in terms of these cuts? My only conversation recently has been through our team, and that includes me as well, with OMB. And that's basically been the conversation that we've had. Um, so I have not talked to anyone in the executive, on the executive side in a little while around libraries. I mean, so that's just my side of the coin. I'm not sure about my colleagues. Yeah, um, likewise, you know, we've not heard a lot, um, although we did receive a missive that we were to cut $750,000 on our DVD budget, um, which is problematic on many levels um, because I think we're best situ situated to figure out how we are spending the dollars um, that we get and, and best at knowing what our patrons uh, are looking for. Mr. Chairman, can I just reiterate, you know, the sort of absurdness of this. I I've been to a bra I've been branch in the Bronx, seen kids with ancient laptops sitting on the stoop. You've heard the story before. They're doing their math homework because it's a sign. They're trying to succeed as we ask them to. And 
the kids on the stoop of the library because he can't afford broadband at home, what we take for granted carrying in our pockets. A couple million New Yorkers. He's on the stoop of the library, literally, Mr. Chairman, getting bleed from our broadband when it's closed because it's closed too much. Just think about that story in the city at the center of the world, of the information capital of the world. Our kids who we want to do homework are getting crumbs from under the door. That just can't be. That just can't be. We, um, we uh, are excited to see the mayor has just appointed a new deputy mayor who will be working with us, Vicki Bean. And <clears throat> we are very much looking forward to working with her. And we hope to get into discussions right away. You're a very hopeful and optimistic man, Tony Marks. And I want to believe uh, uh, that good things are going to come. Um, but, but so far, we are seeing something that is absolutely disgraceful and unacceptable uh, from this administration on this budget uh, so far when it comes to libraries. Your video was uh, good, and it tells the story, right? that there are people who are formerly incarcerated who are finding hope through their public libraries. There are immigrants, millions, in our city who find hope in our public libraries. There are public housing residents. There are people who are struggling financially. Seniors, they find hope. People who are homeless or formerly homeless, people who are struggling, people who are living in shelters, they find hope in the public libraries. You cannot be the fairest big city in this country and tell all of those people that we are cutting programs and services that are meant to lift you up. That is the end of that sentence. And uh, we're going to fight. I'm going to fight. But we have got to do uh, better um, when it comes to our public libraries. And I want to say thank you to all the work that uh, all of you do. Uh, more importantly, all the work to all the library workers uh, across this city uh, who every day uh, see all of those faces come into your local libraries, uh, some of whom are desperate for services, some of whom desperately need help. And you're the face that they see. Uh, but they don't get to see you if the doors are closed, and they don't get the help that they need if you don't have the funding you need. So uh, I want to thank the three of you, uh, but we all have a lot of fighting left to do, and I know that you know that I have a lot of fight in me when it comes to public libraries. So we'll be fighting for you every step of the way. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And we now have questions from members. I just want to remind them that we have three minutes. We are already almost 45 minutes behind schedule. So I'm going to have to be very strict about adhering to the three minute limit. We'll start with Council Member Barry Grudenchik, followed by Council Member Adams. Thank you, Chairs. Um, very quickly, uh, it's my great pleasure to work with uh, Dennis Walcott. I have seven libraries. He's in them uh, all the time. I don't know how he does it. He, he runs from branch to branch, quite literally. Um, we've had discussions, Dennis and I and other members here, every person here has a library capital horror story. And I can tell you, I know it's Hunter's Point in Jimmy's district. I know uh, in my district we're working on Hollis. Um, Adrian Adams has her own issues. Karen Kozlowitz has the Rigo Park branch, the Kew Garden Hills branch. We could go on and on. Several years ago at a budget briefing, the mayor said he was looking at the possibility of allowing the branch systems to do their own capital construction. Uh, the Board of Trustees of the three systems are entrusted with literally hundreds of millions, probably north of a billion dollars worth of New York City property. We trust you uh, through the agreements to do this for us um, and, and the mayor and the other elected officials appointed trustees. I would like to hear from you in the next minute and 53 seconds, uh, how much better would the capital construction process be? Because it can't get worse. How much better would it be if the library, the three individual systems were doing their own work? And I've heard from Dennis about this, so I'd be happy to hear from either New York or Brooklyn. 
can I just say on behalf of the New York Public Library, um, when we do self-managed projects, and we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, I we're able to, but there's a limit to how much we can advance and still keep, keep our budget going, our operations going. But when we manage our own project compared to when we do DDC projects, just as a matter of fact, costs twice as much, takes twice as long. You mean as the a, DDC project? Correct, okay. correct. Okay. And, and, you know, look, I'm, I'm not a public administration genius, but that sounds like bad public administration, I th right? I think everybody sitting here in this room <laughs> would agree with you. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert either, but twice as much and twice as long is a disaster. I have been trying to get this conversation going for a while, but I appreciate your frankness on that. Brooklyn, anything? <laughs> no, we all, we all love this question. You know, we can uh, lean in and tell you that we're doing things um, with half the dollars and in half the amount of time. Um, and that's true, but also um, we need help with the roofs, the boilers, the, the system is, is large and we are not you know, in the building business. Although I will say at this point, we have an extraordinary team in our capital planning department of finance experts, architects, project managers. And so since the city has entrusted us with capital dollars in the 10-year plan, we've made huge strides in terms of getting projects designed and built uh, on time and on budget. I thank you for your frankness. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Adams, followed by Koslowitz. Thank you, Chair Drum, and uh, certainly Chair Van Bramer, um, for your enthusiasm and your love and passion, um, as is my own. Thank you all for being here today. It is always a pleasure to have our library leadership in the People's House. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I am a former Board of Trustees member for the Queensborough Public Library, and I proudly served that body. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And I, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to go on the record this morning um, just to say that as we on the council continue to peel back the onion of what is the horror story of this budget, um, it is becoming more and more disturbing to me. We are looking at cuts to the most important people in our city, cuts to senior centers, cuts to breakfast and classroom, cuts to our public library system. And Linda, you said it best, you used the word baffling. To me, it is baffling that we are sitting here in the year 2019 not looking to promote and propel and extend the great things that New York is, but instead we are looking to demote and demolish and destroy. And so as we look at our libraries, I celebrate them in Queens. We had a fantastic town hall about three weeks ago, Dennis, wall-to-wall -wall standing room only. It was a public safety town hall. For myself, a first-time council member joining the realm of participatory budgeting, we had a celebration in the Rochdale Village Library celebrating the participation of our citizens of District 28 participating in sharing a million plus dollars in telling us what they wanted and how they wanted that money spent. So I just wanted to go on record just to say thank you. We have a lot to do. As I look at the project shortfalls, I notice that this is my area, Richmond Hill and Baisley Park, in the shortfalls list. I don't say that proudly, but I humbly say to you that I will continue to fight with everything in me, every fiber of my being to ensure the success of our public library system. Thank you very much, Council Member uh, Koslowitz, followed by Majority Leader Combo. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I sit here a little bit nervous about my Regal Park Library. Since 1993, we've been working on this. And is that in jeopardy? Regal Park is fully funded. 
and it is fully funded based on projections moving forward as well. So no, it is not. Matter of fact, uh, with Rigo Park, uh, we've been working very closely with DDC and our team has really been very out front in doing the work as far as the analysis and so we're on top of Rigo Park. Okay, okay because, uh -huh. you know, I don't have to tell you, you know the story. I the library it. in 1993 started out at costing $20 million and between the borough president going back to Claire Shulman we kept putting money in, I as a council member and the borough president. And then the 20 million now became $33 million. Uh -huh. And all that money got wasted because it took so long to get to this project. And the administration has to realize that when money is in the project, it has to go forward. So Rigo Park is currently in schematic design. Uh, and DDC is projecting completion of construction in the winter of 2024. So it's in schematic design right now. Okay, as long as they break ground yep. before I leave the council. That's what our goals are for a number of projects. Yes. Thank you. Also, Richmond Hill, where... Close hmm? discussion. Sorry. And what about Richmond Hill Library, Dennis? Uh, so with Richmond Hill, as you know, it was originally a pass-through project. It's now been submitted to DTC, and based on the initiation documents prepared by the Queens Public Library, DTC has begun the interdepartmental process of verifying the alignment between scope and funding. So we have been working now with DTC around Richmond Hill. Uh, we're waiting all outstanding requests uh, for information from DDC. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a meeting set up with DDC on Thursday with my COO and myself uh, with the commissioner and her first step uh, to go over the various projects in the borough of Queens. So that's where we are with Richard. Okay, I just want to make a statement. I can assure you that I will be fighting very hard mm -hmm. for libraries, that they don't be cut. I think that cutting libraries <clears throat> is cutting people's hard out. It's a very serious thing to have our children not have a place to go and, and learn. And libraries are another way of learning for our children, getting books, reading. You walk into a library at, after three o'clock in the afternoon and it's flooded with children and seniors. Seniors love the libraries. They go earlier in the day, but they love the libraries. So I will be fighting for libraries that they do not get cut and possibly get more money into the budgets. I also want to compliment you, Dennis, for the work that you do. I've been around a very long time and we've had other people running our libraries. You are the best. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now go to Majority Leader Cumbell, followed by Joe Nye, and we have been joined by Council Members Joe Nye and Powers. Thank you. I will be brief. Uh, certainly share all the sentiments and the disappointment um, in the cuts that we've seen to our libraries but I, I, I wanted to get specific in this way on the Walt Whitman Library and wanted to know what is the update on that library as well as moving forward with gaining an understanding. Do you have any um, understanding about the, the South Portland project um, at 300 Ashland, uh, if there have been any updates or movements as far as that project goes? Uh, I'll start with the second part of the question on South Site. Um, I wish I had an answer, frankly, um, and it's not really within our control. I uh, think that there is a dispute between um, the city and the developer, and until that gets resolved, the space will not be turned over to the library to begin um, the construction. The project has been fully designed and is ready to start construction when we do get access to the, um, to the space. And on Walt Whitman, um, we are waiting for funds. Um, we have um, uh, 
um, a process for interior upgrades. It's a, DDG, a DDC project um, which um, has infrastructure needs and is in design. Not quite the answer I was looking for, Sorry. but do you, do you have a timeline in terms of, yeah. I, I too share the sentiments yeah. of Councilmember Koselwitz in terms of we've got two and a half years left to go right. and we want to really see a lot of these projects that we've. So do we, and you know, we are awaiting additional funds before we can get started. It's a classic, uh, a classic case for us, unfortunately. We're making a lot of projects and a lot of, um, what? In two years. I don't know that I want to tell you what they're all whispering to me. Um, <laughs> construction may start in two years. Wow. Yeah. We'll have a separate meeting about this. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Joe and I are followed by Powers. Thank you, Chairs. It's unexplainable that Regal Park, 26 years before the project even begins, I, I just can't even begin to think of how that's possible. I'll continue to echo the sentiments of my colleagues and the importance of libraries. Not only do they provide a learning experience, but they are also a safe haven for our communities. Westchester Square Branch, are we fully funded? No, sir. We, um, l let me just be clear, this, we share your concerns, our dismay uh, that this project is still not, in, you know, ha happening. Uh, having heard just from uh, Member Koslowitz about a similar project that's going to be 20 years from when envisioned to when completed. 26 years. In this, right. The, um, we, we did get the additional funding towards Westchester Square in the... 10-year capital, it's the really what we got in the 10-year capital. That takes us to about $30 million. Currently, the estimates, because this project has gone on and on, is $33 million, which again is of great concern to us. We will, we are moving, we have the, uh, we will get the ULERP, the ULERP is done. We will acquire the property and then we will proceed um, with demolition of what's necessary in the site and then building. But we are still short, and the price keeps going up. This is a, it, this is a pattern we're all hearing across the systems. How, how many square feet is this library, the projected Westchester Square Library? Going to be. I think it's going to be 12,000. What's the current one? Is also 12? Yeah. $33 million. Yeah. Divide that by 12,000 square feet, correct? Yep. That's $2,750 a square foot. We currently are building condos in Manhattan for a lot less than that. I couldn't agree more, sir. Couldn't so agree we, more. Help us understand. Put your finger on the problem. Is this criminal? Not to my knowledge, sir, but clearly money is, it done it is a crime for the citizens of New York when you don't get, when we don't get, our capital projects done in a timely and cost-efficient way. Everyone pays for that because that's money we don't have for all the other amazing things that we need to do in New York. So, problem solution and move on. You've, we have identified a problem. Who do we blame? Someone's got to be the cause of all of this. And if you want us to help you, we need this information. You obviously see it day in and day out, and it's the sentiment of everyone right. in the we, council, and it's going on for decades. I think that's right, which is, it's, it's hard. Clearly, it's a hard political problem in ways I can't fully understand. I'm not on, the, on that side of, of, the, of, the, of the wall, if you will. But the, um, look, we work with DDC. They're our partners. We need them to be our partners. There are things we can't do. But there are some of these particularly large projects that apparently just are overwhelming the system. They get stuck, the money, keep, the cost keeps rising, then the budget races to try to keep up with the rising cost, and nothing happens. And the problem keeps, the, the hole keeps getting deeper. 
I, I know that the administration shares our concerns with this. I know the head of DDC, who's, who's really come in with, with a breath of fresh air there, um, is trying, and I'm sure it's difficult, but something has to fundamentally be rethought, and that's always the hardest thing to do. So real quickly, I mean, there's several things going on in response to your question. One, I think, is what we've talked about earlier as far as uh, the 10-year capital plan and having the appropriate money to address some of these shortfalls built into the existing 10-year capital plan. That's one. I think with Lorraine starting, Lorraine Grillo starting as Commissioner of DDC and her role also as President of the School Construction Authority, Lorraine is bringing reform to DDC to help address some of the issues that you've raised as far as having the forecasting done properly as well. Uh, when you broke down rather quickly the price per square, I think part of the problem in the past has been not a realistic projection on the price per square, therefore we're caught with shortfalls. I think that's being addressed. I think the market is hot right now. And so with the market being hot as far as capital construction is concerned in New York City, uh, then you're gonna see the price going up and up and up. And as you all know, many years ago, the market was not as hot here in New York City as far as the construction industry is concerned. And so we're living in that type of environment right now where, we, again, we're having our price points driven up higher and higher. And so it's all combined together uh, painting the shortfall that we're facing. And I think, as I said to uh, Council Member Koslowitz, that with Rego Park in particular, that was way before my time, but since I've been here and since we've been here in this administration, both through the council and the executive side, that project was fully funded and was fully funded based on projections moving in the out years as well. And that's how you start to solve the problem, but I think part of the challenge that Linda talked about is the challenge of a city agency doing something no matter how well intention the commissioner is and the type of reforms that are put in place versus an entity like the libraries themselves that can produce a product that is done in a more efficient way, in a more timely way, and that's as a result, I think, of the efficiency of the operation and also the less of the bureaucracy that we have in performing those tasks. And I think all those things working together will allow us to hopefully improve uh, the construction process as we move forward. Sir, okay. thank you for that explanation, but again, we're coming up for excuses because this is I don't believe in, oh, no, 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 no. I don't believe in excuses at all. I mean, from our point of view, and I think the libraries like you are all committed to building libraries in an expeditious but appropriate fashion itself. And I think our challenge as a system, as a city government, as a not-for-profit is to work collaboratively in knocking out the excuses that you're referring to and making sure we're able to produce a product that we'll be proud of. I mean, it's unacceptable, and we've articulated this before in our hearings, to have you guys who have been great for us, who have been great for the communities, providing the funding, not to be in office when we break ground and the project starts eight years ago, that's unacceptable. We concur with you, we share your beliefs, and we want for our customers, not just for you, to make sure we're putting out the best product possible, and that best product is not just on the program side, but it's on the infrastructure side. And again, we're talking about huge construction projects, but also we're talking about the smaller projects, and the projects that Linda referred to earlier in her testimony that are we feel capitally eligible, but they may not be deemed capitally eligible, therefore we're using expense dollars for that, and that's sucking money away from the expense side of our business. So we're not looking, and we're not trying, and I apologize if it sounds like I'm trying to put an excuse out there. That's not the case at all. We want the same thing as you as far as having libraries built expeditiously, but also in a way that it will allow us to do the job for our customers that provide high quality services. Hey, Council Member, I need to move on to Council Member Powers. Thank you. I'm picking up on where he left off anyway. But the, um, you know, the, the question from Council Member Grudenjic earlier about half the price and half the money to build if the library systems do it themselves versus DDC uh, is a, an astonishing uh, a number and an admission that the city is doing something wrong here. But can you tell us what you guys can do that they can't do to make that cheaper and faster? Why is it so that the systems can build half the price and half the time versus relative to DDC? Yeah. So it's hard to know how another agency is operating, um, and we're all hopeful with new leadership at DDC that we'll see a change. Uh, but we have a lot at stake in the projects that we're managing ourselves. In fact, if there are cost overruns, we're responsible for them. And so we're f highly motivated, A, because we want the projects to be built on time and on budget, because 
we want our patrons to be able to take full advantage of the new projects as quickly as possible, but also financially we have a lot at stake. And whatever disciplines we are imposing on our own operations need to be um, also applied uh, at, the, uh, at the agency. And at how many projects do you build on your own versus having DDC build for you? So uh, in Brooklyn, we're new at this. Um, You're doing all? No, no, we're not oh. doing all. And, oh. we, and by the way, we couldn't do all. Um, we couldn't possibly, with the staffing that we have on the expense side, <laughs> sorry to get back to that, but we couldn't possibly have the staff we need to take care of all the roofs and all of the boilers and HVAC systems that need to be repaired routinely. This is just standard maintenance. Um, and so we've been selecting the projects that have a strong aesthetic component involved in them, new, new buildings or dramatic uh, renovations to do ourselves, and leaving the other projects uh, for DDC. Can you just give me an idea how many projects you have? Um, that right now right we now? have eight zero. Yeah, the, um, uh, the pro here, here lies the problem. We have 59 buildings with two more are coming online, and yet we have 80 projects that are currently um, registered with DDC. Got it, and awaiting to get done. Okay, <clears throat> um, just wanted to get a snapshot of that, but I, we, you know, we wanna get these projects done fast too, so we're willing to work with you to figure out how to do that, and I think expense is being part of it. I'm just gonna finish up, I have um, just one last question here is, we had a hearing with the BOE last week talking about early voting places and polling places. Can you tell us, each of the three systems, how many libraries today serve as polling places? And, and I should add early voting places. So well. in, in Brooklyn, we'll have, we'll, we'll have two early voting sites, which is a real challenge because of the length of time that there'll be voting sites and the, you know, the wear and tear on the building and also the staffing that was required. We're happy to do it. Um, and then we have 20 sites uh, that are you know, uh, voting stations on, on election day. So in Queens, we have three sites that will serve as early voting sites. And for our regular voting, I think we have, how many? 23, right? 13, 13, 13 uh, sites that serve as polling sites. At the New York Public Library, we have three, Richmond Town, the high school library for the, for the impaired, as well as a library uh, where the uh, uh, a resident at Trump Tower votes on 53rd Street. Yes, so it's my district. And <laughs> you have three for early voting, and how many total? No, no, that's for voting. For voting. You only have three polling places in your whole system that we, are We have responded to requests. It just happens that, that, that those neighborhoods have been using other spots that they're happier with. But we're open to doing more. And that's why we're also eager to help with the census. I would just note that the BOE to their, I mean, I fight with the BOE on a lot of stuff, but to their credit, have explained, explained to me often their difficulty in finding polling places, and it seems like having only three is... is we'll, we'll go back to them. We'll go okay. back to them and see if they need more. Okay, thank you. But I will note on other civic stuff, IDNYC, participatory budgeting, and other things, you've been partners with my office, so I, I, I appreciate that. And I will make a plug for you guys. You guys have the best app. I think the all system used it, the, the, the way you can look at books is the best app, and if you're a reader, it is great, and I use it all the time, so thank you. Hey, just wait, when we go from 100,000 titles on that app for anyone to use to every book ever written, which is the goal. All right, we'll look forward to it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank this panel for coming in. Thank you to thank Tony you, Marks, to Linda Johnson, to Dennis Walcott. And we'll take a five minute break and then we're going to go to culturals. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you.
Are the sergeants ready? Sergeants. Okay, uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on... Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is joined by the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, chaired by Councilmember Jimmy Van Bremer. Uh, we are joined by our uh, Majority Leader, Lori Cumbo, and the others will probably be joining us shortly. Uh, we just heard from the libraries, and now we will hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, Tom Prinkle-Pearl. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Drummond. I want to thank all the members of the cultural community who are here today and who took part in the rally uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, I was only able to participate uh, in a portion of that, uh, but I was spirited in my defense of the cultural community uh, before I had to come back in here and conduct the library portion of the event. Uh, and I just want to say uh, I am very, very upset that we come to this hearing in a place where the administration is doubling down on its cuts to the budget of the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is not just a cut to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Let's be frank about what this is. This is a reduction in funding, no matter how big or small, to every organization in the city of New York that is receiving funding and to cut the budgets of our program groups, uh, some of which are so incredibly small, neighborhood-based, nonprofit cultural organizations in all five boroughs serving every community, many of which are uh, run by and serve um, uh, communities of color, immigrant communities, that's unconscionable. It's unconscionable uh, in a city with the wealth that we have, uh, with the numbers coming in from the personal income tax uh, across the city, above projections. There is a lot of money in this city. It is a very, very wealthy city. And this city would be far better off if we understood that instead of cutting every cultural organization's budget, we should be increasing every cultural organization's budget in the city of New York. It is, it is uh, <laughs> befuddling at the, at the uh, most generous uh, to be looking at this area, which, and I talked a little bit outside, we know culture and the arts, when children and young people have culture and the arts in their school experience, we know they perform better. Uh, we know that when the arts are present in communities, there are dramatic uh, uh, improvements to the well-being of the people in those those communities. I believe we share uh, a foundational belief that equity and access to culture and the arts is, is at the base of any progressive city and civilization. And that makes it even more, more befuddling that this administration is cutting the budget and then baselining those cuts and then doubling down. Uh, on the cuts. It is unfathomable that we are here um, talking about restoring cuts to the budget. We shouldn't even be having this conversation. We should be talking about making sure that the cultural community has what it needs to succeed and thrive 
not simply survive and subsist. Like enough of those days. I thought we had moved beyond that discussion. Um, and, you know, this is not um, a question of luxury. Um, this is a necessity. Access to culture and the arts is an absolute necessity. And I will never understand, and certainly we'll have time to talk to the commissioner after he testifies, how an administration in one uh, uh, venue will talk about how many tourists come to New York City and how many billions in revenue that generates and how wonderful it is that so many of them talk about how culture and the arts are such a big part of why they come. We know that spins off billions in revenue for the city of New York. Um, and yet, we come here and the Department of Cultural Affairs will talk about a budget cut. A budget cut to its budget. But it's not a, a, a cut uh, uh, to, to Tom's agency, it's a cut to you all. And by extension, it's a reduction in services to all eight and a half million New Yorkers. That's unacceptable. That's uh, disgraceful given where we sit in this city and in this country of great wealth. Um, uh, this is not prudent, this is foolish. Um, uh, cutting the budget for uh, an area that spins off billions in revenue. Admittedly, the OMB uh, director said the same at the hearing. Spins off billions in revenue. Foolish uh, to cut uh, uh, even a dime. We should be talking about increasing the budget. Never mind, beyond the numbers in terms of what this community produces for the city of New York, it's. It, it goes much beyond that because in a time when there is so much hatred and there is so much ugliness and so much divisiveness in this country that we as progressives, we who talk about fairness, we all know that the one thing that brings everyone together that actually provides a little bit of hope in this moment is when people come together in a community and see a performance and hear a song and watch some dance and see uh, some beautiful uh, art on the wall, that brings us together, that sustains people uh, in this time of, uh, of, of hatred and instability and divisiveness. So for all those reasons and more, I am anxious to hear uh, from the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, share with us our outrage at these cuts and what is our plan to not only restore these cuts but to increase funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you, uh, Chair Van Bremer. I uh, will now ask counsel to swear in um, Commissioner Finkelpearl. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. You may <coughs> proceed. You may begin. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Van Bremer and Drum and other members of the uh, committee. I am Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl here today to testify in regards to the Mayor's Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Proposal for the Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm joined by a number of my staff members from the agency. I'll begin with a look at the numbers. DCLA's Fiscal Year 20 uh, Executive Budget is $144.3 million. By comparison, at this point last year, our FY19 Executive Budget was $145.3 million. The FY20 figures include $28.3 million for the Cultural Development Fund, $103.2 million for the Cultural Institution Group, $1.2 million uh, energy support for groups on city property under DCLA jurisdiction, $6.5 million for agency operations and, bu and building capacity, uh, community capacity program, $5 million in funding to be allocated at adoption. As always, these figures do not include council initiatives that are typically added at adoption. DCLA's five-year capital plan, capital budget, which I testified on at preliminary budget hearing in March, is unaffected by executive budget. It allocates $1.15 billion to projects for 250 cultural groups citywide. This investment continues to provide extraordinary cultural venues, uh, welcoming all New Yorkers. Since the adoption of Create NYC, we have also committed to directing millions of in capital funding to projects that promote more accessible facilities for people with disabilities. Further, 
we've directed millions in capital funding towards projects that foster a more sustainable cultural, more sustainable cultural facilities, reducing the sector's carbon footprint while expanding opportunities for cultural engagement for all New Yorkers. As of the executive budget, DCLA's FY19 modified budget is now 197.7 million. This remains the largest allocations, allocation in agency history and the largest public source of cultural funding anywhere in the United States outside of the federal government. We're proud, we're proud of, to work alongside the city council to make these historic investments. The roadmap provided by Create NYC Cultural Plan continues to guide DCLA's fiscal choices, ensuring that they are aligned with the values uh, around arts and culture expressed to us by thousands of New Yorkers from all five boroughs. Uh, now for an update on a few um, agency programs and initiatives. This year's second cohort of the Create NYC Leadership Accelerator is happening now. We launched this program as a pilot last year to help mid-level cultural workers grow into leadership roles. The demographic survey of DCLA's grantees that we released in 2016 showed that there are far less, there's far less diversity at the top of the org chart for many cultural groups. This, along with the input received during the cultural plan public engagement, indicates that, barriers, indicates that there are barriers within the cultural sector prevent advancement for underrepresented groups. The Leadership Accelerator program participants examine systematic issues that prevent more diverse leadership. 26 individuals took part in the previous round earlier this year, and another group just started. The feedback on the program has been excellent. Participants report that they learned new strategies to advance, um, to advocate for themselves. We've also seen them forge strong peer networks that can help advance their careers over the long term. On May 2nd, we announced the launch of another program tied to the Cultural Plan's findings. Community Organizing 101, Engagement Tactics for Cultural Organizations, is a pilot course that will train staff from cultural organizations around the city in strategies for sustained community building. During public engagement conducted for Create NYC, residents and cultural workers called for the city to support cultural groups in efforts to establish stronger connections with their neighborhoods. Representatives from 30 DCLA-funded organizations from all five boroughs are participating in the free pilot course, providing them an opportunity to learn how to integrate the tools of community organizing into their work in the cultural sector. On May 4th, the latest group of CUNY Cultural Corps students celebrated their graduation at Lehman College of the Bronx. Supported by DCLA and the Rockefeller Found Foundation funding, these extraordinary students, more than 130 of them, have paid internships with 63 partner car uh, cultural organizations. To date, 340 students have completed the CUNY Cultural Corps program. About 20% of participants have received job offers from their host sites and many have gone on to explore careers or areas of study in arts and culture. The Cultural Corps has brought hundreds of students into cultural community who might not have otherwise considered art and culture as a career path. Cultural organizations have been thrilled with the 62,000 paid work hours contributed through this program. They've been even more excited about the smart, skilled students that they've had the opportunity to work with. This is laying a solid foundation of professional and personal relationships on which these students can build their careers. Last year, we hosted Create NYC Office Hours with the Commissioner at MoMA PS1 in partnership with Chair Van Bramer, where we discussed the intersection of arts, culture, and LGBTQ history and activism. Just yesterday evening, we hosted a follow-up to uh, Create NYC Office Hours in, the, in advance of Pride Month and the 50th anniversary of Stonewall Uprising at the Bronx Council on the Arts. In, titled Voices Unheard, the focus um, of this public dialogue was LGBTQ artists and art spaces since Stonewall. Many people took part, including our fellow members of the Stonewall 50 Consortium. We look forward to continuing this dialogue in the weeks and months ahead. It's important that while we celebrate our victories and those who sacrificed uh, to achieve them, we don't forget the challenges that still lie ahead. In April, we announced four new public artists in residence, or PAIRs, who will work with four city agencies over the next year. The PAIR and their host agencies are Taja Lindley, uh, working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Tremont Neighborhood Health Action Center. She will start her residency by exploring how the voices of pregnant and parenting black people in the Bronx can advance reproductive justice and inform changes in medical practices and government policies. 
Laura Nova, working with the Department of the Aging to deepen the city's understanding of ageism and its impact on older New Yorkers. Julia Weist, uh, working with the Department of Records and Information Services. She will start by focusing on Doris's colonial collection, exploring how artists might help present the colonial records to better represent the perspectives of indigenous and enslaved populations of the period. And Janet Zweig, working with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to support MOS's efforts to convey a new, um, to New Yorkers how they can make positive difference on issues around sustainability. And I'm pleased that two of our previous pairs, Tatiana Fazlaliza Day with the Commission on Human Rights and Rachel Barnard at the Department of Probation, had their residencies extended by their host agencies. Their work addressing anti-black discrimination and street harassment and improving relations between DOP officers and their clients continues. And finally, last month, the 33 members of the Cultural Institutions Group submitted their diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, plans to the agency. This new requirement has, was originally announced by the mayor when we released Create NYC. As you know, the CIGs consist of a wide range of organizations, from large museums to community-based performing arts centers to zoos and gardens. Their DEI plans will reflect these disparate sizes, disciplines, and audiences. But across the board, the group, sees, uh, the group see this as an opportunity to dive into critical issues that will shape the future of the sector. As our population grows more diverse, our cultural institutions need to keep pace in order to continue offering programs that make these vital, relevant institutions. We've started our internal review process and look forward to working with these institutions to foster a more inclusive workforce for the rest of my tenure as commissioner. Thank you to the council for its ongoing commitment to supporting arts and culture in NYC, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Finkel Pearl, for your testimony. I want to start off with some uh, general questions about uh, the PEG. Uh, as mentioned at the preliminary budget hearing, the council is concerned about the $6.2 million PEG target that OMB set for DCLA. The PEG was achieved through, the hiring, through a hiring freeze, a reduction in the Cultural Development Fund, and a reduction of subsidies to cultural institution group members. Uh, why are we de-emphasizing the cultural community by cutting funds, particularly in light of the work we just did regarding the cultural plan, when now is the time to be adding money and not cutting it? So, I mean, I think that probably is a fundamental question that's going to be asked a number of times at this hearing. And I will say that, look, uh, it, between the time that I sat here last and, and now, there has been progress made on this. First of all, uh, there were ways in which the PEG was mitigated using agency savings, but also I think the most fundamental thing is it's a one-year PEG. So many agencies at, uh, across the city are facing baseline pegs that are permanent. This peg money gets restored next year. So it's something where I think in recognition of, of the discussions that we had at the last hearing, um, that, that we were able to make a bunch of progress in terms of the size of the peg and the, and the, uh, the uh, duration of the peg primarily. But you know, I, I think that the, the answer also is simply that the um, the administration does care about arts and culture. We, have ha we do currently have the largest budget in the history of this agency. We're within a million dollars of where we were exactly at this time last year. And we look forward to working with the council towards adoption um, you know, for a healthy cultural budget for New York City. So Commissioner, only about um 5% of the department's total budget supports direct agency expenses. The remaining 95% supports cultural institution groups and other arts organizations. So uh, why did you have such a high peg target for an agency where really the only room for a reduction would necessarily hit the arts community directly? So, I mean, I think there are two parts to, to answer that question. So, as I understand it, in the nonprofit sector, if you're spending more than 65% of your money on grants, if you're a, a, a foundation, that's considered to be an efficient agency. There's no other uh, agency that I understand that is anywhere close to as efficient, if you might say, as the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City. So what you said um, a minute ago, which was that 95% of the agency budget is grants. 
is a remarkable thing in America. Most foundations, and even if you look at the National Endowment for the Arts or New York State Council on the Arts, spend a much larger percentage of their funding on the operations of the agency. So I think it, you know, you've pointed actually one of the, the good things about the agency is how incredibly efficient it is. So that having been said, um, if the city is facing budget cuts and we're looking at $750 million of savings in this budget, a cut a, you know, uh, to the agency necess necessarily includes cuts to the, um, to the groups. But all I'm saying is that you know, if you are looking to cut proportionally different agencies, there's just no way at our agency, like if you were to take a $6 million cut of, out of our agency budget, we would be left with $200,000 to run the agency. Do you understand what I'm saying? Almost all the money is going to our fantastic cultural groups there. So the only way to save money on that budget, and I know that that's a debate as to whether that should be even considered, is to make cuts, and then the cuts were made proportionally to the cultural institution groups and the program groups. So the, uh, it, was a similar, it was a similar percentage cut for both. Did you work with the OMB to target these yes, cuts? absolutely. So yeah, we did work with OMB, and we worked with OMB also to mitigate the cuts since the last hearing that we had. So for example, we um, made the decision, <coughs> supported by OMB together, that we would, you know, uh, and we've done this before, that the cuts, and this is bad news for some of our friends and, and better news for others, would be larger cuts to the bigger organizations within the CIG. So it's a twice as much of a cut percentage-wise to the larger groups, which is also where the majority of the money uh, was cut. So we talked about that. We said that the impact, as, uh, as Council Member Ben Bramer said, on the smaller organizations is sometimes quite severe. It is very hard for the bigger organizations as well. I don't want to diminish that. But absolutely, so that's an example of uh, our agency working together with OMB and saying if these cuts are happening, we want to make sure it happens in a way that, that mitigates some of the uh, pain on the uh, smaller organizations who have the smaller budgets. Well, just, I fundamentally agree with uh, Councilman Van Bramer on the impact that this is going to have on the smaller organizations in particular, but to all of them actually. So um, anyway, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes a reduction of 1.5 million in fiscal 2020 through a one-time elimination of supplemental funds for cultural institutions. In the past, this funding has been used to address emergency needs at cultural organizations. So what kind of emergency needs have the organizations used the funding for? Right, so what you're talking about actually is two different parts, but you're, it's correct, but let me just clarify. So there's a million dollars in supplemental funding for the CIG, and that's been very important, and again, that is uh, uh, money that's been there for quite a period of time, and that has gone you know, under this administration to special projects at CIGs for the smaller CIGs with budgets under $12 million. The $500,000 is the emergency money as a separate fund. Uh, so that's been everything from a, an emergency boiler bursting in the middle of the winter. Uh, this did happen. Uh, and we were able to, what we generally have done in these situations, as you know, the cultural institutions are responsible for the maintenance of their own property. But when something comes up, like an emergency, like a burst boiler, what we've been able to do is to, and we have a review process within the agency, often pay about half of that. And many of the cultural groups, I'm sure, that are here have profited from that. So they have, let's say, a, a burst boiler. There's all of a sudden an emergency $50,000 expenditure. Often we've been able to throw in $25,000 uh, to mitigate that. So how will you uh, be able to tackle the emergency needs of these organizations without the funds? So first of all, that's a new fund under this administration that wasn't even there more than, I think, um, Philippa, that the $500,000 is from two years ago or three years ago? Three, okay, so we think it's been, it's under this administration that that money has been added. It, it isn't traditionally something that Department of Cultural Affairs has done. I think it's been highly valuable. And again, there's, you know, we're looking forward to negotiations as we go forward uh, towards um, the adoption. There's $5 million of unallocated money in the budget right now. It's $5 million. And by the way, there, this is baseline money that's in our budget 
so there's going to be a question. I think it would be important to uh, restore some of that money you're talking about within that $5 million. <clears throat> the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes a 1% reduction of the Cultural Development Fund grants. The total funding for CDF in fiscal 2020 with the reduction is $28.25 million. How many organizations will be impacted by this um, reduction? So I think at the... The belie our belief is we're in the middle of the process right now, the CDF process, uh, and we're about halfway through and the grants will be allocated. So the, uh, the pain of this cut will mean slightly smaller grants to each of the grantees, right? So it's not the number of organizations that would change. We expect the number of organizations to remain steady but the amount of money per grant would go by down by that uh, 1% or whatever that you're saying. So in other words, if you were getting uh, a, whatever, a $100,000 grant, you might have a $98,000 grant or something like that uh, in the coming process. And again, I, I don't want to diminish that. These are important, you know, every penny counts, especially in smaller organizations and the bigger ones as well but it would be across the board as we see it. So the same number of grantees and a, a slightly reduced amount of money per. So what is the uh, CDF budget for 19 and uh, what's the average award for small and large organizations? Yeah. Hold on, I do have that. So the average award for, so we divide it between organizations. About half the organizations that apply to us have budgets under 250,000 and the other half are above. And these, you know, and so they're very small organizations all over the city, often with one or no employees, full-time employees. The average award for those smaller organizations was $8,500. And the average award for the larger organizations was $44,000. And those go up to the very large organizations that are not within the CIG. So uh, that was the average award that was recommended by the panels calculated before, uh, you know, there's sometimes there are council ads and there are ads based on the additional money that we got at adoption last year, et cetera. Those are those numbers. Uh, how many multi-year recipients got renewed funding in fiscal 19? So the, the multi-year, so they, they have now, uh, they don't go to panel, they go directly to staff. So again, uh, I, don't, I think the number is around 300. I have the numbers here, I could get it to you later. So those are in, re the ones that are in renewal cycle, they come directly to our staff, they have now sent them in, we haven't reviewed them yet, but generally speaking, those, those uh, grants are renewed. I mean, those are three-year grants, they have to simply say, uh, make a report and say we did what we did. If they have defaulted or gone out of business or something, then they aren't going to get the money, but aside from that, they get the money. Do you know how so many almost of them all of were, them. were new applicants in 19? Um, I don't have that number. I do know that the number of applications this year is very consistent with what it's been last year. I'm not exactly sure how many are new applicants this year. Commissioner, what was the total reduction in funding for the SIGs as a result of the PEG, and what formula was used to calculate the reduction for each one? Okay, hold on just a sec. Um, I do have this. Um, I mean, I can tell. I can tell you the formula. I don't have the exact. I think I have the exact number in here. If anybody has that, and you can tell me what it is. <laughs> One million dollars, okay. So the formula, thank you, Philippa. Uh, the formula that was used, I believe, was a 0.9% reduction for the smaller CIGs and a 1.8% reduction for the larger CIGs. So again, the larger CIGs, which again, we feel uh, have more capacity to absorb. So the smaller groups got a uh, nine-tenths of 1% cut whereas the bigger groups got 1.8% cut. Again, that was something I mentioned before, was negotiated with uh, OMB, you know, discussed, and that was our recommendation, that was what was uh, enacted. 
In all budget response, the council urged the administration to baseline the one-time funding of $13.7 million in fiscal 2020's executive budget and additionally called on the administration to increase the budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs by $10 million. Uh, what programs will be affected if the $13.7 million one-shot funding is not included in fiscal 2020? So the, the $20 million was added at adoption. $5 million of it was baseline and the other $15 million was not. That $20 million was uh, divided essentially into three different parts. One part was uh, across the board increases for uh, the CIG with smaller organizations getting larger bumps than the, that was $6.5 million. Uh, about the same amount of money went to uh, increases for the CDF, again, targeting uh, organiza smaller organizations, organizations in low-income communities and serving low-income communities. And the other 6.5 went to essentially cultural plan initiatives. This is all great stuff, including the additional money for individual artists through the arts councils in each borough. It included Disability Forward Fund. Uh, it included the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact, those, those uh, cultural plan initiatives. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me ask a few questions now about the Cultural Institutions Retirement System. Um, I've been um, unable to get some solid answers uh, uh, regarding the Cultural Institutions Retirement System. You know, as you know, the city's early learn initiative causes a significant drop in the number of daycare employers, and thus the employees participating in the multi-employer pension plan. Uh, this caused a large uh, liability to be imposed on the plan known as a withdrawal liability. Mm -hmm. So what is the status of that liability, and is it just an unpaid bill? So I am... I know that there was a meeting yesterday, I believe. I, don't, I haven't talked to people who have been in that meeting, but there was a meeting between OMB and some representatives from the CIG. And I'm not a, an expert in ERISA and you know, employment law when it comes to pensions. So that's something that's being handled by OMB and the law department. But I am aware that there was a meeting yesterday, a uh, face-to-face meeting here at City Hall uh, about that. Do you know if that liability will grow if it's not paid soon? Again, I actually don't know that. I do understand what a liability, with a uh, withdrawal liability is. I actually don't know how it's calculated exactly or whether there is a precise calculation of what the entire liability is. But again, that's something being handled by OMB and the law department. Okay, so I think the council OR. feels strongly that this is something that um, the um, members should not have to take on, that the city should really take that on the cost of that. Uh -huh. No, I understand that that's a okay. position. Um, just some general budget questions. The department's fiscal 2020 executive budget provides funding for 55 full-time positions across all divisions, which is five positions less than the headcount at the fiscal 2019 adopted budget, and three less than fiscal 2010, uh, 2020 preliminary budget. Um, which positions were eliminated? So there are... Um, a series of positions across the agency. We have been, you know, working to figure out how to absorb the work flow of those uh, employees. But there's, so I mean, I can give you a list exactly. There's some project managers that that have been um, eliminated in the the hiring freeze. Um, you know, we have a you know incredibly hardworking staff that that. Uh, moves these, uh, the money through our agency in the incredibly efficient way that I mentioned before. So this is not an agency with a huge amount of, uh, of additional uh, capacity to be shed, I'd say. But we've been working with OMB. It's been very, it's not that they said, you're taking this, this, and this position. It's sort of a collaborative thing. And there's this possibility you know, within the hiring freeze of uh, making an appeal from time to time to restore positions. The, the department added about uh, $444,000 in fiscal 2019 through an MOU with DCAS for Energy Conservation Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, which cultural organizations are receiving the funding, and what is the anticipated impact on energy efficiency? Um, is this ACE? Is that what we're talking about? Excel, okay. So we have, I'm um, sorry, there's two programs. ACE, I guess, is capital, and Excel is expense. In any case, there's... Um, I actually don't have with me that list, but here's, so what we do, it's a, it's a grant program. We have a new 
uh, energy uh, sustainability manager in our staff. This is part of the cultural plan. This is the first scientist we have in our agency as a master's degree in solid state physics, for which he went to Iceland to get because they're so far every, ahead of everybody. That person has been working extensively with our groups and has now, I think, um, in a way solidified that application process. The way that it's generally calculated is that we're looking for projects that are gonna pay for themselves over a 10 year period. So again, we could report back to you, have those um, awards been made already this year or they're in the process, the application is in the process? For, okay, they've been awarded. So we can get you a list of exactly who's gotten it. But I will say that that's something that we're very proud of the progress we've been making on that so that having a sustainability director at the agency, we spend a lot of our agency budget on energy. So it's a huge amount of the CIG budget and it's, it's this new energy coalition, so we've been working carefully with them and also through this process um, to award those grants. Okay, thank you. Is the agency still implementing the Arts and Residence Program? Yes. And uh, which are the participating agencies? So that was in my testimony. Where is my testimony? Oh, okay. Uh, no, hold on, I get it. So there are four agencies. Uh, the way that it's working, and, and we've been sort of really living and learning uh, with mm -hmm. this. It's been a, a very successful program. The agencies are Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of the Aging, Department of Records and Information Services, and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. So what we're doing, it's a partnership with the agencies. The, ag the artists come on board after a, a process, uh, an application process in the fall. They come on board in the spring. They do their planning, and then they work for the second uh, year uh, with funds from the agency. Uh, so these artists are all in. They're doing their planning and they'll start executing their projects in the new fiscal year with the agency. Okay, thank you. How much of the budget is for, uh, for the annual design week? Can you describe the agency's role in design week and how it collaborates with other agencies? Um, so that is a contractual arrangement. I'm gonna have to get back to you about all the details on design week. It's been, you know, it's been an ongoing thing. The money comes through our budget. It is a, a successful program. What's that? I'm sorry. It is no longer in our budget. Thank you. Okay, I'm scared. This is why you have experts on your staff who come with you. I'm under, uh, I would like to say that that was wrong, that the, that project has now been, this year, moved over to EDC. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. All right, and this will be my last uh, questions, and then we'll give it over to Chair Van Bremer. The baseline funding of $5 million for Create New York City Cultural Plan initiatives has not yet been allocated. When and how does the agency plan to do so? Okay, so first of all, I just want to say clearly that that money was spent this year. To say it's unallocated in the coming budget does not mean we did not spend the money, okay? So we are, this is something that will be uh, uh, part of adoption to work towards allocating that money, uh, and that money is, uh, it's, again, remains unallocated at this time, but by adoption we intend to allocate it. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Van Bremer. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. Uh, so, Commissioner, I, uh, we've known each other a long time. You know I have respect for you, but I have to say I'm disappointed your, your testimony did not in any meaningful way address the situation that we're faced with. Um, and your agency and this community are staring down potentially enormous, enormous reductions in funding. Uh, because the mayor is proposing uh, and doubling down on the peg, while at the same time there is no guarantee that this administration uh, in any way, shape, or form wants to fight for and wants to restore uh, uh, millions of dollars on top of the peg. So I'm shocked that there isn't a sense of alarm, there isn't a sense of urgency, um, and you know, where is the passion to fight for this? Um, so I just have to say to you, do you support cutting funding to your department? So, you know, I believe that a robust cultural budget is extremely good for New York City. I believe that the money that we spent this year was well spent. 
uh, and I, you know, we're very similar in a very similar state right now. We're one million dollars different out of a hundred forty-five million dollar budget. I have a lot of respect for you. You're better than that. I know that there are people in InterGov and others who work with you on this testimony. We're not where we were last year, right? The, the numbers tell a different story given the peg, and given that we're looking at a peg this year that the administration seems very, very convinced that it wants uh, to really see happen, then how are we ever gonna expect the funding that was added last year at adoption and not baselined to suddenly be there again? And so, to me, it's, 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 it's like smoke and mirrors a little bit, that number, because we're in a far dire, far more dire situation this year than we were last year, no question. And, and so I'm, I'm really concerned, uh, and I think you should be concerned as well, because your, um, uh, your boss and the mayor seems hell-bent on on cutting culturals this year. And I, I just want to know that you're uncomfortable with that, that idea and that mm. outcome. So uh, let me just say in terms of where we are in relationship to last year, again. And so look, there was $20 million added adoption. Five million of that was baseline. Add adoption, right? So then there's a $6 million cut, or peg, right? So that means because the $5 million was uh, was baselined that the peg, you know, it's baseline. The baseline went up by five, and the peg brings us down a million below that. I'm, so whether you, so, I'm just saying in terms of I believe that the numbers that I reported on in the testimony are accurate. That we're a million dollars lower than we were. Whether we're in a more dire situation is your other part of the question. And do I support? Look, I support a robust cultural budget for the city. I so I worked in this sector in my entire adult life before I got to the agency. And I understand that this is a, you know, a fantastic part of this city and that, that all the cultural funding that we do is important. We're also facing a financial reality where the mayor is, in, to balance the budget, looking for $750 million of reductions. So, I mean, I, I can go I, over I, and over again that. I, I, would, I would say to you that we can balance the budget without cutting the budget for nonprofit cultural organizations and institutions in this city. In fact, we'd have an even better, more robust budget in the city of New York if we increased funding for our cultural organizations and cultural institutions. And, and so what I want to see from you uh, is is some sense, because here, the council fights, right? And we're gonna fight, because we always fight. I'm the chair of the committee, uh, the majority leader loves the arts, council member Jum uh, loves the arts, he's a gay man, what gay man doesn't love the arts? <laughs> and, but, but, are, but are you guys gonna fight for the arts, right? And where is your fight for the arts? And I know you care about the, I, I know you care about culture and the arts, mm -hmm. I know you do, yep. but, but it's wrong that we're in this place, right? It is wrong that we are coming from a place where we have to catch up, and it's meant, trust me, I've been doing this a, a long time. This is intentional. This is absolutely intentional to keep us behind. It is absolutely intentional to keep us from achieving what we really need to achieve, mm -hmm. because we fight like hell to get a restoration, and then they're like, well, you know, you're not gonna get anything on top of the restoration, right? So we're, we're, we're just never getting to the right place. So let me ask you this in another way. Do you believe that a progressive city values culture and the arts? Yes. Do you believe that a fair city supports culture and the arts? Absolutely. And artists are the backbone <clears throat> of a city that is progressive and hopeful and inspirational. I agree. So then why would we cut the budget for culture and the arts and artists? 
So, I mean, look, I mean, I can go over and over. Let me just actually say one other thing, because I want to just refer back to one of your pieces of test when you were um, speaking earlier. Uh, and I think this is something that people well know. And by the way, I also just want to say, I was very heartened. Uh, my staff sent me some pictures of the rally, and I think that's great. I love to see that many people on the steps of City Hall advocating for the arts budget. That's beautiful. I saw it looked like a couple hundred, or 100, 200 people. That was beautiful. So. Um, I also just want to say, because you mentioned how important it is, arts and cultural education in the public school system. And I think without doubt, you know, there's 444 more full-time certified arts teachers in the public school system than there were when this mayor took over. That's been a partnership with the city council, which has been a huge priority for you all. It's been a uh, partnership that has been, I mean, it's important to the city uh, uh, government, so adding a hundred extra art teachers practically per year has been extremely important. Um, so I do feel that you know it is uh, the fact, and and you know because you fought for it as long with city council as long with the administration, et cetera, came to a budget that's the best budget we've ever had this year. In the last three years, we've added money each year at adoption. Uh, we're in that process right now. And don't you want an even better budget next year? So, you know, in isolation, of course, you know, the, the idea is, you know, as much money that I think we could spend a lot more money on culture and, and it be beneficial. We're in a tight budget situation right now, citywide. One commissioner after the next is coming up here and have probably, I haven't been at the hearings, having very similar discussions because of the tightness of the budget. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned before that there's a debate as to whether or not cuts to culture and the arts should even be considered. I agree with you. I come down on the side of that debate that they should not be considered. Do you support that position? Where are you on this <laughs> debate about whether or not we should be considering as a city cutting funding to cultural organizations and institutions, including the smallest of the small uh, that desperately need this funding? So, I mean, I can answer that question in many different ways, but again, I'm here to present this budget, which does right now include, uh, we are $1 million shy of where we were last year at this time. Uh, so I support a robust cultural budget for the city. Uh, between this hearing and the end of the day last year, we got to a higher budget, which was something that the administration and, and myself supported. I also you know, understand that your uh, advocacy and the advocacy of the groups uh, that we have here today is, is an important part of the process. Um, I will just say um, it's important for the cultural community to feel supported. And, and to feel like uh, both sides of this are fighting for this community. Um, and I think if there's a belief that, that the mayor doesn't prioritize this community, um, then, then where is that fight coming from within the administration? Um, who is our champion in the administration? Folks out there know who the champions are uh, in city government, on the city council side, um, and 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 I think that if we're going to get to a good result at the end of this budget cycle, um, you know, you're certainly going to need to be uh, very aggressive on the inside to make sure that uh, the folks who you uh, report to and work with understand this is a priority. Do you have a sense from those people that they're listening to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I, I do think that there's a lot of support for arts and culture all throughout the administration. I really do believe that. And Is that reflected in this agencies. budget? The, this budget you know, has been a tough budget for a lot of different agencies. And this is what- I know, you but know, you're only the commissioner of one. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> I'm just saying, one. so no, but I do think that the, the love and appreciation of what happens in our arts and cultural institutions is something that is felt throughout the, the administration. 
And it's felt you know, across different agencies, and lots of different agencies are, are uh, investing in arts and culture, and we've had really wonderful partnerships. So I, I do feel that, and uh, again, this is where it has landed, uh, and that's what I'm reporting to you. So I, I, I'm going to wrap up. I'm just going to say the mayor, uh, as he goes around the country, I hope he talks to lots of artists. I hope it goes to lots of cultural organizations and institutions uh, from Iowa to New Hampshire to South Carolina and knows that uh, people in this country care about the arts, care about culture, um, and if you cut funding to the arts and culture, uh, people are going to uh, know that and, and they're going to measure their presidential candidates on that. But more importantly, people in the city of New York care about culture and the arts and and are watching too and obviously I'm gonna fight like heck because that's what I always do and that's my job um, and and we at the council obviously care a great deal about this but but the the mayor's budget is a disgraceful when it comes to uh, culture and the arts and it is unforgivable in this the richest city in the world to be proposing this okay thank you Cal uh, chair van Bremer. Um, I'm, we have um, Councilmember Jonah is here and Majority Leader Clumbo. Uh, I have to be very strict about limiting them to three minutes each, uh, but we'll start with Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, I, I do want to compliment uh, my colleague, Van Bramer, on those hard questions that were just asked, but I'm going to compliment you as well, Commissioner, on your skilled, reserved responses if we recognize the importance of arts and what makes New York City such a vibrant, such a colorful attraction to the world, you shouldn't be so reserved. We understand the importance and every dollar that we invest in the arts and our cultural institutions, we yield a great return, which leads me into my question. Has the DCA designed any program specifically targeting tourism industry? So um, first of all, just let me say that, that I am not reserved in my championing of arts and culture. I absolutely believe in its value. I, we've done more research in relationship to the value of arts and culture, I think, than any administration has done in the past with so the social impact of the arts. Uh, initiative, which was privately funded, many hundreds of thousands of dollars went into millions of data points coming back. So I am 100% with you on that, uh, Councilman. Um, but Commissioner, the, uh, my colleague was leading you to water. You refused to drink. But and I'm not looking yeah, yeah, I, to <laughs> have you throw the administration under the bus. That's our right. job. But give us a little <laughs> help here. All right, but hold on. So uh, look. In relationship to fighting for arts and culture and saying it's valuable, absolutely, that is something that I do on, on all the time, not just in, within the administration, but outside as well. What he was uh, questioning me also was about, specifically about this budget, but let me just ask in terms of the tourism. Look, I'm on the board of NYC and Company. <clears throat> we collaborate with them a lot. The tourism dollars that have gone into that have been uh, exemplary, I think, with un in this administration. So the straight up tourism side of this has been uh, uh, NYC and company. So it's not something that we do stuff that's extremely good for tourism all the time. Um, you know, I think that some of the shows that have been, uh, if you looked at the um, Frida Kahlo show at the Brooklyn Museum or some of the shows at the, uh, the rock and roll show at the Met right now, these are big tourist attraction shows. These are in organizations where we're the, their biggest uh, uh, long-term right. funders. So you're providing a product for them to market, correct? Exactly. That's and correct. in marketing, marketing it. We're what you're product. providing makes for a tourist attraction and yes. makes for correct. a well-debated argument, substantiated, to fund the arts, to continue to flourish so we can continue to have more tourism. Yes. Do you, can the cultural community additional funding help in you providing the marketing material that's needed so that we can continue to flourish? Again, I think what you said before, uh, Councilman, was, was the thing, like the product is the thing 
So having a great product for NYC and company to promote around the world is something that happens when there's a robust cultural uh, budget within New York City. So my last question is then, does the DCLA measure the impact of tourism on the city's cultural institutions? So that, that kind of measurement has been done repeatedly, but not by our agency. So there have been reports about the, the economic impact through tourism. So if you look at the statistics you get from NYC and company, more than half the tourists who come to New York City every year uh, signal arts and culture as being their number one or number two Could reason. Could you imagine so, that? that not, they're not here for the brick and mortar on the asphalt. That's right. Commissioner, so, yeah. ask for more. Help us so we can help you. And again, I understand, uh, but this is the one area that we shouldn't be cutting. This yields a great return on every investment that we make. Every dollar that goes in actually yields a great return. It makes for a richer, more vibrant city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me say we've been joined by Councilmember Joe Borelli, Councilmember Adonis Rodriguez, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and um, we have also been joined by students from IS-187, the student government, and they ah. come from Councilmember Rodriguez's um, district. So hello to all of you up there. <laughs> all right, uh, now we have questions from uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you. My colleagues have pretty much summed up many of the questions um, that I had, but I wanted to focus in on, as you know, and it's coming, I uh, wanted to focus on, is there a calculation that is made when these types of cuts are made to the Department of Cultural Affairs in terms of how it will impact the economy of New York City? Because we know that the arts are a vital part um, of the city's growth. Do we understand how these cuts are going to impact employment, jobs, tourism? Are people going to be required to do more with less? And in what ways? So the answer is that we haven't done specific research that says this exact amount of cultural funding produces this exact number of tourists. And we that needs know, to be done. Well, I mean, so the, 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 the research that we did do was something else, which is uh, the social impact of the arts said that there are other things that happen, which is that arts and culture are good for communities outside of tourism. They're good for communities, and this is sort of, this is more relevant to, let's say, organizations in underserved communities, that arts and culture are very good for health, education, and safety outcomes. We know that to be the case. But, so that is, so we, we have done a lot of research. Um, we haven't done the one-to-one -one correspondence between the city's cultural budget and tourism and those funds. So I'm just saying that the, that kind of argument has been made over and over and again. I think it has been very important to make the other argument which is a better argument for lower, for smaller organizations in communities throughout the city. I think that, well I know that what we really should be focusing on is really having an understanding really defined of the impact of those cultural dollars on our community. Tourism wise, educational wise, public safety wise, these are all issues that the arts have an impact on. And the challenge with being an artist or being a creative is that you have to be that. Mm -hmm. The people that are that are wired to be that. Yep, I understand. They will do it or die essentially. I know so many people who cannot afford to pay their bills, live in their homes, eat their food, send their children to top schools and daycares and all of these different things, and their families essentially fall apart because these individuals are often so wired to do their God-given talent. And if they're not supported, if they're not given the resources, families, essentially fall apart. So this is really a very serious issue in terms of this particular sector. They were made and created and, and designed by the universe, by God, whom, however you call it. And this is a challenge when they can't pay their basic food, essentials, et cetera. Yep. So it's essential that we do this type of research to find out the impact that they have on all of these different areas, and we keep saying it, but yet the administration is making arbitrary cuts to something that they have no idea of the impact that it has. 
So I, I want to fast forward in the interest of time. You know um, that a couple of hundred people um, have come out to support Weeksville Heritage Society. Now this is a 50 plus year old organization, as you know, <clears throat> um, is on city owned property, brand new, multi-million dollar state of the art facility, and that our budget has grown by over 20 billion dollars over the last six years. I can't understand how an institution like Weeksville would be at a place where now we're saying um, we have to save Weeksville because it's about to close. Weeksville is not opened on the weekends, so a major cultural institution is not open on the weekends. They don't have late nights. They have limited staff. They don't even have a development director to be in a position to help them at this time. So I'm just saying, on behalf of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, myself, it will be unacceptable if Weeksville is not approved as a SIG um, this year. We've had letters of support from the Brooklyn Children's Museum, BAM, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, even organizations that are feeling the squeeze of these budget cuts have said Weeksville now has to be a part of this. Yeah. So if I could answer, uh, I'm going to go back. I will get to Weeksville in one second. I 100% agree with you about artists have to be artists. And that, by the way, that's why I'm a commissioner of cultural affairs and not an artist. I have an MFA. I didn't have to be an artist, and that's actually why. So I 100% agree with you on that. Weeksville, we, through our agency this year, Weeksville received $456,000 of support. They are in a city-owned uh, facility. that They don't pay rent. We pay their energy. Um, so we are 100% supportive of this organization. I have been talking to Rob Fields on a practically daily basis, the director of the organization. And, you know, I. Uh, we're absolutely, uh, you know, working towards stability for Weeksville. I think that's all I can say at this very moment, but I'm very aware of what's going on there. I have to say that the, the way that, that 4,000 people came forward with an average $63 donation for $256,000 or whatever, I mean, whatever. $250,000 in a week's time yeah, is fantastic. impressive, which Beautiful. means that the community yep. and people care about this institution greatly. I agree. Yes. Here's, here's the Madam issue. Madam Majority Leader, we I have to move along. Okay. Here's the issue. The community in which Weeksville is situated in is systemically been under-resourced all across the board, education-wise, cultural-wise, safety-wise. This has been a, a, a community that has been under-invested. We talk every year about the SIG process, and next year will be the year that we get to it, but now we're and going into our sixth budget, the issue with Weeksville has not been uh, uh, situated. We have to look at how these community-based cultural institutions are faring in this process. We have to open up the CIG process. In this process, we have to get Weeksville into this process because the SIGs that came forward in Brooklyn are not people of color led, they're not board majority-wise people of color. So you're asking an organization like Weeksville in a community that is economically challenged to do more with less and to put them through some rigorous process of how they're going to sustain themselves, are they eligible for the funding, are they going to still be sustainable after the funding is not fair when our other institutions have access to big donors, big pockets, deep pockets, all of these different aspects that they do have access to. Weeksville doesn't have any of that, and they're not a SIG, and they're an economically depressed community. So to look at them to say, let's consider it, and should we consider it, to me, it's a no-brainer. Weeksville now, Weeksville's ready, it has to be in the budget, and that's something that's important to me in this budget process. Okay, thank so you. Hear you. Yes. All right, we're going to move on to our last question from Councilmember Borelli. Hey, Commissioner, how are you? Greetings. C can you explain the diversity bonus policy? So, I'm not sure what you mean by bonus, but I can just I well, can that, right, explain to you the diversity, equity, inclusion thank plans. You. Yes, absolutely. So, what we have. Uh, said is that the members of the cultural institution group, which, as you know, uh, is a large percentage of the cultural budget of New York City, 
Uh, we've been working with them for each of those organizations to develop diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. Uh, they have all sent those plans into us. They're under review by our staff. It's been a very collaborative process. We've worked with the groups to push back the deadline a couple of times to allow them to um, uh, work through this. Uh, it's been, again, uh, something I know that the groups in Staten Island collaboratively hired with some funds from the Department of Cultural Affairs, a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, consultant to help them define what they meant by diversity, equity, and inclusion and how they were going to achieve the goals. The other thing that I think is quite important is that it's very different to think about a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan when you are, let's say, Staten Island Children's Museum versus the Wildlife Conservation uh, Society or Carnegie Hall. These are very different kinds of institutions, and we recognize that, and they're going to have very different kinds of diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. Is, is the plan meeting the criteria, or is there a defined criteria? Yeah, so we, we, uh, we worked with them. They, so this was a question. This is one of the questions back to us. You know, how are you going to be judging these groups, essentially? So we set a set of criteria, which is sort of the basic set of ideas, like here's what diversity, uh, any diversity plan should probably include something about hiring, something about retention, something about board development. So there are some basic, and then with, with but we also very much recognize there'd be quite a bit of difference between one group and the next. So we left lots of room for them to come up with their own ideas. And you know, right now in New York City, there's only you know, a very small handful, maybe only one group, that has a diversity, equity, inclusion plan adopted by their board in the cultural community. Universities have these, businesses have these. Uh, so it's really, really interesting to see which kinds of plans you know, bear fruit the most. And again, I hope, uh, and we can ask the uh, members of the Cultural Institution Group here, I hope that everybody agrees it's been a very collaborative process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to stop here. I thank the commissioner for coming in, and we're going to take a five-minute break. After that, we have the Department of Sanitation and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority coming in. Thank you very much.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management, chaired by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. We have been joined by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, Councilmember Margaret Chin, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and others may be joining us shortly. We just heard from the Department of Cultural Affairs, and now we will hear from the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Sanitation, Stephen Costas. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Reynoso. I want to start by applauding the work that the chair has done over the last couple of weeks and the last couple of months, actually, um, and attending all these meetings. Uh, you're, you're, you're a tougher person than I am. Um, I want to get a, good afternoon, everyone. I am Antonio Reynoso, the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. We'll hear a testimony from Disney on its expense budget, capital plan, and general agency operations. The Department of Sanitation's fiscal year 2020 expense budget totals $1.76 billion, which is $16.6 .6 million more than the fiscal year 2019 adopted budget. The SNY's commitment plan for fiscal year 2019 through 2023 totals approximately $2.1 billion, a decrease of $16 million, or 1%, since the preliminary budget. The committee looks forward to discussing uh, such import important issues as why the council savings proposal was included in DSNY's executive plan, but a number of our expense and capital recommendations were not. DSNY's rationale for reducing or cutting vital cleaning programs citywide, and whether DSNY is truly committed to the zero waste, zero, city zero waste by 2030 goal. We're here again from Acting Commissioner Costas. Thank you for being here uh, at the Department of Sanitation. And I again want to thank the chair and uh, uh, turn it back to him. Okay, very good. I'm going to ask counsel to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Okay, you can begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso, Chairman Drum, and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and Finance. I am Acting Commissioner for the Department of Sanitation, Stephen Casas. I'm joined by Larry Cipollina, Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Financial Management, and Gregory Anderson, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs. We appreciate this opportunity to testify on the Department's fiscal year 2020 executive budget. At the Department of Sanitation, our mission is to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean by collecting recycling and disposing of waste, cleaning streets and vacant lots, and clearing snow and ice. The men and women of this department provide critical services to all New Yorkers, services that help make our city a thriving, vibrant place to live. This budget maintains our ability to provide our core services, but as I mentioned at the preliminary budget hearing two months ago, it also reflects the new realities and tough choices that we face together as a city. The department's fiscal year 2020 executive budget includes $1.76 billion in expense funds that will allow us to deliver services across the city. These funds include $771 million for the Bureau of Cleaning and Collection for household refuse recycling and organics collection, litter basket collection, street cleaning, and other core operational functions. 529 million for the solid waste management operations, including waste export contracts, the operation of city-owned transfer stations, and the closure of Fresh Kills Landfill. 132 million for support services, including building maintenance, engineering, and fleet services. 111 million for snow budget to support snow removal, planning, and operations. 55 million for recycling and zero waste programs, including recycling processing costs, education, outreach, and operation of non curbside waste diversion programs. 23 million for enforcement of street cleaning and recycling laws, and 138 million for administration, centralized purchasing information technology, and other programs. The fiscal 2020 executive budget includes some new funding items and readjustments in the expense budget. These include $1.6 million for additional metal, glass, and plastic recycling processing fees, resulting from an increase in the amount of metal, glass, and plastic recyclables collected, and $1.5 million for re-estimated vehicle toll expenses. This budget 
also baselines the hiring of 115 sanitation workers for curbside organics collection program that was reflected in preliminary budget. This funding will allow the department to replace overtime costs with actual headcount to maintain the same level of collection service under the program. The fiscal 2020 executive budget includes several savings items in fiscal year 2019 and 20 as part of the program to eliminate the gap that the mayor announced earlier this year. These include $6.7 million in additional revenue associated with the sale of renewable natural gas and associated environmental credits generated at Fresh Kills Landfill, $1.5 million in additional revenue from alternate side parking enforcement, and $4 million in savings associated with the hiring freeze. In evaluating potential areas for cost savings in this budget, the Department and OMB look to service reductions as a last resort. However, in order to meet our target, certain service reductions were necessary. The executive budget includes $1 million in savings over two years from the elimination of supplemental highway shoulder and ramp cleaning. It also includes $1.9 million in savings in fiscal year 2020 from a reduction in headcount for the department's lock cleaning unit by 37 uniform positions. These staff will be reallocated to fill vacant positions elsewhere within the Bureau of Cleaning and Collection. The department's proposed capital plan for fiscal 2020 to 2029 is 3.2 billion and includes the following. 1.8 billion for capital equipment purchases, including collection trucks, mechanical brooms, salt spreaders, and support equipment. 1.3 billion for garage rehabilitation and new garage construction. 117 million for maintenance and construction of solid waste management facilities and 49 million for information technology and communication systems, including hardware. In the four-year plan, the department is funded to advance several major facility improvement projects, including begin the construction of the new Brooklyn District 3 garage this summer, construct a new Staten Island District 1 and 3 garage beginning in fiscal year 2020, design and construct a new Queens District 1 garage, and entirely reconstruct the Bronx District's 9, 10, and 11 garage complex, and rehabilitate the Queens District's 11 and 13 garage, the Queens District's 8, 10, and 12 garage complex, the Brooklyn District 6 garage, and the Bronx District 6 garage. Snow fighting is a critical function of the department. Our snow budget for fiscal year 2019 was decreased from 97.8 million as of adoption last year to 83.9 million in the executive budget. This decrease reflects a lower total snowfall accumulation this past winter when compared to previous seasons. However, even though the total accumulation of 20.5 inches was less than the annual average, the department issued 13 snow alerts and responded to at least 18 separate winter weather events. In addition, the department prepared numerous times for forecast precipitation that produced less snowfall than predicted or that changed terrain. Our snow budget for fiscal year 2020 is $111.1 million. As we testified last month, the department is very pleased, with the state, pleased that the state has taken legislation action to address single-use carry bags. We thank the council for its swift action to enact a city paper bag reduction fee in addition to the state plastic carry-out bag ban. These policies, both of which will take effect on March 1, 2020, are an important step towards our goal of sending zero waste to the landfills. We encourage all New Yorkers to avoid the, pa the paper bag fee by bringing a reusable bag with them to the store. We look forward to working with the city council members, civic leaders, and community organizations to distribute reusable bags across New York City in advance of these policies taking effect. On Earth Day, Mayor de Blasio released one New York City 2050 and made commitment to create a Green New Deal in New York City. This landmark report sets aggressive climate goals, including a commitment to transition to mandatory organics collection citywide. The department looks forward to working with the City Council to establish the mandatory organics recycling citywide 
starting in low and medium density areas that already have access to organics collection, and then expanding over time to include the entire city so that all New Yorkers can participate. Until then, the department continues to focus on diverting organic material from landfills, where they generate harmful methane gases. The department's curbside organics collection currently serves 3.5 million New Yorkers and 23 districts in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Also, as of today, there are more than 2,000 high-rise apartment buildings with nearly 118,000 households enrolled in curbside organics collection services. The department encourages owners and managers of apartment buildings in the Bronx and Manhattan to enroll with the department so that New Yorkers residing in those buildings may also participate in the organics program. In addition, today, more than 1,000 schools, institutions, and city agency buildings are now receiving organic collection service. The department will also continue supporting food scrap drop-off sites across the city and promote the expansion and growth of new community composting sites across all five boroughs. Today, we support more than 160 drop-off sites citywide, including at green markets, commuter hubs, community gardens, libraries, and other locations. We continue to seek partners to host additional drop-off sites. The department's organics outreach team continues to leverage multiple strategies to engage with New Yorkers about the program. These include staffing informational tables in high traffic locations, giving presentations to community boards, civic associations, and other key stakeholders, conducting door-to-door -door canvassing and participation surveys, and hosting events for street tree care and free compost distribution events to community gardens in, and in parks. To date, in fiscal 19, we had direct interactions with approximately 41,000 residents in areas that receive organics collection service. This spring, we launched a Make Compost Not Trash, a, an intensive outreach effort in two community districts to test the full range of outreach strategies to drive participation in the program. We have been giving away compost, organizing street tree care events, and going door to door to encourage residents to make compost, not trash. The initial response on these efforts has been promising, and local elected officials have been key partners in helping us spread the word. We look forward to working with the council to advance efforts to make the organics collection program successful. Our efforts to reduce organic waste also extend to New York City businesses. Earlier this year, the department began enforcing the second round of commercial organics regulations. Today, large restaurants, food retailers, and certain food chain services establishments are required to separate their organic waste for composting or anaerobic digestion. We are focused on giving businesses the tools they need to reduce food waste and save money. This March, we launched a Donate NYC online food donation tool to connect businesses interested in donating food to local organizations that feed hungry people. This Thursday, May 23rd, the Foundation for New York Strongest will hold its 2019 Food Waste Fair. The fair is an interactive experience connecting food, beverage, and hospitality professionals with the resources and education they need to reach zero food waste in their businesses. The 2019 Food Waste Fair will provide businesses with hands-on workshops, skills, training, and access to resources that only lead to more sustainable operations, but also save businesses money when less food goes into the waste. To learn more about the, food, to learn more about the fair and our exciting Zero Food Waste Challenge, please visit foodwastefair.nyc. We continue to, adv to advance efforts to reform the commercial waste sector, which is estimated to generate 3 million tons of waste per year. Last November, we released our implementation plan for commercial waste zones, a comprehensive reform of the commercial waste industry that will create a safe and efficient collection system for the commercial waste that provides high quality, low cost service while advancing the city's zero waste goals. In February, the department released the draft generic environmental impact statement for the implementation plan. And in March, we held two public hearings to receive comments on this document. 
In the weeks ahead, we look forward to continuing our work with the City Council and stakeholders in the important process to reform and modernize private carding in New York City through the enhancement and enactment of comprehensive legislation. Although the, our city is facing tough choices and tightening budgets during these uncertain fiscal times, I assure you the proposed fiscal year 2020 executive budget preserves the department's ability to meet its core services obligations to the public by keeping communities in New York City clean, safe, and healthy while enabling us to advance our long-term strategic priorities. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to testify today and for your continuing support of our programs and work. My staff and I are not happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Costas. Let me start off by asking a few questions about sanitation trucks. Mack Trucks introduced its Mack LR all-electric refuse truck earlier this month, which it plans to test on the streets of New York City in 2020. This is exciting. And we know that 28% of greenhouse gas emissions citywide are the result of vehicles, second to buildings, which emit 68% of greenhouse gas emissions citywide. So what is your plan to roll out the pilot in terms of areas of the city that would be serviced by the truck and anticipated time frame of the trial? Um, so the department is always looking for uh, ways to reduce our greenhouse uh, gas emissions. All of our heavy duty fleet uh, currently uses biodiesel, and we have been looking uh, at using introducing renewable diesel that would also um, help on the front of greenhouse gases and emissions. Um, we do plan on testing the Mack truck when it gets here. Um, the one challenge with that truck right now is that uh, it does not have a plow jack assembly, so the truck will only be tested on collection purposes. Um, so right now, we don't have uh, a truck that would be able to replace um, the existing fleet in its current configuration. Um, we currently have over 4,500 heavy-duty vehicles, and we use approximately 10 million gallons of diesel a year. So every gallon of diesel burn produces uh, about 22 pounds of carbon dioxide. So using those numbers, we know that uh, we're going to see how much exactly uh, using the electric truck will be able to offset that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, vacant lot cleaning. DSNY cleans city-owned vacant lots, removing garbage, bulk refuse, and woods, and weeds, excuse me. The department also addresses privately owned fenced and locked lots that are dirty. On average, DSNY cleans approximately 3,000 lots per fiscal year. The executive plan includes a savings proposal that would reduce DSNY's headcount for vacant lot cleaning citywide. I am never pleased to hear about a service reduction, especially one that addresses quality of life issues in, in, in our neighborhoods. Um, how was it determined uh, that it would be okay uh, to use this as a way to save um, money to cut this critical service? Um, so ultimately, uh, the lot cleaning um, reduction in headcount, uh, there will be a, an impact in terms of the amount of lots we're able to clean within a year. Um, what will happen is uh, the current cycle, which takes on average two to three weeks for a city-owned lot to get cleaned, will probably be extended uh, by another 10 days to two weeks to actually be able to get to. Um, but it was unfortunate in terms of, again, some of the choice, tough choices that had to be made in terms of um, where we could make a cut and still be able to achieve the goal. Uh, how do you get access to um, privately owned lots? Um, so when we receive a complaint about a particular lot, uh, we send inspectors out. In some cases, those lots are wide open. Uh, we do uh, a block and lot search on the property to see if it's privately owned or a city owned lot and uh, we take it from there. If it's a privately owned lot that is secured, uh, we do still do a visual inspection and uh, we generate a report. And if the report, in fact, requires us to uh, take action, we then have to get a work order through the health department to be able to access the property. And that involves then the other agency. In terms of the city owned lots, then we do gain access to the lots and we clean them. Okay, that, that's very interesting. I had one time had a graveyard, an old graveyard that needed cleaning, but um, I didn't know the procedure, so thank you for that. Um, I know you mentioned in your testimony a lot about organics collection. 
So one third of what New Yorkers throw away is yard waste and food scraps, also known as organics. Most of this material ends up in landfills as opposed to beneficial re reuse programs. On the campaign trail in Iowa, the mayor said that he would ask the council for legislation to make organics waste collections mandatory. However, just this past fiscal year, program expansion was halted due to DSNY not capturing as much material as was anticipated from collections. DSNY is currently servicing less than half of New Yorkers via the existing program and no additional funding was included in the 2020 plan for citywide expansion. So what is the path forward here and does the administration have an expansion plan? So uh, the department is fully committed to achieving the zero waste by uh, 20 a goal. Um, part of that is going to go through, come through legislation. Uh, we look forward to working with the council members uh, in the coming months to discuss a path on creating a mandatory path. Uh, once we have a mandatory path, obviously, we believe that that will increase participation uh, within the 23 existing districts as well as then give us a path to continue rolling it out citywide. Do you know when we uh, could expect to see uh, funding for the citywide expansion? Uh, not at this time, no. I'm sorry? No. no not yet. Um, some of the existing routes were funded in part by overtime because they were longer than originally anticipated. How do we ensure a more efficient route structure to reduce overtime usage? So the 115 uh, bodies that were included in the budget uh, basically eliminate that uh, challenge that we had with regards to the overtime. Um, we continue to look at the 23 existing districts and the route development that brought us to that point, and that's the same methodology that we'll be using going forward. So the headcount uh, increase will offset the overtime that was being generated on that. Okay, thank you. Um, food donation portal. In 2017, the council enacted local law 176, which required the Department of Sanitation to develop a food portal that facilitates efficient hyper-local food donations to reduce food waste and provide meals. Food donors can post listings of available food uh, and an algorithm then rapidly notifies the best matched and nearest registered CBO that food is available. Your portal launched just a few weeks ago. Can you provide the committee with an update on the number of organizations that have signed up uh, thus far? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, uh, the portal just went live just over a month ago, uh, but we've seen some promising uh, interest in it. Uh, so far we have uh, approximately 125 organizations that are registered, and we've been uh, trying to create those relationships. So we have about 41 primary donors and 84 uh, primary recipients who are trying to meet up and, and see if what the donors are offering the recipients are interested in. Um, additionally, we've successfully completed eight donations slash re you know, recipients, and uh, we have some more scheduled, hopefully that will happen in the near future. So do you have any predictions on the amount of material and tonnage this portal will help divert from the landfills? Uh, I do not at this time. It's okay. still very new. Sounds like a very interesting program, though. Yes. Did I see something on New York One News on it? Uh, yes, there was. Yes, Yes, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. I want to turn it over to uh, Chair Reynoso now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, zero Waste Outreach. Of course, I'm, I'm concerned that zero waste by 2030 um, is not something that we would end up accomplishing considering the progress we've made so far in the last uh, five, six years. Um, but I think the way we can turn that around is by educating the public on how to recycle. Uh, and I feel like our budget for marketing is extremely low. I've been asking for three years now that we get an increase. This year I've asked for a $2.5 million increase in the marketing budget. I think it'll save us money long term by diverting uh, trash to, um, from landfill. Uh, so I just want to know why it is that uh, DSNY just can't seem to get an increase in their marketing budget to, to educate uh, New Yorkers about recycling. So I think our BRS group continues to be as creative as possible in terms of um, leveraging uh, all the opportunities they have uh, with this particular program as uh, it seems to be gaining traction in terms of um, the messaging across the board. So along with 
the discussion on organics, that also is about a changing a mindset in terms of people's perception, a behavioral change where we now, we start to see people are using Donate NYC. We see people going to Reuse NYC where um, it's a different culture in the city where people don't want to waste. So we hope that uh, that continues to spread across all channels. Um, again, going door to door has been uh, eye-opening in terms of the information and feedback that we're receiving within the 23 districts. Um, sometimes leaving a, a postcard on the door to say, thank you for participating, or leaving a note that says, how come you're not using your brown pail? So we continue to engage the public. Uh, the intense uh, outreach that we've been doing in Make Compost Not Trash, both in uh, Queens and in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, is giving us additional tools and information for us to continue uh, how we go forward in terms of uh, trying to meet the public and get them engaged. So, it, and I hear you. I don't think there is a, a cultural change happening. Um, I'm the chair of sanitation in the city council, probably one of the more informed people related to trash. And I'm still doing, I still find something new related to how to recycle every single day. Uh, whether it's uh, not putting contaminated, uh, you know, cardboard or, or, or paper inside the cardboard or paper bin. Uh, uh, the fact that I got four, four cans now, uh, I'm happy to have four cans, but I don't think many people do have four different locations to, to throw their metal, glass, plastic, paper, general refuse, and organics. Um, so I'm just concerned about the education component. I don't think it's there. It's not strong enough. Um, Vision Zero has done a great job with its education. Everyone knows about Vision Zero. They see the commercials uh, that come up on TV, uh, and I think it's been one of the more uh, successful marketing campaigns by the city of New York. I'm just upset that we can't have something uh, close to um, Vision Zero for zero waste. And again, I just think that this seems to be like a, um, a goal that was said, uh, and you know, we talk the talk, but we don't seem to be able to walk the walk in trying to get a zero waste by 2030. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the single stream study. Uh, it's something that you put together. Just want to know, uh, we spent $717,000 on it for fiscal year 2020 on a single stream study that was completed the current fiscal year. Um, when are we going to get that study and have that information? So we completed that study over over the last year and a half or so. Um, and basically what it was is a, an engineering study looking at exactly what would be necessary from the city's perspective in terms of capital investment to move from what we have today, which is two different bins, the blue bin and green bin, to one bin for all of your recyclables. And we discovered, which we're not surprised by, that it would be a relatively significant capital investment um, that we would need. We'd need a bigger facility in uh, Brooklyn at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal where Sims has their uh, materials recovery facility today. Um, and so the real focus of that study was understanding what kind of investment would be needed, what kind of equipment uh, is out there to process single stream recycling, because it's slightly different uh, sorting equipment mm -hmm. than what we have today. Um, so we'd be happy to, to share the, the results of that study with you, to sit down with you and, and discuss it in more detail. I think the challenge that we face with single stream recycling, because um, as I know of you, as you have said before, uh, Chair Reynoso, um, you know, it, it does offer the ability to go from those four bins in your kitchen down to three. back down to three, yes. uh, which could make the program more convenient. The challenge that we face is uh, last year at the beginning of 2018, China implemented the National Sword, which basically closed their markets to mixed paper and mixed yeah. plastics from uh, the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, which had a really traumatic effect on the recycling markets. So we are actually better positioned uh, in New York City today because we have those two separate bins. We can keep the material separate. We can keep it cleaner. Uh, we can make those processing costs lower. Uh, so I think for the, for the time being, we're sort of putting the single stream recycling on hold until the markets recover and can sort of stabilize. But we'd be, be happy to have those conversations with you okay, going forward. So there, in the study, there wasn't a, a, a look into uh, the potential increase in diversion because of a single stream? We've, we've looked into that as well um, and looked at other cities, uh, Boston, uh, Denver, lots of other cities over the last two decades that have gone to single stream recycling and, and can share that with you as well. Okay, I'll ask a couple more questions just to give my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions, give them a courtesy. Just the highway shoulder and ramp cleaning seems to be cut 
from the, the budget, I get extremely concerned where uh, we make cuts to, to quality of life related issues. Um, are we saying that on and off ramps we'll be seeing the, the mattresses and the, the, cup, the coffee cups and the cans, that those won't be something that you will take care of? I want to know um, what the alternative is and who will take care of that or whether we just are going to relegate the city to looking dirty. Um, and that's just kind of how we're living because we need to cut $864,000 from the budget. So uh, Department of Traffic is ultimately responsible for highway sweeping. Um, the Department of Sanitation back in 2016 uh, as a supplemental assist to Department of Traffic started doing um, some highway ramps specifically, not shoulders for the full length of the highway, just the ramps on an uh, entrance and exit ramps. Um, so we were basically running it on an overtime program um, and we were doing street dirt basically on the ramps. We were not picking up uh, large pieces of debris in most cases. In the event that there is an accident or something specific when there is a large piece of debris, um, it, we still on call that occasion and we do go out and service it. So ultimately the highway sweeping portion uh, responsibility that we were doing on Saturdays has been eliminated, but uh, we did notify DOT that we were stopping the portion of exit and entrance ramps that we were doing. Ultimately, they are the full time, uh, it does fall under their preview of jurisdiction. It's unfortunate that the Department of Sanitation is cutting things like this to gain $864,000 in the budget. Like uh, when you look at the grand scheme of the budget, the fact that we've seen 500 million extra dollars that you found since April, um, the city found since April, the fact that we, the city, the council uh, presented $600 million worth of the savings to, to the mayor, and also the fact that we've increased the budget overall by almost $2 billion um, because, uh, because of the um, income tax and, and, and so forth, uh, it just doesn't make any sense why we would be tightening uh, how much we're spending on these programs that I think are essential, including $4.2 million for seven-day waste pack basket pickup. Um, we've actually seen an increase in a positive way in the cleanliness of our streets over the last year uh, in the city of New York. I think we went to like a 96 on average or something like that, uh, cl street cleanliness. And I want to say that this, is the 144,000 basket pickups that we've done on a seven-day on a, on a seven service um, it, it, it contributes to that. And now we're not going to do that anymore uh, and probably go back to a lesser rating. Um, I just don't understand where the value or where the city sees the value in cutting that program. So I would like to ask, uh, how are we supposed to deal with the... The, the amount of garbage we see, especially on weekends in our streets, if we don't have this extra basket pickup. Um, so uh, when the 3.5 million uh, was added at adoption for basket service, uh, what the department did was we looked across the city and we were able to add supplemental basket service in uh, about 35 different community boards to help level off uh, and give everyone uh, an, a slight increase in terms of basket service. Uh, with that reduction <coughs> come July, uh, the department hopes that they can continue to um, maintain exactly the service that we provide right now. Um, we're always looking to be as efficient as possible and maximize what we can get um, out of the men and women when they're out there servicing those baskets. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about the quality of life in the city of New York when we can't handle that trash pickup. Uh, we always see the terrible picture of an overflowing trash bin uh, in our communities, and we have very little to answer for it outside of these basket pickups happening you know, fr frequently. So uh, I'm very concerned about that, and I'm asking for you to figure out a way to replace that service or, or find the money. Uh, but I don't think that that's a cut that should happen. My last question before I turn it over is uh, organics. Um, in this testimony, you stated the fact that the communities that currently are voluntarily in the organics pilot um, would be the first communities that would be introduced to the mandatory uh, organics recycling um, should the law pass here in the city council in the city of New York. Um, I have a, a huge concern over equity. Um, we're not going to expand the voluntary organics program citywide, but we're going to force the few people that have taken on the pilot now, the few communities that have taken on the pilot, 
to do it to do mandatory recycling. So depending on where you live, you have to do it. In other places, you don't even need to voluntarily do it. I just don't see equity in that. I would prefer or appreciate that first we do um, voluntary organics recycling citywide and then start the process of expanding the mandatory portion of it um, in the places that we've piloted so far. Uh, so I just want to know uh, where the logic comes from mandating it for some New Yorkers and others don't even need to do it voluntarily. So I think the, the important point of clarification here is the mayor's commitment and, and the commissioner's testimony both mentioned citywide mandatory organics. Uh, so our goal is citywide mandatory organics. That's the place that we'd like to get to. We're open to, to working with the council to determine exactly what that looks like. Um, when we, if you go back to 1989, when we uh, started implementing Local Law 19, which created the citywide mandatory recycling program, that allowed us a, a period of time to phase in recycling, going uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, and actually going you know, from one type of recycling to another. And it, it really took us close to 10 years until we had the same program offered universally uh, on a weekly basis across the city. So I think you know, we, we hear your concern. We definitely think that this program should not be in some places and not others. It's just a question of what's the right way to get there. And what we've seen in terms of participation is there is, uh, as Commissioner Garcia had mentioned previously, there is a, a chicken or egg situation here where we have a program that's voluntary. Some people are very committed to it. Others um, aren't yet participating. And really the way that we can drive that participation is by making it mandatory. And so, you know, we have to, we have to do both. We know that. Uh, we want to work with you to, to understand exactly what the right way to do that is. Yes, I'm, I'm just very concerned for two reasons. I think it's a good talking point um, if somebody's traveling nationally um, saying that we want to do organics, mandatory, mandatory organics in the city of New York, but it's unfunded. And the plan right now, I think, is, is, un, is, is underwhelming. Uh, so, you know, we can say, I can say a lot of great things. If I don't have a plan and I don't have the money behind it, then it's for not. So right now it's just a talking point, and, and it's hard for me to see that the Department of Sanitation or the mayor's office is actually taking this seriously. Um, again, we'd love to see a more robust plan and we'd love to see money in the budget that speaks to the fact that you actually wanna do this. Two things that don't exist. Um, so yes, we can have a conversation because it's something I really want to do the right way, um, but I'm not gonna just talk about it. I'm actually gonna ask for plans and data and information as to how we're gonna get that done. And right now that just doesn't exist. Um, I have a couple of other questions, but I'll do that in the second round to allow for my colleagues to ask questions. Thank you. Okay. We have been joined by Council Members Deutsch, Espinal, and Valone, and uh, we have questions from Council Member Deutsch followed by Chin. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, so there was a pilot program um, on manual street cleaning in uh, Staten Island, I think it was in, in Councilmember Borelli's district and uh, Councilmember Matteo's district, where there were two people from each garage uh, assigned for manual street cleaning. Um, now, the local bids, they don't get any supplemental uh, street cleaning uh, beyond, uh, beyond the regular uh, street sweeping that comes down uh, provided by sanitation. So um, how, how did that pilot program go? and is, will it be expanded? Um, I'm not familiar with the pilot program that you're discussing on Staten Island, to be honest with you. I'd be more than happy to uh, go back and get all the information and then contact you, specific, you know, directly so that we can discuss it further. Okay. Um, and then secondly, um, the, the chair mentioned before about the $4.2 million uh, that was um, uh, regarding um, f picking up all the cl um, corner waste baskets. So I know in the last budget, I, I was um, instrumental in being in BNT, working with the chair to to get that 4.2 million uh, in the budget. And I know in my districts that uh, I had seven days a week, and things went pretty well. So what are we looking forward to now in this new budget, and in particular my district now that? Um, there's going to be cuts in the corner waste baskets. So the department will uh, be discussing with both the community, uh, the council members, as well as the administration, in terms of trying to um, 
have the minimal, mil, minimalist impact on basket service. We know that that is one of the core functions. Uh, the department is, a, that's what we do. We provide service and we want to provide service. Um, again, we were faced with difficult choices in terms of, of having to reach the peg. And when you look across the board at what services would hopefully have the least amount of impact, those were the ones that we went to. And in terms of the uh, basket money, that was uh, put into the budget for one year. So. Yeah, I understand that. So with a $92.5 billion budget, uh, and this was um, last year was a one-time shot of 4.2 million out of 90 this year it's 92.5 billion um, the main complaints we get and I know in my district and several other districts I know last year you, you just mentioned you did 35 community boards so why can't the administration make that commitment to restore uh, the corner wastebasket pickups coming from the administration saying we need to keep our city clean uh, by making sure we get those few millions do a few million dollars in the nine point in the ninety two point five billion billion dollar budget again difficult choices uh, ongoing conversations with OMB in terms of uh, where we can uh, achieve the peg as well as still be able to provide our core services and functions to the city who makes who makes those choices um, from the administration? Like who gives the, inf the information to the commissioner to say, okay, we have to make these cuts? Uh, those are ongoing conversations between OMB and ourselves. So it's it's OMB who makes the ultimate decision. Um, and I can't imagine sanitation is going to say cut my cut out funding because um, um, every agency wants to get the funding that that they need. So I can't imagine sanitation is going to say, oh, you know, we don't need that. Well, again, we looked across the board at all the operations that we run, and we had to come up with what was going to be the least amount of impact. And so but they, uh, is, is anyone here from OMB? No. No. Do we have OMB here? No. No, no one's here from OMB. OK. So um, the corner waste basket, it's a big issue, and we need that. We need that restored, and we have to make sure that all those districts that's needed um, gets the seven days a week. Uh, we're not going to stop. And uh, um, do you have any? Inf if you could get me the information on OMB of who I could contact, who makes this this decision, yeah. you'll get it to me, right? Okay. Absolutely. And finally, um, I have one other question. Um, you have the lot cleaning units, so. Why has all the staff been reassigned from the lot cleaning unit? So lot cleaning, uh, not the entire staff was reassigned. Uh, what's happening is there's been a reduction in 38 individuals, which is 31 sanitation workers and uh, seven supervisors. And they are going to either through attrition or be reassigned back into Bureau of Cleaning and Collection. So the, the overall headcount for lot cleaning is being reduced. It's not being eliminated. So why is it being reduced? For what um, reason? Again, in a, an effort to offset overtime on the Bureau of Cleaning and Collection side as well as be able to achieve um, savings. Uh, we're reducing the headcount in that unit, which will have some unfortunate impact in terms of our ability to uh, clean lots in the time frame that we currently were doing. Um, so how long does it take from when DSNY, when Department of Sanitation inspects a dirty lot to when it gets cleaned? Um, it can take up to approximately 40 days for a city-owned lot. 40 days? And uh, if the funding, if this, if this workforce uh, gets reduced, how long do you anticipate it would take then? Uh, the impact will probably be an additional 10 days. Additional 10 days? Uh, you did mention in your testimony, uh, fiscal year 2020 executive budget uh, preserves the department's ability to meet its cost service obligations to the public by keeping communities across New York City clean, safe, and healthy. So you just mentioned that um, you're going to do, you're going to try doing um, more with less, Correct. and you just um, mentioned that you're eliminating 37 uh, staff and seven employees, and then 
Uh, you're not looking to restore the corner waste baskets. So how is sanitation keeping communities across New York City clean, safe, and healthy with these budget cuts? Budget cuts are unfortunate, um, but there are difficult choices that... So budget cuts are unfortunate, but you, you're taking away services. Council, council member, we're going to have to move on to... I'm sorry? We have to move on to the next uh, council member. Yeah, I just want to just end off with this. this way. Sanitation department provides services. We're a service-oriented agency. Do you agree that um, with this reduction of funding, it could possibly provide less services and um, less cleaner streets? Excuse me? Do you believe that with, this, with, this, with these budget cuts on sanitation, that services will be impacted and uh, there will be corner waste baskets overflowing, uh, lots will take a lot longer to uh, actually get cleaned, if not never? Um, I think we'll have to wait and see exactly what the impact is. Uh, hopefully the uh, service that we're currently providing will be able to keep up with uh, the way to, the, in terms so, of overflowing baskets. So we're hoping so there's no, so we don't know, we can't say now that everything is gonna be good, so we're hoping. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Commissioner. Um, well, the plastic ban is coming, right? It's gonna start next year. Uh, and also the Council, you know, passed imposing a fee on, on paper uh, back. So do you anticipate, uh, in terms of an estimate of reducing uh, the tonnage uh, of plastics and paper that we're gonna be put into the waste stream? And also, do you anticipate savings? Because we've been saying that every year, city spends you know, 10, 12 million dollars just shipping these uh, plastic uh, to the waste stream. And so now that the ban is gonna be in place, do you have any preliminary estimates? So as, as we discussed at the hearing last month, um, what we've seen from other jurisdictions that have put these kinds of policies in place is around a 60 to 75 percent reduction in the number of bags used. So we think that's a, a huge opportunity for New York City. Um, obviously, there are some exemptions to the, the ban. Uh, bags from restaurants, for example, are exempt. Uh, produce bags, bags for, um, from the meat counter. Uh, so there are, there are some things that I think we're, we're still looking at uh, in terms of that. Regarding savings, you know, I, I think that there is a cost to disposing all of these things. Uh, there's also, you know, it, it's sort of baked into our larger uh, export budget. So I don't think that we're anticipating savings. We'll be definitely relieved if we see them uh, actually materialize. Um, but it's, you know, it's one, one part of our uh, export budget that's several hundred million dollars. Well, I hope you do anticipate some saving, and that's what we're looking for. And whatever money that we can save, I hope that it will go into um, education uh, to the public, re producing more reusable bags that we can give out uh, in the community, and really help um, every New Yorker understand the importance of recycling in terms of the education budget. So I, I hope that whatever saving that is from you know, the plastic ban that you would put back uh, into the recycling efforts. Uh, the other question that I have is that, you know, we are trying to implement that rat mitigation zone, and the good thing that we got out of it was the big belly, uh, and that helps a lot uh, in the neighborhood, but we still get, can't get to a point of getting the garbage uh, put out later. Because right now, residents put out garbage very early. Uh, sometime, you know, even like five o'clock, six o'clock, and especially in Lower Manhattan, in my district, people have to walk through garbage, go to the subway station or to go home. Uh, I know that you are looking at some proposal working with DOT uh, to help containerize, uh, but is there a way to uh, find some creative solution, but also to mandate that you can't put out the garbage that early? Um, so we're happy to look at that as uh, an option in the district. Um, there are challenges that come along with that. Um, as you mentioned, uh, as a rat zone, uh, 
we found that the additional service that we were providing at the baskets and with the big bellies uh, were definitely an improvement in terms of the conditions around it. But we also found that um, some of the residential buildings were not taking full advantage of the additional uh, service. So it was an interesting mix. I know we still couldn't get the, the negotiation done, but we'll, we're going to continue to do that. Okay. But overall, all of us need to kind of cut down <laughs> on producing so much waste. So I think the, all the recycling effort is really critical. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to both of the chairs for your de dedication and, uh, and welcome uh, to the panel. Uh, just curious as to a trend that I see happening worldwide. Started uh, the uh, biggest nation to, that I saw who got this trend going was China, where they're no longer accepting uh, waste we're talking about plastics and and uh, and other quote unquote uh, recyclables. And then recently, as I recall, two weeks ago, there was another hundred nations where they signed uh, an agreement. Uh, it does not include the United States, uh, not to upset any uh, waste from other countries. My concern is that, and when I talk to the people who deal with waste in the city, is that where are we gonna put all of this waste since it's not being accepted or being bought by other countries? And are we starting to uh, have some of these things that we recycle in the city, uh, being placed in landfills already. Because that's a message that I keep getting uh, from different vendors. So I think the, the situation uh, varies based on where you are in the country, and there's been a lot reported in the national media about recycling markets. Um, as I mentioned before, that's one of the things we're taking into account when we look at single stream recycling. And you know our, our recycling program is celebrating its 30th birthday this year, uh, which is very exciting for us. Um, we are one of the only cities left in the country that has, or at least major cities, that has dual stream recycling. And that means that our, our recyclables are actually cleaner, they're easier to sell, um, and so we're, we're slightly better off than other places. We've also made significant investments in additional processing uh, equipment. Uh, we generate just a lot of recyclables, 600,000 plus tons a year. So we're, we're better off than other places. We are able to use domestic markets for a lot of our plastics, for example, which uh, some places, especially on the West Coast, are having a lot of pro uh, problems getting rid of their plastics. Uh, so we're, we're weathering the storm better than others. But I definitely think that, and you're seeing this, this conversation happen a lot across the state and across the region, we really need to invest in, in infrastructure and industry here in the United States to be able to recycle the products that we generate. And ultimately, what we need to look at is what Councilmember Chin just mentioned, we just need to have less waste to begin with. So rather than focusing on, on how to recycle the plastics we have, we need to focus also on how can we just use less plastics? How can we ban things like bags? How can we look to reduce the use of single-use plastic products, straws, cutlery, et cetera? I hear you, but that kind of didn't answer my question. We don't send any of our landfill, okay. any of our recyclables to the landfill, I assure you. Do you see a projection in the trend that we're going? Because I know you have contracts right now. When those contracts expire, so they are obligated to absorb it, do you see that we're going to face the same problems that LA and other, biggest, other big cities are facing? Is it inevitable? And I, I just want us to be honest with that question. It's not, it's not a reflection of the sanitation department. It's a reflection of the signs of the time and how we could start working towards that end that you're talking about in, in making investments or incentivize uh, the private sector to do so. I really don't think it's inevitable. I think this is a, a definitely a challenge that the market's facing, definitely mm -hmm. a challenge unlike any that we've seen before in the re recycling industry. 
since uh, recycling came into being in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, I think that the, the real promising uh, element is that you're seeing major corporations, uh, corporations that don't have the best name, Walmart, McDonald's, uh, lots and lots of others that are making commitments to investing in recycling technology, investing in recycl recyclable packaging, uh, investing in, in curbside recycling collection. So I think we're seeing those, those investments counteract some of the uh, international trade policies that we as New York City have no power over. Um, and you know I think there's a lot of talk right now about how recycling is failing. We don't believe that recycling is failing. In New York City, recycling is working just fine. Um, nationally, I think what we need to, to think about is where do we want to be in 10 years? Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the kind of leadership in this country uh, at the national level to think about recycling the way that, that they do in the EU or in uh, Japan, other Asian countries. So I think that you know we do have an obligation as New York City, the largest recycling program in the country, to be that leader. And we're you know always looking for ways to step up and, and work with other cities, corporations, states, um, to fill the gap that the federal government is leaving. And I appreciate that answer, because that's the direction that I think we should all be moving. Uh, and I sure hope that we could come up with some innovative ways to incentivize uh, any effort that goes towards that end. Uh, because otherwise, I think we're going to find ourselves at a point we're going to, everyone is going to do their part at home, but it's going to end up in the same place. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. You guys are doing a fantastic job. And I want to turn it back to my wonderful co-chairs, their uh, leaders uh, in this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Oso. I just have two more questions. Uh, the Manhattan Six Garage, uh, it seems to be delayed again. Um, it's like a never-ending uh, issue that we have. Um, I've talked to the council members of the district and they're asking for a study to be done to identify locations for the Manhattan Six Garage. Um, I know that we thought we had a location. Um, they think it's unsatisfactory, that, that, that they don't like the location that was chosen. So what process are we taking to try to come to a, a place where we're just concluding with where the Manhattan Six Garage is gonna go so we can finally get these trucks off the streets and the sanitation workers from having to take showers and get prepared in a storefront as opposed to a, like a legitimate building. Um, so I just wanna know what's the idea with Garage Six. Um, so we continue to look for real estate uh, and options. Uh, we recently looked at, to this point, over 20 different locations to see if they might be able to accommodate uh, the garage and the trucks. Um, M6 is not uncommon in terms of trucks being out on the street and other locations as well. Um, but ultimately, we hope that Brookdale, you know, is the is the final solution. Brookdale is ultimately where we hope to eventually wind up. So, in the meanwhile, again, we more than willing to look at any location that the city council or any of the local elected officials. Uh, things might be able to accommodate it. We're more than happy to see if it fits our needs. Is it easier to find a alternate location for Brookdale than it is to find a new spot for a garage? I don't know because of uh, the limitations right now in Manhattan in terms of real estate. Um, so again, similar to the other question, chicken or the egg, whichever, which, whichever we could find first, we'd be happy to, yeah. to accommodate. We have a lot of, there's a new building. JP Morgan just got a new building in Midtown. There's just a, so many new buildings going up. Uh, maybe there's a space for them there in Brookdale. I just want you guys to look into it. Um, my last one is save as you throw. I really want to start that study as soon as possible. Uh, I've talked to the speaker who also didn't object to the study and it happening. So I just want to know when DSNY is gonna move forward with um, the largest potential contribution towards achieving the goal of zero waste. Um, so just really want to talk about getting that completed. I think we'd be, we'd be happy to sit down with you and talk about how we can move that forward. Um, <clears throat> right now we, we are not funded to, to advance that study, but um, 
we've had a, a number of conversations, especially with some experts in, uh, in the recycling community here in New York City who are interested in helping out as well. So I think there are ways that we can definitely investigate uh, the potential there, the potential to incentivize uh, people to recycle and to compost um, and to, to reduce waste overall. We get rid of the politics if we inform people with data. So if, I can, if we get that study, it'll make it easier for us to make the case. So that's just me advocating for it to happen. We appreciate your advocacy. All right, I'm, I'm done with questions. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you for coming, uh, for Acting Commissioner Costa. Thank you as well. Um, oh, we actually have, oh, talking about Manhattan Six Garage. Uh, Council Member Powers. Sorry for the late entrance, but I can't miss every no so hearing, you know. Uh, thank you guys for, and I'm sorry I missed your testimony. Um, it, I, you know, I was on New York One this morning, actually, or a tweet of mine was on New York One this morning. I pick Pat Kiernes, they were discussing um, different areas where there is a high need for trash uh, pickup and improvement around um, trash. And, um, you know, no, I, I have a number of notable areas around subway stations in Midtown and other high pedestrian areas where I just I just be frank like we get complaints all the time about trash cans that are broken lack of service lack of um, of of clean streets and wondering and we you know as a council fund this this is why I think this is a fight that um, the, the chair and the speaker have talked about is so important but um, I get them all the time and you know I, I guess the question here is you know just just a just trying to get an honest read on how we address sort of high trafficked areas where we either don't have enough trash cans there, they're getting broken into, they're getting not getting enough service because I'm getting calls from constituents every day and it's a, it's a repeat question around Upper East Side and Midtown and down to even near Union Square and I don't have an honest answer for them. We fund cleanup stuff in the, I, I fund the sanitation cleanup. Um, and we need, you know, there are, there are like sort of high area, high traffic areas that are problem spots. And I'm wondering if there is a, a way that whether it's through funding or through, uh, you know, better, better connection and communication, we can address some of these high traffic areas where we're getting a lot of, you know, frequent calls around uh, cleanliness. Um, if you have specific areas, we're more than happy to look at them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, many of the council members are extremely supportive of the department in terms of lending additional funds for supplemental service. Um, there are some instances where a basket is being picked, tipped multiple times a day and tends to still fill up. So that's when a lot of that supplemental service comes in. Um, we try to uh, make it specific to the area in terms of in some cases, a second basket can solve the problem. In other cases, um, if it's being improperly used, sometimes it means removing the basket. But if it's just based on um, heavy use in terms of it being an overflowing situation, please let me know the area and we'll try to take a look at it specifically and see how we can address it. Um, big bellies, uh, high-end baskets, there are lots of options. If you have a particular basket you mentioned that you thought was uh, not an aesthetically uh, holding up, please let us know. 14th Street and First Avenue, but I'll send it to you. Yes, email. we. Uh, um, and and, for and spring we replace. We're in the process of replacing uh, some of our damaged baskets from this past winter. And when, when does Big Belly come into effect? Because I know they're expensive, but you mentioned Big Belly. So what, where, when would you put a Big Belly into an area where, if they're based on complaints so or Big violence? Belly was a pilot that we ran in Brooklyn. Um, we found that it itself had its own challenges. Uh, they tend to be expensive. The maintenance contract on them is also expensive. Uh, what we have found is that in areas that have bids, they do tend to work a little bit better because uh, they have more, more of a white glove treatment in terms of the bid being able to um, keep it clean, uh, graffiti free, and pull the liner out when it's full, um, whereas if you start to spread that out, it also impacts the department's ability to service how many, uh, it starts to impact in terms of how many we're able to service on a route. I got it, and let my, 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 thank you for that answer. My last question, respect of all the chair's time, especially Chair John, who's been here, who's here all day. Um, I, I live in Stuyvesant, Peter Cooper. I think you're doing organics recycling there. I think it's one of your places where you're doing it. 
I, as I understand it, the city hasn't done the expansion. I know this is, I'm, I'm certain this has come up already, but um, where I live, they're doing it. it. Is there a reason there aren't, I mean, it's a, it's a unique place because there's 25,000 people who live in one place and you have a sort of centralized management, but is there a reason you're not expanding that to other areas that would be at least similarly situated where you have, they themselves own other properties that are li somewhat like it, where you have uh, a willing partner, Kipps Bay Court, for instance, Parker Towers out in Queens, um, where you have a, a, a property owner who's willing to do it? If we have property owners who are willing to do it, management companies in districts that have existing uh, organics collection, we are welcome to uh, meet with them and see if we can actually incorporate them into a route. And is that your hardest challenge right now, is finding property managers that are willing to do it? Uh, it's interesting right now. We actually have, uh, I won't call it a waiting list, but we do have uh, interested parties. So we're welcoming that, and uh, our BRS group will go out, meet with them, meet with the management group, uh, train the management, uh, the maintenance staff within the building, and, and we'll figure out how we can incorporate it onto an existing route. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, and I think that is it then for this panel. We thank you for coming in and for providing testimony. We will uh, start again at about 3 p.m. with um, uh, MTA.
Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our hearing. We'll now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Transportation, chaired by Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez. We're joined by Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, and I think others will be joining us shortly. Uh, we just heard from the Department of Sanitation, and now we will hear from Patrick Foy, Chairman and CEO of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open up the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council joint hearing with the Finance Committee and the Transportation Committees Today we will be looking at the MTA's calendar year 2019 adopted budget and the calendar year 2015-2019 capital program. I'm Councilmember Rodriguez and I have the privilege to chair the Transportation Committee. Before we begin, I would like to thank Council uh, Chairman uh, John for his leadership that he holds on this Committee of Finance. Two weeks ago, the committees heard testimony from the Departments of Transportation and the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Today we will be continuing the budget process and we'll hear testimony from the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. The MTA's calendar 2019 adopted operating budget is balanced and included more than one billion in city subsidies. The authorities proposed 2015-2019 33.1 capital program is fully funded. We look forward to having the chairman updated the committee on the state of the transit system in the future. We hope to hear about some of the MTA's ongoing project, including the city's 418 million contribution to the subway action plan, as well as phase two of the Second Avenue subway, East Side access, Penn Station access, expansion of the selectable service, and the proposed fast forward plan. In addition, we hope to hear details about the upcoming 2020-2024 capital program, including its funding sources. On April 1st, the state authorized MTA to establish a congestion tolling program in the city. The congestion tolling zone include areas of Manhattan south of and including 60th Street. This plan is expected to take effect in 2021. We hope the MTA will elaborate on the details of this congestion tolling program, including confirming how, mo how much drivers will be expected to pay for driving within the zone. It, I want also to highlight that Today, before the hearing, we stand with the Yellow Taxi Medallion owners, uh, recognizing that they already had been paying a type of congestion price when riders jump into the car and they made a 50 cent contribution. So we hope again that we can continue conversation and looking to exempt the Yellow Taxi Medallion owner from uh, the congestion price. With that, we go back to Chairman Drew. Okay, very good. I'm going to ask counsel to swear in the panel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Okay, you may begin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Drum, Chairman Rodriguez, and members of the City Council. I'm MTA Chairman and CEO Pat Foy, joined today by my colleagues to my left, MTA Managing Director Ronnie Hakem, to my right, New York City Transit President Andy Byford, and to the far left, MTA CFO Bob Forn. We're here at the committee's, plural, invitation to discuss the state of the MTA and our transit network. As you may know, council members, I was confirmed as MTA chairman and CEO about six weeks ago. And as you most certainly know, the MTA faces significant challenges right now. We have a great deal of work ahead to bring truly innovative and meaningful reform to the agency and to provide New Yorkers with the transportation system they deserve. To rebuild not only our system but our agency, I've laid out a series of priorities for the MTA. First, we must continue to improve safety, service, and the customer experience. 
and continue to turn our system around for the millions who depend on us. Over the past year, we've made real demonstrable progress through our subway action plan. As, as Chairman Rodriguez mentioned, paid for by the city and the state, thank you, and smart, effective management from my colleague Andy Byford and his team. We reported a couple of days ago that on-time performance in April was nearly 80 percent, the highest it's been since October 2013. Weekday delays in April decreased 35 percent from last April, reaching the lowest level since December of 2013. Major incidents are also declining steadily, and almost all of our new customer-focused metrics improved in April and were better than their 12-month averages. These numbers, of course, will fluctuate from month to month, but it's our job to ensure that they continue to trend in the right direction. Despite the success of the subway action plan and the improved performance on the subways I've reported, we also realize that we've got substantial work ahead of us. Second, we must transform the way we work and fundamentally rethink how we do business to create a far more streamlined, efficient, and effective organization. Toward that end, by the end of June, we will deliver to our board and make public a personnel and reorganization plan. We're also revamping our FOIL and open data processes. We have a number of new board members. We will soon undergo a legislatively required independent forensic audit to be completed no later than January 2020 and subsequently presented to the MTA board and made public. And it is now required by law that any new MTA capital project over $25 million use the design-build method of delivery. These are just a few of the many reform efforts currently underway. Recent reports of overtime abuse at the MTA illustrate the critical need for fundamental reform. Overtime is an important and useful tool as we urgently seek to modernize our entire system, but we must be sure it is being used effectively, accurately, and appropriately. I've asked the MTA Inspector General to conduct an investigation of our timekeeping and attendance systems and overtime abuse. We owe the taxpayers and our customers an explanation of both management failures and how some have abused the system, so this never happens again. As we streamline MTA operations, we must also continue to drastically cut costs out of our organization. In this regard, I'm proud to say we're making progress. We've set aggressive and mandatory savings targets totaling $500 million for all MTA agencies. This is on top of the previously realized $2 billion in annual cost reductions that our CFO and his team, Bob Foran, working with the agencies, has already achieved. We're applying the same scrutiny to outside consultants and vendors to achieve savings of 10 percent on each contract and a total savings target of $75 million. And we're working to consolidate a number of back office functions within operations and enterprise-wide. All of this represents a real and tangible start, but there is much more fundamental and radical work to be done. Next, we must rebuild our credibility because the harsh truth is many of our customers and elected officials such as yourselves in Albany City Hall and here at the New York City Council don't trust the MTA. For too long, you've heard this organization make commitments only to miss deadlines or not follow through. We must work together tirelessly and steadily to earn back your trust. Finally, we must increase accountability and transparency. Gaining back trust will take time, responsible management, and improved performance. We must hold ourselves accountable to our goals and honestly communicate what and how we're doing, including the challenges we face and the steps we're taking to tackle them. As you may remember, Council Members, the MTA testified before this body in March to discuss our budget. At that time, we said we were at a historic crossroads where desperately needed funding must be secured to ensure a successful future for mass transit in New York. Fortunately for our transit system and our city, one of those funding sources has come to fruition after decades of false starts and failed attempts. Central Business District tolling, otherwise known as congestion pricing, the first such program in the nation. While the governor and our partners in the state legislature have shown tremendous leadership in passing Central Business District tolling to help fund the next MTA capital program, no new funding for operations has been provided. As a result, the MTA continues to face steep fiscal challenges and a bleak future forecast with projected operating deficits of nearly $1 billion in 2022. 
In the next 12 months, we must reduce expenses by half a billion dollars. State law requires that the MTA break even each year. The consequences of not breaking even would be severe. On the capital side of our budget, funding for the upcoming 2020 MTA capital program went from zero dollars to $32 billion overnight at the beginning of April, thanks to the historic passage of CBD, Central Business District Tolling, and additional revenue sources in the 2019 state budget. These include $15 billion from Central Business District Tolling, $5 billion from the Real Estate Transfer Tax, $5 billion from an Internet Sales Tax in New York City, and, and, a, and an assumption of roughly $7 billion from the federal government, assuming a similar commitment to the 20, that the federal government made to the 2015 to 2019 capital plan. These funds can and will serve as the foundation for a robust MTA capital program. But central business district trolling will do far more than improve our transit network. This informative initiative will also first improve Manhattan's air quality by dramatically reducing carbon emissions while mitigating the existential threat of climate change to the region and our planet. Get remove cars from the road, allow buses to move faster, increase mobility, and create safer streets for cyclists and pedestrians. Thirdly, alleviate New York City's stifling and economically draining traffic congestion, which the partnership for New York City some number of years ago estimated was approximately a $20 billion a year economic drag on the New York City economy. And lastly, bolster New York State's economy. Now that we have the green light for CBD tolling, we're wasting no time to implement this vital initiative. We're working with New York City on an MOU required by, this, by the legislation and meeting regularly with New York City DOT Commissioner and MTA board member Polly Trottenberg and her team. Last month, we issued a request for expressions of interest for firms to indicate their willingness to respond to an RFP for the program. We're hoping to draw a wide array of interest from multiple entities, including new, new partners and new entrants. We're casting a wide net so we can bring the world's best technology and innovative solutions to this project. Many details about CBD tolling are to be determined, but we know that a six-person commission, the Traffic Mobility Review Board, will make recommendation to the MTA's Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority on tolls and charges and other issues such as potential credits, discounts, and exemptions. The Traffic Mobility Review Board's recommendations are due by November 15, 2020, and the new law provides that tolls must generate a net $1 billion annually for the 2020 to 2024 MTA capital program. And again, when you factor in additional revenue from federal funding formula and the 2019 state budget, we're up to $32 billion. The bold modernization plans at New York City Transit, the Long Island Railroad, and Metro North are the main drivers of the increase in capital expenditures for the next five years. I'll note that the state budget passed on April 1st requires that 80 percent of the proceeds from these funding sources be dedicated to New York City Transit, subways and buses, and the remaining 20 percent be split between the Long Island Railroad and Metro North on an equal basis. If fully funded, the 2020 capital program will modernize our transit system from top to bottom. We will bring our customers in our region state-of-the-art signal programs, systems, increasing safety, reliability, and throughput on our subways. We will buy new rail cars, subway cars, and buses. We've allocated more than $2.5 billion towards accessibility improvements, and we will make 50 additional subway stations ADA accessible. That means that by 2024, no customer will ever be more than two stations away from an accessible station. But we're not stopping there. Our 10-year goal is to make more than 100 additional stations ADA accessible. And in 20 years, we hope to achieve maximum possible system-wide accessibility on the subways. The MTA's partnership with the city and with community leaders is critical to delivering the capital program and improving operations. We have a strong record of successful collaboration with the city on a wide variety of initiatives from the SBS Select Bus Service Program to the L Project. As we modernize the system, we'll be working closely with all of you and your constituents to minimize disruption and inconvenience. But a strong partnership with the city is essential, particularly as we identify locations for elevators to improve accessibility, and importantly, to power substations to increase capacity. 
I remain hopeful that we will fill budget gaps in our operating and capital budgets, and we are aggressively pursuing additional federal support to fund our capital program. Because while we're grateful for the significant past contributions to our transit network from the federal government, the truth is we deserve more. The New York metropolitan region's $1.7 trillion economy is the largest in the nation, and it's no coincidence that we have the nation's largest transport network as well. What's more, on a per capita basis, the federal government subsidizes the MTA's transit network less than any other system in the nation. New York is the largest donor state in the nation, contributing nearly $36 billion more to the federal government than we get in return. Our robust transit system has substantial needs that must be met to maintain and grow the prosperity that we, we create and enable. To wrap up, Council Members, I want to once again thank Chairs Drum and Rodriguez for the invitation to join you today. The MTA very much looks forward to working with you and with all the members of this Council to build on the progress we've made to date. There's no doubt in my mind that with funding for a robust capital program, the support of New York City, New York State, and the federal government, and the MTA's new leadership team, we will transform the MTA to give New York the world-class transit system it deserves. Now, at this point, my colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I want to thank you, um, Chairman Foy, and uh, your whole team for coming in and providing testimony uh, today. Uh, let me start off by talking a little bit about something that you did mention in your testimony, and that's overtime spending. As, as, as has been widely, widely reported in the media, and an employee of the MTA Long Island Railroad is being investigated for having logged in 3,864 hours of overtime last year, earning $344,000 in overtime and bringing his total pay to $461,646. The MTA has stated that five employees at Long Island Railroad were being disciplined for overtime abuse and has called for an independent investigation of the problem. Who is responsible for assigning overtime at the MTA? Is it the responsibility of management to ensure that all employees are working efficiently, effectively, and safely? Uh, Chairman, the answer to your question is the responsibility of management. Uh, no union member, no union generates its own overtime. Uh, I think it's important to say that uh, overtime is an important management tool. Uh, in the event of an emergency, a snowstorm, Superstorm Sandy, or the extremely high level of work going on on the subways and Long Island Railroad, overtime is, of course, a uh, necessary tool. Uh, when overtime uh, is, is abused, uh, obviously we have a responsibility to the taxpayers, to the city, to the state, and the federal government to, uh, to act. Uh, upon learning of these amounts of overtime, uh, I asked for an investigation by the uh, MTA Inspector General. Uh, that investigation is ongoing. I'm not going to comment on uh, the status of the investigation or any details for reasons I, uh, I, I know you'll all uh, understand. Um, and beyond that, we are engaged in a program to install uh, at New York City Transit, at the Long Island Railroad and Metro North, modern 21st century timekeeping and attendance systems. Uh, and that process, uh, Chairman, is underway. Are there any investigations that you're aware of into the lack of appropriate overtime oversight by managers, or has there been any discipline of managers that you're aware of for allowing overtime abuse? Uh, the Inspector General is investigating the systems that were in place, the systems that could have been in place, and uh, abuses or uh, failures of uh, uh, employees at every level uh, of the MTA chairman. Um, is it safe for a worker to log in 3,864 hours of overtime? And does the MTA keep track of the employee injuries while working overtime? Uh, Chairman, uh, I don't believe that any human being can work that number of hours. And frankly, uh, forget about operating uh, Long Island Railroad equipment. I, I think one question whether that employee should drive his or her car home. Uh, there are federal rules that apply to certain classes of employees on the Long Island Railroad and Metro North. They don't apply to maintenance of way employees. Uh, tragically, as I reported to the board uh, a couple of weeks ago, a Long Island Railroad maintenance of way employee was uh, killed uh, literally two years ago around this time. It was on Belmont Stakes Day, so it would be the first Saturday uh, in June. Uh, the NTB, NTSB is investigating that tragic fatality. 
it appears at this point that high levels of overtime and exhaustion were contributing factors. Uh, I've uh, informed the board and the public that if the federal government doesn't act with respect to creating reasonable caps on overtime of maintenance way uh, facilities, and we're in discussion uh, with the federal uh, authorities, parts of U.S. Department of Transportation, that uh, I, I, I will act. This month at an emergency meeting, the MTA board determined that the majority of overtime costs were for workers making urgent repairs. Were these overtime costs related to the governor's declared state of emergency on the transit system or for work related to the subway action plan? Uh, Chairman, that work related to, uh, well, do you want to talk about the subways and I'll talk about the one sure, on the railroad? Sir, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, certainly for the uh, for transit, the vast majority, uh, in fact, it's something like 95% of overtime for New York City transit for this calendar year, 2019, is related to the subway action plan. And, and no real surprise, it's a huge undertaking. There's a huge amount of work to do. Um, it's, a, it's an efficient use of people to uh, to get the bow wave, if you will, the, blit, the main blitz of this work done through overtime rather than uh, either uh, recruit additional people, and although we have done that as well, or wait for those additional people to be recruited, onboarded, etc., etc. The imperative is to get the work done. Now, clearly, you have to have controls on that, and that is something that we're very uh, closely monitoring. Uh, but certainly for transit, the majority of uh, overtime incurred uh, last year and the year to date, this year, 2019, has been a subway action plan related. And Chairman, I, I would just add the following. I noted in the first couple of paragraphs of my comments the results for the month of April of the subway action plan. So on-time performance as a result of the subway action plan and the work of Andy Byford and Sally LeBaire and the whole team has gone from 65% uh, on-time performance to nearly 80. Uh, I have every confidence that Andy and his team will push it past 80 and higher. And the point I wanted to make is the funding that the state and the city put into the subway action plan, $836 million in total, has paid real dividends for New York City commuters. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are the MTA's plans for an independent investigation? Who has the MTA contracted with to investigate overtime spending? And is the investigation limited to the LIRR or will it encompass all of uh, the MTA? So let, let me take, Chairman, your last question first. It is not limited to the Long Island Railroad. It's an agency-wide uh, uh, review. Uh, the MTA Inspector General is, uh, is taking the lead. Uh, you may have uh, read that we hired a uh, nationally known uh, restructuring firm called Alex Partners. That was pursuant to a provision of the state budget passed uh, uh, on April 1st that required that, that, uh, that a fir such a firm be required. It was a firm with which the MTA did not have a prior uh, relationship, and Alex Partners is looking at these issues, including overtime, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, on the subway action plan, the MTA released the subway action plan to address the need to modernize the subway system and to reduce delays. Phase one called for approximately $1.8 billion over five years, and phase two calls for an additional $8 billion in capital investments to repair the subways, to repair the subways tracks, signals, stations, and cars. The city has been called upon to contribute one half of the first $836 million of the subway action plan funding, or $418 million. During preliminary budget hearing um, follow-up, the MTA reported that approximately 84% of the $836 million subway action plan phase one investment has been invested. Uh, can you please provide the committee with an update on phase one of uh, the subway action plan, and how does the MTA plan to spend the remaining $136 million of the subway action plan funding? So just in terms of the dollars, we can... I don't know if your mic is on. Oh. Better? Yeah. Or maybe just pull it a little closer to you. Of course. You Better? Go. Yep. Um, in, t in terms of the subway action plan um, dollars, as you noted, at the end of the year 2018, we had spent um, about, uh, we had left over, I should say, about $140 million. That money has continued to be spent. Um, the work that Andy's team has been carrying on um, and if you, you are in the system, you've seen the benefits of it in terms of work going on nights and weekends. Um, the amount of track that has been cleaned, the amount of high priority defects that have been repaired, thousands, literally thousands. The number of cars who have um, improved their 
um, running time between failures. Um, we've touched actually 2,700 cars already. Um, all of this work continues. You've continued to see us perform signal repairs, uh, cleaning tracks, grates, uh, drain bo boxes, drain lines. Um, the, the system itself has benefited and Andy's performance metrics, uh, Andy Byford's performance metrics um, bear this out because in fact things as connected as trash, by removing trash out of the tracks and the system, fires come way down. And so that improves reliability and the safety of the system. Andy, I don't know if you want to go sure. some of the if I, if I might, um, just to put some meat on the bones there for you, Chair. Uh, so um, the, the most recent performance statistics that we just uh, announced at the, uh, at the Transit Committee just, uh, what, uh, yesterday, in fact, show that the on-time performance across the whole network now has reached just shy of 80%. And if you think back, that was uh, sub-60% at the beginning of uh, 2018. So the Subway Action Plan and its complementary program, which we call Save, Safe seconds, which is about getting the operational disciplines right, as well as fixing things, it's having a real impact. So 80% um, punctuality, as, again the chair, as the chair said, I aim to take that higher. I think the existing system can be made to, uh, to get to at least 85% before we even re-signal. Uh, in terms of the number of uh, trains delayed for, uh, eight, for the month, month of April, uh, that is down 35%. In terms of the number of major incidents, that's down 30%. These are all week day statistics. In terms of the weekend, uh, because obviously the weekend uh, is important as well, that is the time when we do most work. But there again, we've seen improvement. 15% reduction, 1-5, 15% reduction, uh, sorry, increase, 15% increase in punctuality, 50% reduction in the number of trains delayed, 50% reduction uh, in the number of major incidents. Um, and then a couple of other statistics, a 40% year-over-year uh, decrease in delays for the first four months of this year. Uh, major incidents attributed to track, we've done a lot of work on track, down nearly 40%. Response times to incidents, 29% faster. And time to resolve those incidents when we get there, down 37%. So lots more to do, uh, but the indicators are all um, showing in the right direction and proving that we're doing the right things. So, Ms. Hakim, of the um, 140 million that you that we had mentioned, do you expect that? Uh, what is the timetable for spending the, the rest of that money? The plan is to complete many of the subway action activities um, through the summer, and then we had always intended for the subway action itself to morph and into an enhanced maintenance program, and we've budgeted for that. Um, in order to continue the good efforts and continue the work that's been going on just to bring up all of our maintenance standards. S Subway action was intended to be a surge to get us to the place we are to now, but we know we have more to do and we're going to continue our maintenance efforts. Can you describe for the committee um, what the phase two program looks like and give us an update on that? Um, yeah, so it's, it's continuing a lot of what we were doing in terms of finishing off uh, clearing the uh, remaining trains that need to be unblocked. It is further work on, uh, on the maintenance of cars to make them more reliable. We're doing more work on make, making escalators and, and elevators more reliable. We are deep cleaning stations at the moment. We're, we're undergoing a deep clean of 100 stations and we're, we're finishing off that amount. We're deep cleaning train cars. Uh, we're, working, uh, we're doing more work on fixing the uh, existing signaling system, replacing what are called um, insulated block joints, replacing train stops, various technical bits of equipment that can go wrong and that can cause delay. Um, that goes hand in hand with, again, our Save Safe Seconds campaign, where we are relentlessly removing redundant speed restrictions safely and following uh, proper scrutiny and, and analysis, where we are um, making sure that signals are properly calibrated and where in the next phase of work we're looking across the whole system to see where we can further safely speed up the system by reviewing the prevailing uh, standards that we use. 
Thank you, and Mr. Byford, when you talk about being on time, mm -hmm. how many minutes late is on time? Four minutes, 59. So uh, that's a fairly standard, uh, a standard measure that's used across uh, most international systems that I've worked. Uh, we are also now beginning to track to, uh, time to two minutes, in other words, one minute, 59. And what that means is the train has to arrive at its terminal within uh, four minutes, 59 of the planned time, of the scheduled time, and in, in doing so, it cannot skip a station because otherwise that would allow, it might encourage you to perversely skip stations in order to, to hit the end date. So it must stop at all of the booked stations and it must arrive within four minutes 59. Now that might seem like a lot, but a couple of points on that. Number one, most people don't go end to end. So most people wouldn't go right from the Bronx down to Brooklyn. Um, so uh, th to me, the most important thing on a subway is to have relentless service, to have very evenly spaced headways because most people wouldn't know whether it was their specific train with the one that they catch or whether or not it's on time or not and secondly uh, and and I think it's of equal importance. Four minutes 59 may seem like a long run. On a 100-minute run from the Bronx to, uh, say, to southeast uh, Queens, you only need a few short delays to soon miss that target. So it is a tough target. We aim to make it better. Okay, thank you. Um, how is the MTA making use of the governor's executive order declaring a state of emergency for the subway system? Are any projects directly related to the service reliability awarded under the executive order? And what safeguards are in place to ensure that contracts are being awarded appropriately and fairly? When um, awarding contracts under the executive order, we still go through an informal competitive bidding process. So we do um, continue to canvas for multiple sources of whatever the, the thing is that we're procuring. Um, and uh, we also continue to monitor the expenses for whether it's buying signal equipment or buying additional um, uh, uh, um, maintain, maintenance equipment. Um, we continue to monitor the quality of the equipment that we're buying, the source that we're buying it from, making sure that they are a, a good contractor or a good vendor and don't have any uh, marks against them from other sources or any prior history with us as well. And Chair, Chairman, I would add two things to that. I agree with all that Ronnie said. Uh, first is that we report to the board in public and to the public as to contracts that have been uh, procured under Executive Order 168. The, the other thing uh, I did, as I mentioned, uh, I, I became chairman and CEO five or six weeks ago. I, I asked the agency presidents to come up with a list of EO 168 uh, transactions that they may uh, need through the end of the year to continue the work on the subway action plan. And I also asked them, uh, gave them the challenge of coming up with minimizing as much as possible the use of EO-168, uh, because at, at some point it will no longer be in effect. And the agency presidents have responded to that. I, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was any EO-168 uh, procurement reported in the, in the last meeting. I believe the same is true of this meeting, we're beginning to minimize and, and, and move away from it. EO-168 played an important role in the success of the subway action plan, uh, but we're uh, looking to a future uh, without it. Okay, thank you for that also. Uh, the L train repair closure. The MTA changed course and is no longer shutting down the L train line between Brooklyn and Manhattan to facilitate the Hurricane Sandy related repairs. Can you please provide an update on the status of the L train tunnel repairs? Um, uh, Ronnie's going to talk about the construction, but I might just talk about how we're managing the service in the meantime. So uh, when, the, uh, when the plan was changed, uh, building on the existing plan, we revised the alternate service plan uh, to make sure that it now fits the new pattern. So just to refresh your memory, uh, the, the, the tunnel remains open, or one of the tunnels remains open throughout what would have been otherwise a closure. However, on nights and on weekends, uh, we go to 20-minute headways, gaps between trains uh, on one of the lines, and, and that's how uh, the service operates. So, so far, so good. Um, we've put huge amounts of effort into training people, into uh, contingency planning, into scenario planning, and into making sure that everyone knows what their specific job is. So we've received a lot of positive uh, comment for that. Uh, we've had people out and about. We've all been out um, and assisted, and I think the staff should be commended for the great job they've done. In terms of the, uh, the effect, 
Uh, we've not really experienced any uh, chronic overcrowding. We've um, had minimal uh, instances of people not being able to get on trains or being held outside stations. And that's because the, uh, the message to New Yorkers has clearly got through. What we've been saying is, yep, you can still use the L line, but it's better to use an alternative, such as the 7 line, such as the M line, the J, uh, and that message has really resonated. We've got very uh, high profile uh, publicity to say either use a different line, use the M14 bus if you're going along Union uh, um, 14th Street, uh, or use the Williamsburg Link bus that we've put in specially. I think um, we're not out of the woods. The, the, uh, the big challenge is going to come in the summer as people flock to Williamsburg, but we will rise to that occasion. I, I would add in terms of the construction work um, that the, next, the, the most recent phase began at the end of April. Um, that's the work that is really being undertaken nights and weekends in the tunnel itself as well as in the adjacent stations at First Avenue in Bedford. Um, this is in addition to the substation work and the other um, work related to the L. It has been going quite well. We, um, because of the new approach and the ability to avoid 93% of the concrete demolition that would otherwise have been required under the original phased approach, we were able to um, utilize a, fiber, a structural fiber um, polymer wrap that really was able to safely and securely um, line the bench wall and keep it in, intact so we don't, we avoid all of that um, noisy and, and uh, demolition work that had otherwise been planned. Um, the work has been going on schedule. The contractor is doing very well. The revised contract provisions do include penalties for delay or incentives to try to get them to move a little faster. We are maintaining what is uh, the, the original 15 to 18 month schedule and we hope to bring it in even sooner. And I think the original cost was 477 million. So what is the contracted amount uh, based on now with the partial shutdown? So we think just on the contract costs, we're going to be saving about $10 million, notwithstanding the fact that the contractor now has to work premium time in terms of nights and weekends, but it's still an overall cost savings. Okay, so then I know you mentioned the, uh, the demolition part. Uh, and originally you had said that one of the concerns that you had was the dangerous silica dust as a reason for uh, to fully shut down the tunnel. Um, so is the plan to partially shut down the tunnel safe now for New Yorkers? It, 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 it absolutely is. And in terms of dust management, we've challenged ourselves, our design team, and the contractor to develop an extraordinarily conservative approach to dust and dust management. So we monitor the dust, we use special tools, the contractor works within a, a air controlled, locked um, controlled environment so as to minimize any release of dust. Um, this part of the work is, is something that we are monitoring extremely carefully. We have dust monitors at Bedford within the tunnel in multiple locations as well as First Avenue, every place where the public would be um, to be able to monitor that. We've included in our website information about dust levels. We've held ourselves to what I, I would call an extraordinarily conservative health protective standard, one that was developed by the American Council of Governmental Public Hygienists, and we have nowhere near approached any of those um, uh, trigger levels. Okay, um, after New York City Transit Authority President Andy Byford called for an independent review of the governor's new construction approach, including at a January 2019 Transportation Committee meeting of Manhattan Community Board 3 and identified at least one such independent consultant who reportedly would have done such a review for $350,000. However, control of the project was reassigned to MTA Capital Construction and no, cons and no consultant to review the project in advance was retained. Instead, the MTA retained JMT to monitor the work, including safety and environmental consideration. So why was a consultant to evaluate the project prior to construction not retained? 
I, I think JMT's retention was at the request of our board. It was. Um, and felt that the scope of the work and, and the fact that they were going to continue the work and monitoring and periodically bring reports back to the board is seen as a positive. And the original discussion with that $300,000 number that you mentioned was not really the result of a formal proposal, but just, you know, who do we know in the industry and who should we talk to about this um, opportunity? And what the board wanted was somebody who had uh, a true independence without a prior working history with New York City Transit or capital construction. I'd also add that JMT was selected by a three-member panel of the MTA board, then Chair Freddie Ferrer, Scott Reckler, and D New York City DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg. And the recommendation, as I understand it, was unanimous. So you feel confident that the uh, decision to hire a monitor to, uh, to monitor the work is sufficient to guarantee the appropriateness and durability of the new engineering solution and the safety of city residents? Yes, and as you highlighted in the, their scope, safety and environmental monitoring are key elements of that work. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ridership decline and fare evasion. Uh, subway and bus ridership peaked in 2016 and has since fallen off. Last year, the MTA November forecast predicted that subway ridership would return to 2016 levels by 2019. However, however, the most recent adopted budget for calendar year 19 indicates that ridership levels are not expected to reach 2016 levels even by 2022. In the MTA's response to the Council's preliminary budget hearing follow-up letter, the authority blamed this decline on several factors, including fare evasion. So historically, how has the MTA measured fare evasion? Um, <clears throat> fare evasion is measured by doing a sample across uh, buses and also on the subway system. So uh, we have a team who go out and uh, they can't, obviously they can't ride every bus every day. They don't observe every station every day. But they have a uh, methodology which is um, statistically, signif uh, statistically valid, sorry, and which is um, consistent with best practice whereby they hypothecate what um, the fare evasion rate would be based upon uh, a sufficient uh, sample size to observe what goes on. So uh, they deploy to, um, to stations, they deploy to buses, and in plain clothes they observe uh, people's behaviors and they can extrapolate a fair evasion rate based upon the, uh, what they observe. So uh, you reported a substantial decline in ridership between 2018 and 19 adopted budgets. How much of this decline does the MTA attribute to decline in ridership or to fair evasion? Um, the, 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 the main cause of uh, decline in ridership on the buses, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, the, the streets are so congested that people find that the bus is not a reliable alternative, uh, which is what this document, Fast Forward Plan, aims to tackle. Uh, and I was just in the meeting this morning with DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenborough where we were, were reviewing the uh, city's bus action plan, which we very much welcome. Um, and that is designed to reverse this precipitous decline in bus ridership uh, by uh, providing uh, clear ways for buses to get through crowded streets, uh, by providing technology to assist buses to get through intersections, through traffic lights, um, and, and, the, and also the, re the bus redesign work that this plan is predicated around. In other words, designing a bus network that's fit, and, and, um, uh, fit for purpose. In terms of um, fare evasion, there is an element of that. If people are evading the fare, they're also not being counted towards the fare. But we have not said, and we've, we've never said, that that is the predominant factor. Can you provide us uh, with the, uh, the amount of money, uh, revenue lost to fare evasion between 2016 to the present? Do you have that? I don't have that number um, here, but we can certainly give you that number. In 2018, the revenue loss was approximately $225 million, $97 million from the subway side of the house, and about $128 million from the bus um, fare evasion that Andy uh, just discussed. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, student Metro cards. Uh, tomorrow, the MTA board is expected to vote on a proposal to give full fare Metro cards to New York City students who president re presently receive only half-fare bus-only cards. Students with the half-fare bus-only cards currently pay the second half of the fare using coins, which slows down bus boarding. How many students currently have the half-fare bus-only Metro cards? 
I, uh, yeah, we think it's about 100,000. I'm just checking the facts. Uh, what we do know is this will cost New York City Transit around $200,000. I think that's money well spent uh, because it does then mean that you've got equity across the city in terms of what the uh, students receive by way of travel. It means they don't have to uh, dig around to try and find the coins. So that's another way of speeding up the buses, which I would argue would make bus travel more attractive. It's another factor in getting people to ride buses because they speed it up again. We believe the figures around 100,000 uh, recipients at the moment. And I would add that it's also good for use in the subway, unlike the existing. I don't think your mic is on. Oh, sorry. I would add that it's also good for use in the subway, unlike the existing half fare card, which was only available on the bus. Good, thank you. Uh, is the MTA going to absorb the full cost of expanding the program, or is there an exception that the city will be required to contribute to it? No, this is an MTA um, born cost as described in the board action that we're bringing tomorrow. Okay, and I just want to, um, before I turn it over to Chair Rodriguez, um, take a little bit of um, chair privilege to uh, just ask, you know, in the uh, Victor Moore Arcade in the Roosevelt Avenue subway station, we've seen the closure of a number of retail stores on both the mezzanine level and on the 75th Street and Roosevelt Avenue side. Um, the Pizzeria Familia uh, closed. It took us many years, like 11 years, to get them in there, and um, we, we finally got them in. I hope that moving forward we can get a new tenant in there um, as soon as possible because it um, really caused a lot of blight in that uh, corner of the neighborhood. So, so Chairman, let, let me start. I, I spent many uh, uh, hours waiting for the Q47 uh, when I lived in uh, Jackson Heights and uh, know that facility well. I, I can tell you, I've personally spoken with Jano Lieber, who's the Chief Development Officer, about the, uh, about the 74th Street uh, and Roosevelt Station uh, vacancies. Uh, he has a, put one of his people on it. We're also considering a pilot program uh, for uh, small entrepreneurs, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs, and we think that 74th Street and Roosevelt uh, may be a, a good location for that. The loss, the loss of the pizzeria was, uh, uh, was 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 unfortunate. Uh, obviously, it generated a lot of uh, a lot of traffic, and we're focused on this. I think one of the issues there, by the way, was that it was two floors, yes. and that I think they were supposed to install an elevator as well, and that was part of the lease requirement. But just, well, I know I have a meeting with real estate coming up next week. We'll talk about it more there, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And Mr. Chef, I might just add, Please. and apologies if you said this, I was just checking some facts. The RFP for the tenancy will be issued in June, so we're actively on the case. And I might just offer a correction to my previous answer. It's not 100,000 recipients of that half price student fare, it's 27,000. Apologies, I've got a lot of numbers buzzing around in my head. Okay, that's fine, don't worry. I know the feeling after doing four hearings today. So thank you very much for your, for your um, answers. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the leadership and the great hard work that all of you and the rest of the team provide running one of the largest transportation systems in the whole nation, one of the few also in the world, too. one of the few also that is 24 hours and that connects so many municipalities. So we know that we expect more, and we know that in order to be in the leadership position where you are, you have to have a strong skin, because we are, you are New Yorkers, and you've been here knowing that you have to deal with strong opinions, you know, and, and all New Yorkers, we have a solution on how to make things better. So with that, of course, we also have the responsibility to take our society and our city to the net level, to the 21st century. And, and with that in mind, it, I hope that you can go back and look at the accessibility plan, uh, as you refer to. It, you're saying that by 24, no customer will be ever will ever be more than two stations away. I think that if we put together a MTA council committee you will be able to find a lot of support from council members that will be open to allocate some of our capital dollars to make stations in our district uh, accessible. I feel that if we can work together as we saw on how uh, 
with the governors and you at the MTA, you were able to cut the time for the air train uh, uh, tunnel construction. I would like to see a more aggressive plan where we can say that in a 10 year, by 2030, we want to make all the station accessible. Uh, and I feel that as we have many big plans, as a vision zero, by 2030 we want to accomplish this goal. I know it's not easy. And I know that you had to deal with a lot of procurement and we had to deal with being the place where it's more expensive to build. But I also feel that if we work together and we get support from Auburn into the city, we can cut some of the red tape. And having elevators or any other way of bringing accessibility to a station is not a luxury. It's a one million New Yorkers who are disabled in our city. And the rest, many of them include parents that they had to be navigating with a stroller. And I think, again, that it, it, I, I'm not gonna, I don't want to put you in a spot, but at least I would like to know if we can be able, if you can be open to look back and look to your team and even looking at the possibility, you know, we can put, it's not a hearing, but it's like a round table conversation between your team and the council and see how we can cut the time to make all train station accessible. So one of the things that we're doing um, that is relevant to your, um, your point, sir, is we are looking at how, how do we spec specify the need for an elevator. It's, they're very customized in the transit system. How do we stop that? How do we make this a more standardized, bring the cost down per unit, bring the maintenance cost down per unit? How can we do it faster, to your very point? How can we install, how can we design an elevator faster? If they're not all one-offs, and if we develop a good standard elevator design, we will be on the road to making improvements faster and more cost-effective. And that's an important part of what we're working on right now. Um, and if I might just add to that, so this is a passion of mine, uh, Mr. Chairman. There's a reason why accessibility is one full quarter of this document, uh, which I, uh, a commitment I made when I first got here on the 16th of January 2018. What we said was we can't be a proud of a system, uh, neither us as the transit professionals nor you as elected officials, we can't be proud of our system until and unless it's fully accessible. I think we'd all agree with that. At the moment we have 16 stations in construction and another nine in design and planning. What this uh, this plan will deliver is uh, by making 36 more stations accessible, but by targeting the gaps in the current system, within just five years, we can be no more, uh, customers will be no more than two stops away anywhere from an accessible station, which is light years ahead of where we currently are. But we want to go beyond that. So uh, what we, I've committed to with the chair and my MD support is that we'll actually, within the next five years, make 50 stations more accessible, which is a doubling of the current rate in the following five years would make um, more than 100 more stations accessible. So this is pretty unprecedented in terms of the, um, of the, uh, the actual scale of the program. Having said that, I very much welcome, I love the idea uh, that you floated of um, shared funding. I think that's great. It's not just about the dollars though. What we also need is your support, uh, your active support to help us politically with what is often a very charged um, environment where people want accessibility but they don't necessarily want the elevator in a certain place and and I've said before and I'll say again fast forward as a plan will grind to a halt if we have a six-month standoff with every every single element of what we want to do so to have your support for things like utility diversions um, getting you know obviously following the democratic procedure but expediting that that will help us enormously and incidentally final point we're not just looking at elevator we're also looking at ramps where they make sense and we're also looking at elevators that would go straight from the street straight to the platform uh, as opposed to having to go via the mezzanine which adds costs so uh, we're on the same page okay so let's you know let's follow with some conversation with that and and again I think it's also it will make big change in it and I know I can see what well, we can see at the council that in the new leadership there's more effort to connect more you know, with the community boards, with the council members. And, and it's not just about, you know, I can say from the whole team, 
including Maureen and the rest of you, you've been trying to do the best, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to follow a, a, a leadership, and, and I think that that's important, you know, to see how we can connect with the local council members. Like, I can give you a local sample, like a Dagman one train. Like, we, someone who live in the Diamond Houses that need to go to 231st and Broadway, they had to take the elevator because the elevator only go downtown, down. To take the elevator going down to 96th Street in order to change and go north again to 231st. When in the same station at this moment, there's a developer who own the land, who have a proposal in front of us, who want to build, and that's like a street level. That that's not a matter to pull another elevator. It's about how can we work, and again, that's a, a typical example. And as I can know, as I know that in many community, there's some innovating idea of how to make it more accessible, and of course with accessibility, even though it's not in my district, I hope that the Van Collen Station, the 242nd, is included as one of the top priorities to put elevator to make it accessible. Van Collen Park is one of the largest one. In that area, it's not only the residents of Riverdale, but it's also those people who live in Yonker or who go from the Manhattan to the Bronx. And thinking about the nice weather that we have right now, someone who is a senior citizen who rely on wheelchair cannot go down in that station. I know putting on the spot right now, say, can you do it now? But I just hope that you look at that station as many other that you are here, but accessibility is critical. Can I just make one more comment? We're looking at every station. So one of the big uh, steps forward that we've made in the past year and a half, and I would um, laud my colleague, Alex Elagudin, who's my senior, senior advisor for accessibility, a role we previously did not have, but one that reports directly to me uh, to show that we're serious about this issue. Uh, he and his team are, are probably two thirds of the way now, maybe more, two thirds of the way through surveying every remaining location to see what it will take what it will cost, what are the complexities of making each remaining station accessible. So we're deadly serious about this. That's why it's in that plan. Okay. But, okay, okay. So we will continue. And, and I think that we share interest on, on doing better or making our station accessible in a shorter period of time. Can the MTA put together the MTA Homeless Action Plan? Like, we want to support, we should have compassion to support our homeless population. But I feel, and again, this is about, is the city, is the MTA, who is responsible for what? But I feel that with the increase of homeless in the stations, doesn't make it safe, neither for the homeless or for the riders. Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry. On what is, can you describe what have you found out was today? What number? What is the number? What is? Do you have a number of how many homeless are in train stations every day? Does the MTA working with the city has a plan to relocate and connect those individuals who need help and we should support them, but to relocate them in places? where they can get the help that they need. Okay, most certainly. I'm gonna to defer to Andy, Chairman, on the details. I, I, I think this point is important. I, I think responsibility for creating a homeless action plan and for funding it should lay with local municipalities, in this case, the state of New York. And it, it's not a charge or a responsibility that ought to be placed on the MTA. Uh, obviously, everybody feels uh, badly when they see a homeless person uh, in, in distress with, with, with emotional issues, uh, et cetera. But I, I do think it's important at the outset that responsibility for creating such a plan and funding it lay with the city. Sorry, Andy. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so to reinforce that point, here's my, my view. I feel strongly about this. I mean, absolutely, you start from a position of empathy for homeless people. A lot of them are vulnerable. A lot of them have um, quite severe mental illnesses. But I, I would I, I take ex uh, issue with anyone who says this is an MTA problem. I believe it's a societal problem until and unless we have sufficient, safe, 
uh, host hostels, refuges uh, that people want to go to. We, we as the MTA will constantly be seeing people coming into the system either to warm up or to cool down. We will try, to our, we will try our damnedest to remove them from the system and they'll keep coming back in because the, the overwhelming evidence is that the reason they come in and they, they, they spend time in the subway, quite often they don't feel safe in the hostel. So it's something that as a, as a collective, uh, working with the uh, Barry Residence Committee, working with the NYPD, working with city councillors, working with uh, uh, the uh, DAS, um, working um, obviously with uh, other agencies. We have to solve this as a collective. Just asking people to leave will not solve the problem. They have to have somewhere safe and secure to go. Having said that, um, I equally know, I feel strongly that I have a, uh, an absolute um, responsibility to provide my customers, fair paying customers, with decent, uh, clean, safe accommodation, uh, sorry, a decent, safe uh, traveling environment. And I also have a responsibility to provide my staff, my employees, with a safe working environment. And at the moment, um, you know, every day we ask people to leave the system, people are being spat at, people are being uh, assaulted. Um, uh, you know, to me, there's, th th it really is an issue that we, we must address collectively. Uh, my view is that um, obviously these are vulnerable people, they come in to warm up or cool down, but there should be uh, clear boundaries as to what is acceptable behavior and what isn't and creating a fire risk, creating a safety and security risk, lying down, throwing stuff around, defecating, urinating, vomiting, whatever, uh, that is not acceptable. So it's certainly something that's on my radar. I feel strongly about it. I'm trying to get the balance right between uh, treating these people empathetically and getting them the help they need, but equally sticking up for my employees who deserve a safe working environment and sticking up for my customers who deserve uh, to get decent, clean, uh, uh, public transit and stations I again I, I so on do you have any the how often do you arrest, do you do any assessment on the numbers of homeless in the station uh, the, there's a, a meeting that happens once a month with the Bowery Residence Committee. I think the next meeting is actually tomorrow, where we we uh, go through with uh, with the BRC and with other partners how many uh, regular people there are. Uh, there's an approximation made as to how many people are in the system at any particular time. It tends to fluctuate. Uh, at times, it's hundreds of people. At times, it's tens of people. Uh, there's a lot of uh, regular uh, customers or regular homeless people that come into the system. Then um, we're all, we also meet regularly with NYPD to go through um, different alternatives on how to uh, how to handle these vulnerable people. Mm. So, I, look, we are not saying or I'm not saying that the plan should be to tell people to leave the stations. But I feel again, as a city, make contribution to the MTA, great contribution. I think that to also have. Train, to train the staff, the staff that we have in the stations, to have a plan, not to tell any homeless people leave the station, but to connect it with the services that they need. That's what I say about what is the plan, is there a plan? So that, that is the, um, the role that the Bowery Resource Center, we contract with them and we in the city collectively um, fund their work to come into the system to connect the social service system, the available social service system to people, but they have to want to take advantage of it. Um, they're very good at trying to get people to take advantage of um, available services, but obviously not everybody um, agrees to do that. Uh, and my group station managers, of whom there are 22, they were, uh, they've been assigned across the system. They have clear direction from me to, uh, to call in, and their staff, the station staff, to call in any instances of homeless people on either the trains or the stations so that we can get them the help that they, that they need. I stress we're not saying that we need people to be Arrested. What we're saying is we need to get them the help that they need, uh, and we're not going to uh, give up in that endeavor. Okay. So in the MTA Capital 2024, right, you will, MTA will get uh, investment from the city, the state, but this, the MTA will also have to continue getting into debt in order to balance the budget. Can you talk on what is the projection or how much will the city, with the MTA most, get into debt and what it, how do you see that increase of debt affecting the institution? 
Yes. <clears throat> the amount of debt that would be sold for the 20 to 24 capital program right now is anticipated to be somewhere close to $25 billion. Uh, the numbers that were put out, the billion dollars for uh, the tolling, uh, the uh, central business district tolling was generate $15 billion worth of proceeds from debt, and then the two other revenue sources were to generate $5 billion of debt for each. Uh, any excess would go into the next capital program. Is that accurate to say that the MTA will continue with operating projects we gap in the next few years? Yes, we're going to continue to issue debt over the next few years to finish out this capital program. We are retiring debt, though, at a pretty significant level. About a billion dollars a year of debt is being repaid. So we're adding debt, but we're also retiring debt. Do you share the outcome of the last audit made by the state controller on the projection of uh, uh, the, the operating gap by 2022? Yes. yes. So it's like $634 million debt? Uh, by 2022, the operating deficit is almost a billion dollars as the projection that we had in February. And debt service is a significant piece of that. Incremental debt service, I should say, is a significant piece of that. About so half. what we are saying is that even with the congestion price increase of revenue, the reality is that we should be looking at the city and the state for additional source of revenue so the NTA, you know, will be in a hefty position in the future, at the same time, again, that the MTA, and as you know, we've been clear from the beginning, should be expected that first to bring more transparency, to control the cost, and deal with some waste that happen in the, in the that have happened in the institution. Yeah. So I'm not just blaming one individual, but I'm talking about the culture and how we've been operating. I would say the biggest challenge for us right now is getting our cost down and that is what we're focusing on. Uh, before we ask for additional operating revenue, again, we do appreciate the additional capital funds that are available because that means that the capital funds are being provided by someone else and an art, a burden on the fare box. But the first thing we have to do is we've just got to make sure that we are as lean and efficient as possible. And we've just announced a $500 million target for annual operating savings. If we hit that target, that'll get us a long way toward addressing next year's projected deficit of almost 500 million. The next year projected deficit was about 800 million, and then, as you uh, mentioned, a billion dollars for 2022. But that's not going to be enough. We're going to have to continue to find savings. And part of the work that's being done by Alex Partners is to identify a structure that is more efficient where we can eliminate savings by not having duplicative services provided at each of the agencies, but try to combine the services so that we can reduce cost. So the first thing we want is we want to try to find out how we can reduce our cost as much as possible uh, before we ask for additional operating revenue. And the business opportunity for women and minority in a, as you say, a big corporation that has a value of $1.7 trillion, like how much more can you do? Because what we have in the city and the state is not enough. And we all have to recognize that we can do better to provide opportunity for women and minority, including, as I also brought to the DOT, opportunity to include local media in when you advertise, you know, from job opportunity to any, all this spend that you have with media. Like, how much more can you do on creating a better system for women and minority to be able to take advantage of all those contracts that you open IFP. So, so Chairman, the Governor Cuomo set a state uh, goal of 30 percent for, for the state of New York and for state agencies. Uh, we're, we're proud of our record. Uh, the MTA last year was at about 27 to 28 uh, percent. The MWB program is run by Michael Gardner, who I think it's fair to say uh, is probably been the most effective MWBE uh, leader and executive in the United States of America. Uh, there's clearly more that can be done, but I think the record of the MTA on these issues uh, has been a strong one and one that we're proud of.
as you had instructed to open investigation on the possibility of abusing of the overtime, we are not addressing the problem that we have on the business and my women and minority opportunity. If you look through the different community, it doesn't go to our community. There's a lot of red tapes on how the big one, those that have the expensive machine to build, has been able to make their numbers. Those numbers are not real. Big one, they get a third one, can be a family, can be a friend, can be someone. But if, you, if we want to really address, to create more opportunity for women and minority through the different local community in the city, if we, looked, if we put together a town hall, if we put together some summit together, and we know who are taking advantage of those opportunities, still there's some red tape that we have to cut because those numbers are not bringing the effect in the local, especially minority community in the city of New York. So, so Chairman, uh, I, I'd say uh, respectfully, th those numbers are real. Uh, I, I asked Ronnie to give me your phone uh, because Michael Gardner's uh, phone number is 646-252-1385. If you or any of your staff or constituents have issues with respect to the MWB program or cutting red tape, call or email Michael. He is responsive. Uh, if he doesn't respond to you, and I know that's not going to happen, uh, call me. Uh, I would say two things. We reported yesterday on the MWB results at a public meeting, which is on our website, about the numbers for uh, 2018. Uh, thirdly, the numbers are reviewed and audited, and I, I, I uh, am confident that the numbers reported uh, are, are real. If uh, be happy to meet with uh, any of you or your staffs on how we can make the program more effective or better known in certain communities in the uh, uh, in, in the city of New York. Uh, but I, I think it's fair to say that there are scores of small business owners in the MWB community, the DBE community, service disabled veterans that are operating businesses, paying their mortgage, sending their kids to college, and importantly, employing other people as a result of the MTA's uh, MWB programs uh, at all the agencies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have been joined by Council Members Koo, Miller, Rose, Adams, Cabrera, Levine, Lander, Jonai, and Deutsch. And we have questions to start off with, with Council Member Adams and then followed by Rose. Thank you, uh, Chairs uh, Drum and Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. President Byford, good to see you again. Sarah, good to see you again. Um, well, uh, you know this already, um, Andy. I am a, a daily commuter um, to and fro uh, from Jamaica Station right here. So needless to say, um, I've seen things kind of change a little bit. Um, the, the situation with the escalator uh, that was very prevalent over the past few months. And at one point last month, I said, why don't they just take it out of service altogether because it's pretty useless. So thank you for taking it out of service altogether because it has been pretty useless. Um, and hopefully we will be getting a brand new um, uh, escalator in there. Uh, my concern, of course, is the uh, ADA accessibility at this point for those that um, are not as mobile as myself getting up and down the stairways um, safely. Uh, in addition to that, just wanted to make that point. Uh, also wanted to find out, you mentioned um, your group station managers, and I have seen mine, uh, I won't mention her name, but I have seen mine around uh, doing her job. Um, how is the progress of that program going along for you? Can you let us know how that is going, not just for me in my area, but across the board, and what is your your uh, your metric, um, your your stick to uh, to manage that and to to let us know. 
<laughs> well, thank you for the question. It's nice to see you. Um, so, um, well, just a quick comment on escalators. Um, we're, we're really blitzing our escalator fleet at the moment. We, we are increasing the amount of maintenance that we do. So in the short term, you will see across the fleet a slight decline uh, in escalator availability <coughs> precisely because we're trying to get ahead of maintenance and to be more proactive in how we main maintain machines such that ultimately they stay in service more uh, frequently and more reliably. Having said that, there's also a lot of very old machines and some of them are almost um, uh, impossible to, to maintain parts for now. They are so old and they have such uh, a, uh, they're, they're unique. Actually, we have one, one fleet of escalators. There's only five in the whole country. So again, fast forward, we'll address that. Group station managers, I'm very proud of them. There's 22 of them, as I've said, plus four who do uh, special projects. Uh, it's a very timely question because at next month's transit committee, uh, we're putting together a video to show what they've been up to, actually. Uh, and they've been extremely busy. They are undertaking special cleans of their stations. So each of them does um, uh, is undertaking a, a particular focus on one of their stations in their, in their respective group a month. Uh, and that's both front of house activity and behind the scenes. So we're, we're upgrading staff accommodation, but we're deep cleaning platforms. We're scrubbing stairs. We are um, cleaning. Uh, the, the walls of the stations and you know giving them a really good uh, cleanup uh, and I think customers are already seeing the difference and um, in terms of uh, their effectiveness we measure them on uh, customer uh, customer satisfaction and I'm very pleased to see that customer satisfaction scores across the system are increasing. Uh, we measure them in terms of staff attendance so to, to, as a proxy for are they uh, encouraging and motivating their staff. We manage them in terms of safety incidents, in terms of uh, maintaining the revenue stream that should come into the station. So they're actually targeted with a number of, um, of measures. Uh, and again, it's based on a job I used to do. I'm very familiar with it. And it critically gives you and your colleagues in council a one-stop shop person to raise concerns on your particular areas. No more being passed around the, uh, the system. You just talk to the GSM and they'll uh, service your request, whatever it is. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I know my time is up. Just something to leave on your mind as well as uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Foy, on your mind. You've heard um, ad nauseum the expression transit desert. I would love to one day hear a sustainable plan that will dismantle that expression completely in the city of New York. Southeast Queens has been painfully, painfully neglected as far as our transportation is concerned. I would love to be able to take an express bus instead of the E-train right here on a daily basis. Thank you. Councilmember Levine followed by Lander. Thank you, Chair Strom and Rodriguez. It's, it's great to see uh, you, Chairman Foy, and, and you, President Byford. It, in past eras, it was very rare that the leadership of the MTA came to the Council, and it really means a lot that you're here to take our questions, and um, I know the public appreciates it as well, so thank you for that. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about bus service, and, and Mr. President, uh, you, you have, from your first day on the job, spoken passionately about how central you see bus service uh, to uh, transit in the city, uh, two million riders a day approximately. And uh, I, I, I have heard you speak about the danger of falling ridership that's driven by slower speeds. Um, and when people get off the bus, they often get into cars, which only makes congestion worse, which makes buses slower, which means you have less revenue. And then the scary part, you make cuts in service. And you, I think, have described this as a death spiral uh, because cuts in service means buses come less frequently and that means buses become an even less attractive option. Um, we need to get this going in the other direction. We need this to be a virtuous circle, not a vicious circle. And so I was really alarmed to see that you all have recommended now cuts on, I believe, 13 lines, um, citing a budget shortfall, which we are well aware of. And a few of these lines are very important to my district and to Council Chairman Rodriguez's district. Uh, the M3 and the M4 are extremely important lines for uh, Washington Heights, West Harlem, et cetera. Um, I don't think they could be described as underutilized. Anytime I'm on them, uh, it's standing room only for the most part. Uh, so I wonder if you could explain the logic 
and, and why we shouldn't be so alarmed at this being the start of the death spiral. Thank you. Um, the, the real solution here is what we're doing is, again, part of Fast Forward. That is to redesign the bus network in all five boroughs. And we've already done that in Staten Island for the express buses. And we're already seeing an increase in uh, average speed and a decrease in journey time. So that's two ways that we can get people back onto riding those buses. We're now in the Bronx. We're redesigning the Bronx network. And we just launched in Queens. And Brooklyn is next. And then, uh, obviously, we've got Manhattan left to do. Uh, and that is a, um, a the, the purpose there is to give the community the bus network that they want and that they will be attracted back to. Uh, and that does take a little bit of time. We've said that we'll do all five boroughs, all 321 routes in within three years of the fast forward plan. And we're seeing if we can speed that up. Um, but in the meantime, I have been here long enough to learn that there are also tough choices to be made. So be precisely because we, we are faced with a tough financial situation, uh, we, we do every summer, we do adjust the bus service to add service where, uh, where it is inadequate and to uh, refine service where um, we can make some slight adjustments without, uh, without we don't, we believe, not without losing uh, ridership. So the changes that we've made, yes, there were 13 routes that were um, that where the headways were slightly elongated. Um, what wasn't really commented upon was, uh, conversely, for about the same amount of money, so it wasn't a really a cost-saving exercise, ultimately, we did improve service on a number of other routes. We will monitor very closely those routes that went from, say, an eight-minute headway to a 10-minute headway. Uh, the last thing I want is to see further degradation in ridership. So uh, it's something that we, we, we feel we need to do to, to be responsible. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't be unduly alarmed by it. I, I appreciate that, and my time is up. But could you just explain why such crowded lines going to uptown Manhattan would make the list? because there were even more crowded uh, bus services that needed more service. So what, what we're trying to do, certainly while we're in the process of re um, organizing the whole bus network is shuffling the available buses, the available dollars, and the available operators that we've got to optimize the offer that we make across the whole city. So there were other services that were even more crowded that got more service. Okay, I'm not sure who the winners are in that scenario. Maybe you can I can give you out, the list. But I can give you the list. I mean, we, we, we did look carefully, and we've tried not to make those changes so um, uh, uh, severe that we would lose ridership. We, we, we will monitor it very closely, and I'll, I'll talk to you offline about how we okay, came up I, with your route. I, I would like that. We're, we, we, we share the goal sure. of, of revitalizing ridership, mm -hmm. and um, I just worry that you add to the wait time, and ridership's only going to go in one direction. But I, I appreciate your perspective, and I'll pass it back to the chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Lander, followed by Miller. Thank you very much uh, to the chairs. Uh, thank you, President Byford, and to your team for being here. And I want to, you know, give you praise, as I have done in the past, on the Fast Forward Plan on restoring enough confidence that it was possible for congestion pricing to happen and on taking us out of a real doldrums to something where I think you can see progress. That means an enormous amount. And my constituents in participatory budgeting just voted as the top vote-getting project ever in our district, a $250,000 down payment on the 7th Avenue F train elevator. And we hope to be able to work with you as part of that plan to get that elevator done. So a lot of good progress. Two areas of frustration that I am hearing from my constituents. One is on paratransit, where the shifts from uh, advanced reservation e hail to enhanced broker service have caused a lot of dismay, and also where many people had hoped for expansion of the genuine e hail service, which it's my understanding is the reason you're not expanding it from the 1,200 riders is it's working so well that those riders are taking more rides, um, and that has raised the cost. But Boston has a program where they ration how many rides you can have past a point. If that service is working, there's got to be a way to make it available to more people. And I'm just hearing a lot of frustration about both the freezing of the 1,200 uh, and on the changes to the brokerage service. So paratransit, one big area of frustration. And the other, as you know, is the rogue F-Express. It is, and we sent you a letter with some data. I, it, as far as I can tell, you guys are running an F-Express, but it's not on the schedule. It's not transparent, it, but it happens every day. 
and uh, you know uh, that has just a, become a frustration. If you're running an F Express, even though I don't want you to run an F Express, which is just skipping local stops with every other train, um, at a minimum you owe it to the riders to tell them you're running it and to provide some schedule information. And we really, I think, are in a bad black hole where a poor service is being provided without transparent information about it. So those are my two areas of frustration. Sure, so mindful of time, I will, I'll, I'll summarize really quickly. We'll take another look at what's going on on the F line. I mean, obviously on occasions we do skip stations in order to try to uh, get um, uh, to mitigate um, service uh, problems, uh, but that certainly shouldn't be done to excess and I will personally follow up on that point. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the excess ride issue, we heard that loud and clear at the uh, transit committee just uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, there's a number of things that we're doing to make the uh, what's called the enhanced broker service better and Alex Elagudin uh, listed off a whole raft of uh, initiatives that will make that advance um, sorry that broker enhanced broker service better to stop the rides around the borough uh, to stop um, excess journey times uh, to to improve communication with customers etc cetera, etc cetera. but on the on the bigger picture uh, it is a true uh, that in a way we're a victim of our own success the e hail is extremely popular that does mean that although the unit cost is less, the overall cost is, is a huge uh, increase, actually. So we are looking at different ways to, um, to solve the problem. We have not yet uh, finalized our thinking on that point. You made reference to Boston and to um, what they do, which is to uh, ration the number of rides or to, to cap the number of uh, rides that you can get for the, uh, the uh, subsidized amount. That is highly contentious with the advocacy community, uh, but we are looking at all options. And is there a timeline that I can go back to my frustrated constituents with and tell them when there'll be more, that the MTA will have more to say about next steps? Well, we said, um, we've made a clear commitment that the 1,200 person e hail trial will continue until the end of the year. Uh, I would expect over the summer we will have some more information and I'll make sure that we give you a heads up on that. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate that. As you know, and I know you saw it yesterday at the hearing, it's an area of real passion. I, I'm enthusiastic about getting subway service on many more subways, uh, elevator service on many more subway stations, but that's going to take a long time. So in the meantime, let's invest what we need to to expand good accessoride e-health service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilman Miller, followed by Joe Nye. Thank you to the chairs and Chief Floyd, for we, uh, welcome again, and to uh, Andy and Monty, certainly it's been a pleasure to work with you all over the years. Um, so I want to start with, and, and if I don't mind, I'm just trying to get it all in and you can uh, address it. Uh, first on congested pricing, um, what would be done differently from other and past dedicated funding means, and, and how would these new source of resources impact transportation deserts, as was mentioned by my colleague, Southeast Queens and other portions of the city of New York. Then I want to talk about, um, very specifically, the, the budget and, and the uh, upcoming capital budget. And um, in addressing those transportation deserts, we talked about what is the freedom ticket initially introduced as uh, transportation equity, whereas commuter rails, wherever they stopped in the city of New York, would be consistent with the price of a metro car. Obviously, freedom ticket is $5. What is the plan to invest or to continue and expand that program? Program I know is a pilot. We want to see it come out of um, MTA, but we also want to see it in other parts of the city, uh, servicing Metro North as well. And then um, I'd be remiss if I did not put on my labor hat and, and, and talk briefly about the, the uh, overtime, so-called overtime debacle that we have been experiencing. I know as a past president and business agent, I had a responsibility and an opportunity to negotiate overtime caps to address necessary service needs, whether it was GOs or whether it was Super Psalm Standy and things like that. So there are absolutely mechanisms in place. And so how this, this narrative gets driven about, you know, this, that I just don't see it. And, and, and I would hope that there's some clarification so that workers aren't really taking the beating that, that they are, are, have been taken. And then on that, there is a place that we've talked about in the past where I think there is significant opportunity for some real savings, and that is around workers' compensation. 
uh, workers' compensation. It had been, in my experience, a, a number of things um, that go wrong that we are not, or the authority has not focused on, number one, um, getting people back to work, servicing them as soon as possible so that they can continue to do their job and service, they have not looked at the, um, the, the workplace safety and the ergonomics and design of whether it's a, a bus compartment or a, a, a compartment, a cab for the uh, conductor or a motorman, and they have the same design that they've had 30 years ago and the same accidents and, and incidents uh, of workplace um, injury continue to occur. On top of that, there is a significant, significant long-term cost to workers' comp, and, and, and I dare say in uh, billions over the next uh, decade, um, how do we uh, plan to address that? And then finally, the other talk about um, being ADA compliant, uh, we are talking about the MTA. Why is it that the uh, Long Island Railroad and Metro North, where they uh, are in the city of New York, they are not providing accessibility. Um, do they not? Are they not required to meet the same mandates? Thank you. Council Member, let, let me start with uh, some of this. Uh, uh, one, your point on workers' compensation is one that I agree with. Uh, we've hired New York City Transit, and the MTA has hired a uh, expert on the workers' compensation issue in the last uh, several months. Uh, I do believe that a reasonable, concerted effort there would be in the best interests of the MTA, taxpayers, uh, and our customers. Uh, putting my labor hat on for a second, uh, I just uh, note I went to college on a 32B scholarship. I was a 32B uh, a union member in a prior life, started as a, started as a janitor, so I have a great deal of empathy for, uh, for labor unions. The, the overtime issue, as I noted before, um, the abuse of overtime is a very small number of people. Uh, when you think about the MTA, it's a city or village of 72,000 people. Uh, and most of those people, like most of the people in the city of New York, are law-abiding, reasonable people, and it's a very small number of people who, who abuse it. Uh, we have a responsibility to uh, be responsible stewards of every dollar that, whether it's uh, someone riding subways or buses or Long Island Railroad or a New York City taxpayer or a state taxpayer uh, entrusts us, we take that responsibility seriously. I'll turn the freedom ticket uh, question over to Ronnie Hakem in a second, but I, I wanted to address your transit desert question the following way. So this April phase two, the April of this year, phase two of congestion pricing was passed. Uh, and that will begin uh, no earlier than January 1st of 2021. But you'll all recall that phase one of congestion pricing was passed by the legislature over a year ago and went into effect for practical purposes on February 1st when that began to be collected. Uh, the um, phase one of congestion pricing revenues are tranched. The first $300 million goes into continuing the good work of the subway action plan which uh, in the first 18 months was split between the city and the New York on a, uh, city of New York and the state of New York on a 50-50 basis. Uh, the second tranche is $50 million, which is dedicated uh, by state law for outer boroughs, so the four boroughs excluding Manhattan, transit desert and other, uh, and other uses to, whether it's Council Member Adams or yours or, or, or some of your uh, other colleagues, and we'll be announcing and rolling out the uh, use of the first uh, $50 million from the uh, Phase 1 of congestion pricing, and then I'll turn it over to Ronnie for Freedom Ticket. Sure. So you're referencing the Atlantic Field Study, which was our ability that we launched last summer to um, offer Long Island Railroad ridership to folks that travel in the seven Queens and three Brooklyn stations um, to take advantage of capacity that we actually have on the Long Island Railroad going to Atlantic Terminal. Um, the, the point of the study is to see whether or not with pricing uh, variability we can in fact influence people's choices um, to use the railroad where we have capacity. The challenge that it presents is where we don't have capacity, particularly in the peak hours, 
going to Penn, for example, or coming down on Metro North going to Grand Central. So our planners are also taking a look at uh, where there may be opportunities to expand a field study to um, broaden the scope, but currently we're still gathering data um, and on the ridership traveling through Queens and Brooklyn into the Atlantic Terminal. Um, I do want to mention, you, you would ask about Metro North and the Long Island Railroad and ADA compliance. While they have much fewer stations, obviously, their percentage of ADA compliance, they are required to comply, and it's actually high. Um, we can get you the specific numbers, but they, too, invest as part of their capital program in ADA compliance for their stations. And that's true, of course, of, uh, with respect to Long Island Railroad and Metro North stations in the city of New York. Yes. Yeah, the ones we see in the city don't. And if I uh, just one more in, in, in terms of Jamaica Depot, which was in the past capital plan, what, what is the status of that? That is actually is responsible for about 75 percent of the ridership in southeast Queens and is and, and and has been operating at about 80 percent of capacity for the last two decades. And then finally, um, on, on the workers' comp, I know I had mentioned before at another hearing very specifically that there was a, a provider who happened to be a MWBE who had not been paid in nine months. And at that point, they were beginning to stop to service clients. And that doesn't help people to get back to work. And, 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 and I think everybody knows my experience and my, my workers' comp experience and, and what I, the, 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 the three discs that was removed here um, last year and, and my, my, my subsequent recovery, you know, this, this is something that, that, um, that we can change. I, I think that I, I would not, as I look back, I, I, for the next generation, they shouldn't have to go through this and that when people um, you know, leave and they retire and they serve that they should be able to leave with dignity and the quality of life and not be crippled because of things like that. And by being able to give timely um, a medical uh, treatment, I, I think that enhances everybody's experience, and most importantly, the authority's experience. Okay, Council Member, before Andy addresses the Jamaica Depot issue, uh, if you provide me offline the information about the workers' comp provider that wasn't paid for nine months, I'll have someone look into it and come back to you next week. Sure. And uh, quickly, uh, Council Member, you want to make a depot, depot rebuilt, so do I. I really want to push on with this project, and the good news is uh, we have a draft environmental impact statement that is going to be released to stakeholders uh, May the 22nd, which might even be, it's tomorrow, uh, with a public hearing that will follow at the end of June. So we've already received permission to begin drilling test pits from York College starting on June the 3rd, uh, and the site agreement is being finalized as we speak. We know that you're keen to get on with it, so are we. Uh, what I would ask is that we really need, same as some of these other projects we've been talking about, to have you on side and standing shoulder to shoulder with me, because not everyone will like the construction. There will be controversy around around it, some people won't want it, uh, that will be invaluable. So let's uh, stay very close and, and talk about it and let's make this project a reality. Thank you very much. Council Member Joe and I. Thank you, Chairs. So as we strive to make transportation cleaner, safer, better and more reliable, there are a few issues that I want to talk about, specifically the Metro North stations coming into the Bronx. Um, which is something that's been long awaited and with enthusiasm. We're not looking at the infrastructure in and around the Metro North stations, including parking, as well as roadways uh, and ramps that would be needed to offset any congestion coming into an area. Uh, cameras on platforms, something that we're not focused on, um, making sure that our riders feel safe and our criminals know that there is someone watching. My questions on the Bronx redesign plan um, to make sure that the desert, the transportation desert hubs that we have are adequately serviced, but also the effects or the impact of this administration's Vision Zero, the road dieting plan, and what that does to your ridership and the time added to their commute. And that's two lanes going, being made into one lane, which slows down traffic, creates more congestion. 
as well as Pelham Base Station in the borough of the Bronx. We have a train station, an active roadway, very limited travel lanes. Buses are stopping there as they're layover or on their brakes, making more congestion and less travel lanes available to um, our motorists. And the last thing I wanna bring up that I hope you can give me a real good explanation to, because I think it's warranted, in and around our train stations, who is responsible for maintenance, cleanup, sweeping, snow removal? My understanding, the MTA takes the approach, we only do the first three feet from the structure. Who does the rest of the sidewalk? And it's been a battle between the city and the state for far too long. Thank you. Uh, um, Pelham Bay Station, sir, I will follow up on that. We certainly shouldn't be blocking the road, um, so I will take that on immediately and talk to my uh, SVP for buses to make sure that where the buses are laying over doesn't impede traffic. That shouldn't be happening, uh, so I will find out what's going on and I'll get back to you. Thank you for that. On, uh, excuse me. On your, uh, the Penn Access program um, for the Bronx, you're right, it will bring direct rail service to the East Bronx communities at Hunts Point, at Park Chester Van Next, Morris Park, Co-op City. Um, we think it's an incredibly important project and one that um, is currently uh, begun um, because we have pre preliminary engineering underway, which is sort of our first step to getting shovels in the ground. Um, as well as working through um, funding sources um, for this important project, but one that we think is a game changer, um, and we're fully committed to it. Part of the plan should take into consideration the needs, and that means commuter parking, uh, as well as the Morris Park Station, where we have the Hutch Metro Center. Thousands of people work there. Thousands visit daily. There is a request, and. Uh, for a ramp, so there's a second means of egress from this area, which is going to abut the Metro North. We still don't understand the implications of the traffic that would be brought in because of the Metro North. We do a great deal of exercising that you'll be in Manhattan in 17 minutes. Well, where are those cars going to be coming from? Where are those commuters coming from that are going to take advantage of this 17 minute trip into Manhattan. If they're from the borough of the Bronx, that means they're driving in, unless it's going to be a three fare zone and that's bus to, uh, car to bus, bus to train, train to Metro North. And I don't think that's the intent. So at, at this point, we've just recently um, executed an MOU between Amtrak, who actually owns the, the right-of-way there, um, and ourselves in order to run the commuter service along the Hellgate line. Um, we've awarded the initial general engineering contract um, and are working on an environmental review process. A lot of the comments that you're raising will be part of what we consider as the environmental review process informs the design. So. A lot of moving parts when you begin a project of this scope, but one that we think will have a lot of community engagement. We've had a number already, um, and that will continue with, with a public process to, to get as many of these thoughts out. Want to prioritize the need for commuter parking. I, I made a note. It's a non-starter. That, that component is not part of it. And if you can continue with some of the other questions, in particular the Vision Zero effect on bus routes. Um, yeah, let me just comment upon that. Uh, we, we do work very closely with the city, namely Commissioner Trottenberg and her team. Uh, and I, again, I was just talking about that this morning where we're, make, we're putting together an, an overall master plan that will combine the bus elements of Fast Forward with the bus elements of the city's recently uh, released bus plan, Bus Forward, um, which uh, talks about things like um, uh, priority routes, uh, working with the NYPD for towing to keep routes clear, which routes will receive traffic signal priority equipment, um, and also the road calming measures that Vero Vision Zero anticipates and is delivering to make sure that we have joined up thinking. So um, Vision Zero uh, you know, obviously has a, has a uh, 
laudable um, objective, but it should not be at the expense of uh, bus speeds. And so that's why we're working very closely to create this master plan to make sure that we, uh, we achieve the reduction in fatalities without slowing the buses down. I'm so glad you brought that up. Morris Park is going to be uh, receiving the Metro North Station. Morris Park, by this administration, has been dubbed for the Vision Zero plan, going from two lanes into one. Mm -hmm. Without an understanding of the impact the Metro North is going to have on this area for a route that will connect two Metro North stations, and that is the Morris Park and Van Ness, the only thoroughfare that we have. I had to start a court action against the administration to prevent that coming in against the wishes of the entire community. But I also reached out to your office to see if this is part of the Bronx redesign plan and the study and the effect that it will have. Well, the, the Bronx redesign is not yet finalized. We, uh, we have issued what's called the current uh, conditions report, uh, and we are in the, uh, we've just put together a draft um, proposed plan for what, uh, which is the culmination of the input from the various stakeholders and members of the public that, uh, from, we, from whom we've heard. Uh, we are about to, we're just finalizing that at the moment. We'll be going through a further consultation process. Um, I can't talk directly to Vision Zero, as you know, that's a city initiative, but we do take that into account when we design the, uh, uh, design the new routes as part of Fast Forward. And the last question I had was maintenance sure. in and around our train stations. Um, do you, if there are specific locations about which you're concerned, if, we, if you just give them to my team or I, we'll, we'll take them away. But the general rule is, I, I, I couldn't speak to if it's specifically three feet, um, but obviously we have a boundary. There is a boundary that is MTA responsibility, and we do clean that up, and we do remove snow within that boundary. If uh, beyond the boundary, some, uh, there shouldn't be a a sort of a no man's land, there would be that would be the responsibility of the city or some other agency. But that's what we have. So, the, what is our understanding of responsibility? Where is how is this boundary defined? Because it should be applied citywide. Well, again, I'd have to check the specifics if there's a specific geographical distance. But there are uh, there are boundaries around stations. In other words, there's there's bits of land that belong to the MTA, and outside that area, typically belongs to the city. So, uh, so yeah, the, 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 in 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 every case one of the agencies should be cleaning up garbage, keeping the place clean, removing snow, et cetera, et cetera. I'm pretty confident we do what's our responsibility, uh, but if you want to raise some specifics with me to challenge that, you're more than welcome. And I would prefer that we come up with a unified approach because this boundary isn't the same at every train station, uh, and it's not uniformly applied throughout the city. But it, it's determined, if I might have one last go at this, it's not that there's a, there's a standard approach, it's, def, it's determined by what is our property and what isn't. So that, by definition, varies between location. In some cases, we owe, we owe more space on a station than others. In some cases, we own the, the, a very close proximity to the station, and that's it. In others, we own uh, more space. So, so there is no standard as such. However, there is, a, there is clear responsibility for who does what and where. Chairman, if, you, if you'll indulge me, please. So in New York City, Property owners responsible for the entire sidewalk, including 18 inches into the street. This is for all property owners. That should apply to the metro, to our train stations as well. It becomes this unknown maintenance problem, and depending on who's at the site and what supervisor you can get in touch with will determine the outcome. And this is standard in New York City. So why should there be a separate carve out for our train stations? There's no one else there. So, so council member, you ask a reasonable question, you're entitled to an answer. We'll come back to you with an answer, especially tailored to the uh, subway stations in your district. We'll come back to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Councilmember Rosenthal to close us out. Thank you so much. I appreciate your patient chairs. Nice to see everyone here. Thank you for coming to the council and, and uh, trying to help out here. So we really appreciate that. I have two questions. First, in terms of people with disabilities, I'm wondering um, 
You mentioned that you're going to come back with an alternative to the pilot. Yes, possibly. And so I'm wondering if you would consider including uh, representatives of the uh, people with disabilities community uh, in, in coming up with that pilot. And similarly, uh, as you think about congestion pricing exemptions, whether or not you would consider uh, publicly including members of the disabilities community um, as you discuss the exemptions for them. I think that my two questions about uh, people with disabilities. And then um, secondly, I, I wonder um, about, I've been reading about your improvements or proposed improvements to procurement to try to understand better how to get costs in in uh, under control and I'm wondering if you know if we can't do it here but if we could set aside another time to hear what you've learned as you've started to uncover the details of procurement where you think the there could there might be savings or uh, where you think that there are opportunities um, to get the cost under control and let me give you an example because I study this for uh, New York City contracts and one of the things that we learned is the criteria in the RFP have become so burdensome that fewer and fewer we have fewer and fewer bidders and so the city has agreed to look harder at that and reduce the number of hurdles in order to create opportunity for more competition, um, which, which I'm hopeful about. Um, another one is uh, given the very slow repayment uh, processing um, system that we have in the city, uh, that ends up costing the contract, the construction companies, of course, more money. So as we look at implementing what we're using, which is Passport, um, and that's the procurement mechanism that we're working on now, as we're working to um, expedite procurement, um, construction bidders are now considering bringing down the cost of the bid, given the fact that we could get the whole process moving faster. I'm wondering if you're exploring that. What are you finding as you're looking at procurement? Certainly. So we'll do them in the order that you raised them, uh, council members. So uh, with the uh, pilot, yeah, I'm not sure if you were in the room, I said that we No, but be, I heard about it. Okay, so over the summer, we, we will be coming back um, with a, an, an answer. So, so with the with specifically with uh, input from the community, I mean, we already consult with the community on a regular basis. Um, we're just interviewing we're, candidates. Uh, that's a great assertion. I'm I'm hearing directly from uh, this question. I'll be honest with you. Didn't mm -hmm. it's coming from my heart, but sure. I'm being fed it by the advocates. So please don't. Please let's uh, at least. Uh, it's hard for me to accept the assertion that the community is being involved if the question comes from the, some very prominent people in the community. And I hadn't so, finished and my answer, council member. What I was going to say yes, was but we you. recognize that we need to do better on that. And so, so for that specific reason, because we want to improve consultation with the community, we are just in the process of uh, doing interviews for an advisory committee on accessible transit, which we've never previously had. Oh, great. So it's precisely because, to your point, Thank we you. haven't excelled at it, that we're taking this proactive action to do that. And that is seems timing? to me, uh, so that's happening at the moment. We just interviewed candidates. That body will meet three to four times a year and provide feedback on all and, uh, accessibility initiatives underway at transit. It will be chaired by my colleague, Alex Elagudin, who's the um, Senior Advisor on Accessibility, and that will enable us to directly solicit input from transit users with disabilities and community uh, advocates. The first meeting will be held this summer. I'll make sure you get the date. I appreciate that, and the total number in the committee? Um, I think it's 10, but I'd have to Looking check my for facts about on 10. That. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and I just... No, 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 sorry, I apologize. Procurement. Yes. Sorry, Chair, I know 
it's the end of the day, and we can talk offline. Just if you could address procurement and uh, cost. I'm happy to do it if it's okay with the chairman and your colleagues. Sure. Okay, good. So, Council Member, on, on procurement, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we mentioned before you joined us that the state legislation, the budget passed April 1st, requires that the MTA hire an independent reform and restructuring firm. Mm -hmm. That firm that's been hired is Alex Partners, A-L-I-X, which is a leading firm mostly, frankly, uh, advising for-profit corporations. One of the uh, major areas of their review, frankly, I think it's fair to say it was among the first uh, areas of their review was procurement in terms of consolidating it, making it more efficient, and making the MTA a better buyer. In, in addition to that, so the question is, what, 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 have, what have we been doing to make the MTA a better, more effective buyer? So let, let me, you mentioned the city's experience with construction contracts. So my colleague, Jano Lieber, who's the chief development officer, it sounds like you, you know Jano, ha has done some terrific work together with Scott Reckler and a construction cost task force. Among the achievements that they have, uh, things that they have achieved is on east side access and other uh, projects, A, significantly reducing the time it takes for a vendor to get paid. Mm -hmm. they, they've taken literally weeks and months out of that. Mm -hmm. Second is they've reduced the time, internal time, that the MTA, Capital Construction, and other agencies have taken to turn around change orders, to deal with additional work orders, et cetera. And I think those things, Council Member, have two, as an example, have two important consequences. Great. One is they make us a more effective buyer and procurer of goods, and they also send a message to the, uh, the construction community, the vendor community, that doing business with us will be quicker and less expensive. Thirdly, just finally, having said that, I want to acknowledge that we've got a great deal of work to do to further these enhancements throughout the entire agency and to uh, continue to take time and cost out of the process. But we've been very focused on this and have some successes to announce. Great. I look forward to talking with you more Great. about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So just one from me and then I think a couple from me, Donis. Uh, the Astoria station renovations. The MTA is in the process of renovating the Astoria subway stations. These renovations do not include the installation of elevators. Uh, as uh, we pointed out during the preliminary hearing, can you just update the committee on how much the MTA spent renovating the Astoria elevated subway stations and how much would it cost to install elevators uh, retroactively at these same renovated subway stations? So um, we are spending $345 million renovating the six stations and adding four ADA elevators. Four ADA elevators. And what is the cost? For, and that's included in the in the. It's, in, it's included in the total number. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. And before anything, thank, I'd like to say thank you to New York City Transit and Dubai for Moreno and the whole team for being supporting all of you guys on the car free day. Hopefully, we can look for 2020 and look at the LA that also provide free ride on Earth Day. So we will be starting planning with the speaker, my colleague, the 2020 Car Free Day, and hopefully we can increase the level of participation because that event is about having conversation, incentivizing New Yorkers to use more public transportation. So uh, thank you again. Uh, when, when do we expect that the pilot project that already been in place to happen that will transform the way of how New Yorkers pay the fare by using the, their phone will be established. When will the pilot project finish and when do you expect with the, uh, and if you can share who are the private contractors who want their IFP to put all those, those technology and, and what is the plan? How, when do you expect that, that the pilot project will be done? and and based on that pilot project, there's any expectation on when would, what year do we expect that all train station we have that technology to provide the option for individuals to pay using their phone? So, uh, Chairman, this is a timely uh, question because the uh, uh, Capital Program Oversight Committee got a report on the latest, uh, the, the, the project is called Omni. 
It will allow customers to pay with contactless credit cards, with their cell phones, Apple Watch, et cetera, but importantly, will always uh, give customers the option of buying a MetroCard for the next three years and then an OmniCard following that. So customers will always be able to use cash. A, a pilot will begin this month on May 31st uh, on both subways and buses. On the subways, it will be uh, Lexington Avenue stations from Grand Central to Barclays and all buses in Staten Island. Uh, that pilot will start May 31st. The, int the, the system will be rolled out uh, across the subway system and the, and the bus system uh, by October of 2020. Yesterday, the project leader reported in the presence of a senior representative from Cubic, which is the company that was hired in a competitive RFP. Cubic, I think it's fair to say, is a national leader in the installation and management of new fare payment systems. And we reported to the, this committee of the MTA board that the project is on time and, and, and on budget. Uh, I've been very focused on it uh, personally. Uh, these CPOC meetings, Capital Program Oversight Committee meetings, are quarterly. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, required the Cubic uh, chairman and CEO and president and the people involved in the project to get on the phone with me, with some of Andy's colleagues, and with the people who run the Omni program about a couple of weeks before each CPOC meeting so that when we report to the board and the public uh, and, and our customers that the project's on time and on budget that we have a 100 percent degree of assurance that that, uh, that is the case. Uh, so that is, a, a Chairman, a brief outline of where we are on that important project. May I just make one um, addition to Council Member Rosenthal? Uh, Council Member, it's 18, actually, 18 members of the uh, committee, and they will be drawn from, with, from people with all forms of disability. So 18, 1, 8. Thank you. I'm getting one question. Will the meetings be public? I believe so. Again, I'll check my facts on Thank that. you so much. So So in which year do we expect, if everything go well and the pilot project is working, that all the stations in the city of Europe will be able to? Yeah, uh, ch Chairman, October 2020. 2020. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with the transit signals uh, system, how are we doing? And we also know that a lot has to do with the plan moving forward. Uh, as you know, the old scheduling say that by like 2040 was when, and that's be, be, of course before you guys came on board, many of you in, the, in this leadership position, but the last before you came on board, it was like by 2040, the year when all the station it will have it, the new transit signal system. I know that you have a more aggressive plan. Uh, what is should we expect happen, keep happening in the next months and year? We station, we line, do we expect will be completed? And what should we expect to see in a schedule to address the replacement, knowing that there's a lot of challenges with the transit signal system? Okay, so uh, where we are with signaling is, as you know already, the L line is on modern signaling com uh, communications-based train control. The good news is the L line project, among many other improvements, will receive new power stations to enable us to run more trains. So uh, L line will see further improvement. The second line that we've converted to CBTC just uh, went live end-to-end -end with CBTC uh, uh, in the last couple of months. That's the seven line, the flushing line, and that has seen a 56% jump in punctuality since we uh, rolled the new signaling system out. Uh, we just switched on what's called automatic train control, which better spaces the trains. We're currently uh, implementing CBTC on the Queens Boulevard line. Next after that will be Culver. Next after that will be the 8th Avenue line. And then the fast forward plan envisages um, a total of five lines uh, converted to CBTC or elements of the line converted over the next five years, potentially a further six in the following five lines. Um, so by the end of the 10-year uh, uh, tenure, if you like, or the 10-year currency of the fast-forward plan, we will have moved to 90%, 90%, 90% of riders will be on modern signaling. 
Uh, we may be able to do it more quickly. We're trialing, or we will shortly be trialing a system called UWB. It's not itself a signaling system, but it's the communications element of CBTC, which in tandem could mean we can do this thing more quickly, more cheaply, and less intrusively. So uh, I'm very excited about it, and it's one of the reasons I brought in a world-class signaling expert, namely Pete Tomlin, to help me get this thing across the line. Okay. How much does the MTA expect to be spent every year on advertising on media, Ad, uh, on job opportunity, on opportunity? I have seen also, you know, some advertising in the train for opportunity for women and minority too. Like, how much is the budget dedicated for advertising? What, what's the dollar amount, Chairman, just so I understand the question, of communications to customers per year? I, I don't have that at my fingertips, and rather than make it up, we'll come back to you with a number. Okay. And, and if you can look at it, and again, I, I also push on the DOT on also using local media, uh, agni media, because, you know, the city has changed. And 38 percent of New Yorkers, like myself, being born and raised in another country. So we had the Bengali, we had many South Asian communities that they had their own newspaper, they had their own TV and radio program. And I feel that it, we have relied too much only on putting any apps in for any purpose that we do through all sitting state, only to the mainstream. So it, if you can look at it to see how are you doing on also spending the local media and see how much more you can do. Chairman, we will do that. Okay, thank you very much for coming in. I would really, really appreciate you spending so much time with us and answering all of our questions. Good luck, and uh, we will be talking to you very soon. All right, and with this, this concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2020 tomorrow, Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019, at 10 a.m. In, in this room. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Social Services, the Office of Civil Justice, the Administration for Children's Services, and the Department of Parks and Recreation. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 23rd, the last day of the budget hearings at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearings, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at finance testimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of this of the official record. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Of course.